Good morning to everyone. I'm Jeff Collins, professor and chair of academic programs at the Bard Graduate Center, and it's my great pleasure on behalf of the director and all of my faculty colleagues to welcome all of you to the Bard Graduate Center and to this symposium on Mapping New York. I'd also like to welcome those of you who are participating virtually through BGC TV. And a reminder um, that those of you who aren't in the room can participate by sending us questions via Twitter at the hashtag Hashtag Bard Grad Center TV, and as those come in, they will be appropriately relayed to the speakers throughout the day. Um, I see there are some people probably joining us for the first time at the Bard Graduate Center, and I just want to say um, that as well as welcoming you, we actually thank you for joining us for uh, a day, a full day, really, of what we hope will be intellectual exploration and discussion. And I should probably explain for newcomers that today's workshop is not just a preview uh, of David's um, exhibition uh, in the fall that will open in our focus gallery down the street at 18 West 86th Street. It's, it's certainly that preview, but it's actually an integral part of the larger intellectual process of exploration of which the exhibition is actually just one part. And in fact, the full name of this initiative is not a focus exhibition, but a focus project, which I think expresses you know, our desire to use that focus gallery uh, as a space to explore ways of making and communicating scholarly arguments in three dimensions, you know, rather than the traditional two dimensions of print. So in these larger focus projects, the exhibition is really just one stage uh, in a longer process that begins with teaching, researching, testing, and sharing ideas. And we're even investigating ways to give these projects uh, a second life after the exhibition closes through web presences and databases and other forms of feedback. So what we're going to do together today is really um, uh, part and parcel of that investigative scholarly process that's at the heart of what we do at BGC. And so the end result will be an exhibition and related digital publication, but really it's the idea sharing that I want to highlight today. So our subject is mapping and looking at the brochure I realize that our excellent designer has expressed this by giving us something that looks rather like a map, and I'm sure that was the idea. Um, and it made me think a little bit about the different ways that mapping uh, is used in language and how those um, forms of mapping might apply to a project as ambitious as mapping New York, <laughs> or even mapping 19th century New York, which is the subject of David's exhibition. So I was thinking about it, and on the one hand, mapping I guess can be a kind of surveying, right? Because we map uncharted territories, um, uh, newly discovered coastlines, continents, islands, and I think the goal of that kind of mapping is sort of to fix the boundaries, you know, of a, of a place or a topic and maybe identify some diagnostic features. And I think those kinds of maps, you know, by definition are never complete. Uh, they're always selective approximations based on our available knowledge and that inevitably changes over time. And I thought since New York City is itself a large, <laughs> only partially explored mass of uh, data, that kind of mapping as surveying seems particularly appropriate to today's project. And I think how we map a historical territory as vast as New York, you know, says a lot about what we know. It also says about what we don't know and what we prioritize, what we pay attention to as scholars, you know, and what we uh, agree to ignore. But on the other hand, we also map things like the human genome, right, or the New York subway system. Uh, in the sense of um, not really surveying, but actually identifying and schematizing some fairly complete system that we need a kind of diagram, you know, to understand and make it intelligible. And so those maps really are not topographical, but diagrammatic. They emphasize lines and linkages and transfers, you know, and culturally meaningful nodes, all things that help us understand the underlying structure of a complex system. And that, that too seems to me relevant for today's topic. Um, in the sense that so many maps of New York City that we'll see today are exactly of this type, right? They're street maps or sewer maps where it's the schematization that is the kind of cultural product, uh, culturally determined and full of culturally specific information. And those kinds of systems are obviously of interest to historians, so they too are ripe for uh, historical analysis. And I was thinking finally that we also use map in a more metaphorical sense, really not to mean either of those things, but a specific path or course, uh, like when we use MapQuest or HopStop, as I did the other day, to figure out the most efficient way from Bard Graduate Center to the Tenement Museum to the Mexican Cultural Institute. And those kinds of prescriptive or directive maps, I think, are also part of our process as cultural historians, um, you know, in that they, um, they help guide or, or, or lead readers or listeners or exhibition visitors you know, along particular interpretive avenues towards a given uh, aim or end. And I think that kind of pedagogical mapping 
is really at the heart of what we do at the Bard Graduate Center, you know, which seeks through all of its programs to offer helpful signs and guideposts across a potentially confusing historical landscape. And I'll just mention our new history of design that's on display at the welcome table, which is a map in a sense of that kind. So maybe it's that kind of mapping that's most <coughs> apposite for what we'll do today because each of our speakers will sketch out uh, specific scholarly pathways towards specific forms of scholarly buried treasure. So without further ado, let me introduce David Jaffe, who's going to chair the morning session and will be the master of ceremonies for the rest of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. I want to thank uh, Jeffrey, who's chair of academic programs, um, as well as Dean Peter Miller, uh, Dean uh, Elena Pinto Simon, all of whom really I've consulted and sort of thought about um, the various permutations of this uh, project. Um, I also want to thank, um, in terms of this, is really part of our new media series as well, which sometimes we have uh, evening programs. Uh, and other times we have symposia. So my sort of comrade there is uh, Kimon Karamidis, who will uh, chair uh, the afternoon session. Um, and also um, Dave Castellini, um, who's uh, been doing, and IT folks who've been working, uh, and will continue to work throughout the day, uh, very important, um, uh, to put all of our pieces together um, into a coherent whole, though the intellectual responsibilities for that are, are certainly ours. Um, and. Also, and I'll think at the end of the day, as you'll see in the afternoon, my students uh, in various courses who've really been sort of thinking through with me a lot of the issues that Jeffrey touched on and, and others about mapping and about New York, both of which are, are just immensely um, uh, you know, fields in sort of great upheaval in, in a really sort of positive uh, way. And so um, I want to just talk about a sort of a spatial turn uh, and, you know, we're all very familiar these days with the linguistic turn or the cultural turn or the pictorial turn. And, um, and so, of course, the spatial turn has now uh, found its uh, time in the sun, so to speak. And um, I think of this, and in, like in many of these phenomena, of course, there's a prehistory. Uh, you go back and suddenly lots of works that you'd read for other purposes now fit into that schema. And so thinking of New York, the study of New York, really I would marry this with the rise of social history in the 70s. Uh, it's really a great interest in metropolitan industrialization, uh, even if not formally cartographic in terms of Chris Stancil or, um, you know, his work on City of Women uh, or the spatial development of the capitalist economy, Betsy Blackmore's Manhattan for Rent, certainly, uh, as well as her work with Roy Rosenzweig on Park and the People, or David Scobie, certainly, uh, his Empire City, you know, story of bourgeois urbanists and the sort of social contests over, very explicit contests over, uh, who controls space, uh, how that determines or, or plays into um, the development and contests over social hierarchy, whether that be in museums or in uh, creation of parks, bridges, even street, streets themselves that we'll talk about more. And certainly by the 80s, this becomes more prevalent uh, well beyond social historians into literary and art historical scholarship. Uh, we're concerned about surveillance and power and others, but let me go back, I would say, even earlier into the sort of um, um, mid-19th century, and let me um, uh, focus, in terms of, I think there are mid-19th century visions uh, of sort of new spatial orders. Um, and so a favorite, and I know I saw this on Stephen Robertson's um, website when I looked at that the other day, so it's a favorite I know among more than just the two of us, I can imagine, uh, John Bachman uh, was a Swiss uh, immigrants are passing through Paris uh, as well on his way to New York, a lithographer, artist, engraver, uh, but also I would say sort of a, a spatial visionary in terms of, and this is uh, not the beginning of the story, but rather uh, later, um, and I don't have, but by the time he'd moved through a series of bird's eye views in the 1850s, he'd really come up with this, fish, you know, this is a fisheye before there is a fisheye, um, photographic lens you know, uh, what we think of now well above the battery. Of course, as you can recognize, this is New York as the global view. New York is the world. It's neither a landscape or an empire city. Uh, the nations, the regions at the edge of the metropolitan area uh, fade off uh, the, the map, off the globe really on that circular border with Harlem on the top and Sandy Hook on the bottom and many 23 others around it. Uh, the city's cultural and commercial primacy is implicit 
uh, though the far edges of the globe do take in New Jersey uh, and Brooklyn, but the eye sweeps up uh, Broadway, and Broadway in the afternoon will be a, a center focus of our uh, discussion, the sort of center of the world. Uh, Broadway is the prime meridian, if you want to think of it, in terms of this mapping-like view following its long length. Um, and the island stretches far to the north and tapers towards the horizon. At the same time, in the mid-19th century, there are many others, whether they be guidebook writers, uh, other uh, making maps like the um, DRIPS map, you know, DRIPS map that was right before this that we'll also talk about, uh, as well as many on the ground. The great achievement of really in both Europe and the United States in the mid-19th century, one of the efforts by the new rising urban middle class was really intent on restructuring their cities spatially. Uh, in, an in an image, it's an attempted, uh, I would say, um, of image of rational order, whether that be in public parks, urban museums, to establish a class hierarchy. And they were also promoting, uh, and, and this I think takes in the European case as well, a model of urban life uh, as the center in contrast to the claims of the nation state. So there's sort of competing authority centers. Uh, and so the urban view really is the one that's being promoted. Um, and maybe we can talk about that more later. And then just jumping from that mid-19th century, which of course is my interest, I think a lot of our questions are coming up today exactly because of this return uh, of the spatial uh, turn um, in terms of uh, the spatial obsessions of Foucault or David Harvey's critique of spatial inequality along with his utopian uh, visions as well. Uh, the spatial impact there is very clearly uh, very much coming from the influx of digital tools, uh, cartographic, GIS, others, which have really filtered in uh, to all uh, parts of our investigations. But also maps themselves serve as a metaphor for our technological age. The cell phone, to be, you know, which is pretty obvious, right? By offering GPS and geolocation services, is fostering a geographic awareness in users, you can, there's a leap there from maps that refer to a user's location in the real world uh, to maps that relate to the user's coordinates in cyberspace. And the two overlap in the way that we use these devices and users derive data from the internet and then superimpose that on the physical environment. And to leap even further forward with augmented reality or Google Glass or other means, we are increasingly gonna find that intersection more and more, that overlay. Uh, to be very important. Uh, we now use maps as a metaphor, and even in terms of operating systems or other means, rather than a desktop or a filing cabinet as a metaphor for understanding how uh, to organize information. Maps are not just being used for spatial navigation, but for organizing information. Uh, they're visualizations of data, not illustrations. And I just want to close on that note. Um, and I think a lot of this is also applicable for the use of material culture and other forms in terms of how we constitute knowledge from those objects rather than just merely seeing them as reflections of some prior narrative. With something that Richard White has written recently uh, in the Spatial History Project at Stanford. Um, visualization and spatial history are not just about producing illustrations or maps to communicate things that you have discovered by other means. It is a means of doing research. It generates questions that might otherwise go unasked. It reveals historical relations that might otherwise go unnoticed. And it undermines or substantiates stories upon which we build our very own versions of the past. And I think that's really an interesting guiding thought for how significant, how substantive this is really uh, spatial work really constitutes our modes uh, and understanding of knowledge. And I think that is a systemic change for, for many of us. Um, and I know in various ways our speaker's going to address the uh, different pieces of this mapping New York. And by the end of the day, I hope we'll, some of the pieces will come together and, we'll have, and we have several opportunities to have discussions uh, along the way. So there should be really a good amount of interchange as well. Um, and to that point, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, uh, John Miswick has offered us a, a really wonderful biography here, a very timely biography, as you'll see. Um, April of 2014, uh, it's been a big month for John. He just received word of his uh, official promotion uh, from associate to full professor at the Baruch College Department of Fine and Performing Arts. Uh, he also continues to teach the history of architecture at the CUNY Graduate Center in the PhD program in art history. 
And as well in April, um, uh, Professor Masuika was awarded a Rome Prize in the category of Historic Preservation and Conservation. He'll be spending the 2014-15 academic year in residence at the American Academy in Rome to complete his book project entitled The Eternal Palace, Transformations and Reconstructions of the Berlin Royal Castle, 1450 to, nine, to 2020. Um, finally, um, his lecture today is based upon his work with the research platform called HyperCities in 2008. Uh, Professor Maswika oversaw the creation of the New York Digital Cultural Mapping Component for HyperCities New York, and he will speak today on visualizing New York on the HyperCities platform. John. Thank you, David, and uh, I'm a big admirer of David Jaffe's work and was treated to his uh, amazing intellectual energy and organizational abilities last summer during a, I think, very successful NEH workshop that was scheduled, lasted four weeks, and immersed us all in in the worlds of David Jaffe, but also in the <laughs> worlds of 19th century New York in, in using the lens of material culture. So um, I feel very glad to be here and grateful to David for inviting me back to speak to you about some of the work I've been doing. Um, although I, I also have a bit of a disclaimer because one might reasonably ask, uh, you know, what is somebody with a PhD in architectural history whose research focuses on Europe doing at a conference talking about mapping New York, and that's a very reasonable question indeed. Um, but the fact is that Baruch College and uh, at the Macaulay Honors College at CUNY, one of the, um, a couple of the courses I teach are um, involve the history of New York. Uh, the one at Macaulay is part of a seminar sequence that the students have to take in their opening semesters. The seminar I teach there is called Shaping the Future of New York City. And so, um, thrown into the deep end of the pool, as it were, when I arrived in New York, I, I jumped at the chance to uh, act out my, um, my tendencies as a map obsessive. And I think some of you in the room might know what I'm talking about, a, an extreme love of maps um, that turns work into play. And I applied for um, some help from CUNY uh, and a grant to join uh, a team out at uh, UCLA and USC uh, myself coming uh, from the PhD program in architecture at Berkeley, um, I'm part of that left coast mafia of academics who um, I, I've discovered have a slightly different take on all things digital. Um, I was thinking about, you know, firms started in the, in the 50s and 60s on the East Coast, ABC, NBC, CBS, IBM. I was thinking about firms started on the West Coast in the 80s and 90s. Um, and, and even more recently, uh, like Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and Twitter. And just kind of um, looking at the corresponding changes in, in academia, in academic culture, where terms like the digital humanities are um, so embraced out in the West Coast universities like UCLA that they founded a, an interdisciplinary digital humanities minor. Um, but on the East Coast, I regularly encounter academics who say, there is no such thing as digital humanities. And that, to me, is a fascinating intellectual issue that helps us describe this moment in time where technology has, has proceeded at such a fast pace and the collision of different outlooks and approaches and methodologies is causing us all to um, re-examine um, how it is we create knowledge in a digital age um, where many of us at our schools are compelled to navigate systems like Blackboard. Uh, and, and other utilities um, thrust upon us. Um, or if, if uh, you, know, you make the kinds of mistakes um, that I do, you get involved in starting your own utility uh, at hypercities.com. Um, and that's why this lecture is entitled The Hypercities Experiment. It's, it's a rhetorical backpedal from the notion that any one 
mapping system or online tool will provide the answers. In other words, um, even as HyperCities got off the ground in, in 2006, 7, and 8, I joined in 2008 um, creating HyperCities New York, it was a very different animal precisely because uh, the Google Maps API upon which it is founded, the application program <laughs> interface that is released as free intellectual property that is customizable by anyone with programming skills, right? That release came in June of 2005. It totally destroyed the Hypermedia Berlin interface that we had using Flash and other older technologies because it suddenly made use of Google's aspirational universal mapping system. Um, and even then, moving forward, each new release of the Google Maps API included new functionality. On June 1st of 2013, Google discontinued support for its Google Maps API <laughs> in its two-dimensional form. What does that mean? That everyone using the Google Maps API to that point, and many of us have used Google Maps for directions and for plotting simple things in two dimensions, uh, with KML files and other functions, were suddenly confronted by the uh, realization that now Google Maps consisted of an entirely Google Earth driven three dimensional mapping interface. So you can only imagine what that means for a group of academics involved in what I'm calling the HyperCities experiment as our programmers at the Center for Digital Humanities at UCLA who operate the servers and manage the content to some extent are constantly rewriting the code on the customizable Google API in order to debug and keep up and um, instantiate the latest version of our platform to take into account the changes that have been put in place by our sponsors, right? So imagine what a different corporate model that is. It's not even a corporate model. It's Google's corporate model. This is an academic um, extension of knowledge creation piggybacking on top of intellectual property made available by gigantic corporation like Google. But you might consider um, something that has been used, I think, very successfully here at the Bard Graduate Center, a um, presentation format known as Prezi, um, which has been used with great success because it is a, a corporate subscription model that institutions pay for and the people who run the business make sure it works and you call for support when you need it, right? So that would be a, an alternative. Um, this is just a quick picture of the team. The only thing I wanted to say about this, um, I think I can use my mouse as a pointer, um, is it's an entirely West Coast based operation with the sole exception of, of myself right here. Over, um, so the, this, this California exile who's back on the East Coast where he grew up, I'm in my comfort zone geographically, but maybe intellectually part of me is still in California. Um, when you go to hypercities.com, you will be uh, facing this um, type of view. And really, this PowerPoint is just meant um, as, as a kind of backup because I do want to conduct uh, the lecture that I have um, live on hypercities. And, and um, in, a, in a moment of accelerated heart rate, I realized, well, what if it crashes? I do need um, a way to, to present. So I'm going to take us from uh, this slide. Uh, in just a moment to the, to the live site um, where you'll see this interface appear. Um, what we've done, and many of you will recognize the Google Earth view in this window here, is customize the API to include two dynamic, um, sort of dynamic media databases. And all I mean by that is we've scanned, in my case with New York, 40 maps of New York City that are historical. The aspiration was scanning them at 600 DPI so that you could zoom way in on these things. And then load them in a way that allows you to click on the maps and overlay them since they were geo-referenced using ArcGIS software. They would come in and overlay on top of the geographically specific Google Earth views. Um, so that's one of the databases. The other dynamic database, and it's called dynamic because what appears in this view over here changes depending on what's in your view here, depending on your zoom level, depending on which city you're in, etc. And the second dynamic database consists of, me of user curated media objects, which is fancy language for 
your JPEGs, your own writing, your links to a YouTube or Vimeo video, things that students will select and capture and save as media objects that are coordinated with a pre-selected map view. So you can picture the students um, in my class doing a research paper and learning about critical thinking in writing and footnotes and the usual kinds of, of um, types of writing that we try to teach and then converting the research paper into an online multimedia presentation in hypercities. That's kind of a thumbnail of probably the most frequent use that, to which I've put um, hypercities. So an example would be this student work on the history of the crises of the 19th century that led finally, finally to the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. Or uh, another project where um, we have map overlays that show you an example of two of the historical maps, a, a selected view in Google Earth that's saved with early, the earliest potentially European views of the coastline of New Amsterdam drawn on the top by Adrian Vanderdonk, converted by a lithographer in Amsterdam and then a, a historical painter in New York con, uh, creating oil paintings that are imagining what that coastline might have looked like. Um, an independent study w with me last uh, year with a student at Baruch, uh, Michael Larson, was uh, a kind of um, history of the Emperor Diocletian and his world. Uh, and another uh, example would be my own research on the Berlin Palace. So um, with that, we're going to switch over and, and I'm going to... Um, I believe I'm going to be able. Can you help me minimize that, Anupa? I'm, I was. I brought my laptop as a crutch and was told that it wouldn't work um, because of the live webcast. So I'm relying on. Um, yeah. So this is this is where any of you could look at hypercities.com and read. It's a kind of a blog format, right? So there is actually some research publications about hypercities as this new media animal. Uh, people like Phil Ethington at USC, Todd Presner at, um, at UCLA, if we could leave this view, that would be great, um, have, have written some, some things about the background and aspirations. And, and at um, UCLA, I would say hypercities and the Center for Digital Humanities have really embraced social media technologies in ways that perhaps I have not, um, but they have used you know, um, what's fashionable now, big data, to crowdsource Twitter during the Arab Spring in Egypt so that you had a, a dynamic map view of each Twitter entry over a period of time. It's searchable, it can be played, rewound, backwards and forwards. They did something similar for um, Tokyo University to crowdsource Twitter and allow um, distribution of cheap Geiger counters for the neighborhoods in and around the Sendai earthquake zone to get really granular data from citizens because they realized the government and the utilities weren't putting out enough of that. That was spearheaded by Yo Kawano and, and won an award. Um, my own uh, distance from, New, uh, from California, my own lack of computing uh, programming knowledge has kept me more in my comfort zone as an architectural historian and map obsessive, which has to do with visualization teaching of art history, formal analysis that leads to visual literacy, visual literacy that leads to media literacy, the message to the students being, unlike the students of 20 years ago, today's students are creators of media with their own phone. They can do so much. Um, an award-winning film uh, from 2011 in Sydney, Australia, was, was created by a person entirely with their cell phone. And, and so, I'm, I'm working with my students to talk about maps along the lines of J.B. Harley and David Woodward and their history of cartography. Maps as instantiations of knowledge. Maps that are as important for what they leave out as for what they put in. Uh, and, and so encouraging that kind of critical thinking among the students and their projects, um, we try to um, have them develop again, the traditional research paper format and think about how would I create the media that would uh, change the way people might see and understand uh, the world, in this case, mapping New York. Um, so um, launching Hypercities just by um, clicking here or in our case to save time toggling over, well, we'll see if we can launch it live. Um, 
it takes a minute to load, and, and in, on your own laptop or computer, it would simply be a matter of using an updated browser like Chrome uh, and a free Google Earth plugin that can be loaded within the site or can be downloaded for free on the internet as a free version of Google Earth. And once you've done that, this is generally what appears. Um, I was tweaking this for a slightly better view of our maps over here. So um, we're now in a kind of live version. If I, and I, uh, please excuse me, I'm sort of doing these workarounds because I'm not on my own machine. But if you were in Hypercities initially, what you would see is this interface. You'll see 27 locations indicating these different cities around the world that are also plotted on this map. But realistically, the best developed cities are um, Los Angeles, Berlin, Rome, and New York, which is not um, intentional. It's just purely a function of the devotion of the researchers who took on uh, sponsorship of those cities and got the funding and the sustained interest to do that. Um, a lot of these other cities that are here, Tel Aviv has like two or three maps, and that's great, but it's different when you have 40 maps of New York or 50 of Berlin or LA. Uh, you, can, you can specify a lot more. Um, so once you've signed in um, to HyperCities, uh, your profile appears up here. So, um, and I'm, I'm trying to save a little time, but what happens is you would click log in. It would open up a window for either your, your own Facebook account, your Gmail account, your AOL account, whatever account you have pre-existing can be used to log in. You'd fill out a quick one-page form, which is really just a kind of uh, registry. It's not about gathering data, um, although I think the NSA told us that at one point too. So. Um, <laughs> you know, choose to believe me or not, but they're, they're not that interested in gathering your data at UCLA. They're really interested in just saying, are these students or faculty or researchers who are using the site? Um, and once you've logged in, um, you have the um, appearance of, of uh, this interface with the different layered maps. And I'm hesitating only because my view angle prevents me from seeing what you're seeing, um, but I'm hovering over these rather than clicking on these maps. And I want to give you the, the, um, the brief sort of tour, uh, if I might, um, showing you first that what you see over here is going to depend on how close or far away you are zoomed. And the um, example that I hoped to show. I'm going to actually make an executive decision. Can you hear me if I'm talking from up here? Yes. Okay, great. Um, because I, it, it won't do us much good if, if you can't, if I can't see what, what we're doing. Um, what I wanted to show was the redraft of the Castello plan. It's one of the, uh, smaller, oh, thank you very much. Leave it there, okay. Um, and again, I'm just clicking on the map. So this is this uh, database that's communicating with the service and allowing these historical maps to appear. Now I'm using a slider that allows us to actually, you know, ask the right cynical academic question. How accurately are these things placed over the Google interface? And you could use something like uh, Bowling Green on the lower left or uh, Wall Street on the upper right of the Castello plan to realize it's a pretty good correspondence. Um, and the information that you start to gain from uh, even just this juxtaposition of, of past and present map views um, is pretty revealing. Are we okay? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, for example, uh, as I was um, using the slider the very first time and looking at, at the Castello plan, I realized even when you block it out, there's almost a way in which Dutch New Amsterdam is legible in the Google Earth view, uh, something that the cartographic superimposition, I think, allows you to appreciate in, in a way that you might not if you were just playing around with the free version of Google Earth, right? So again, um, 
they're scanned at various levels. I think this one's only 300 DPI, uh, but the detail is pretty good. Um, you can recognize the future Broad Street after the British fill it in. You can recognize um, quite a few features. Uh, if I back out and the, the maps, again, will reload over here. Uh, telling us now that we're up to 41 available maps and you would use your scroll bar to see all the different map selections. I don't know, can you read the dates from where you are? But you know, you've got 1894, 1891, uh, 87, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all the way up to, you know, my attempt to counterbalance the bias in favor of Manhattan by getting some of the Brooklyn and Queens subway and bus maps, some maps of the Bronx, and a couple of historical maps of Staten Island. Um, and um, that was also to avoid the criticism of my students from Staten Island who said, <laughs> what about Staten Island? And they were absolutely right, so I got on the case. Um, another map, um, and I should say, that, you know, it's, a database built out of maps collected and donated by various New York institutions. The main one was the York, the old York collection at the CUNY Graduate Center Library supplied uh, 80 or so percent of the maps. Um, Madeline Kent helped us with that and then um, Matt Knudsen at the New York Public Library was very helpful, the UCLA Library. Um, those are the three main repositories. Um, Matt Knudsen kindly donated the um, Ratzer map from 1766, which is a staggering creation uh, from the late 18th century because it gives us so much detail from um, the farmlands of Brooklyn and Manhattan as well as the urban agglomeration. Um, there is uh, another favorite, uh, the 1775 Montresor map uh, of Manhattan. And again, you can start to see the possibilities for uh, simple comparisons, really, of how different representations of areas work. Uh, one of my um, sort of favorite is this uh, area of the Lower East Side, and you can see the servers trying to serve up these maps simultaneously. Generally clicking on them, um, again, will, will help stabilize things, but Murphy's Law dictates that um, it will continue rebelling. But if you can read this, it says this overflow is continuously filling up in order to build on. Um, may, maybe there are um, historians in the room who can help me understand why the Montresor map in 1775 tells us this, and the uh, Ratzer map in, from nine years earlier shows it has already filled in with streets on it. Um, and I suspect that might have to do with um, the indefinite nature of knowing the exact dates of publication. Uh, for example, my, my, it's not a map in Hypercities, but Nicolas Sanson's Atlas Nouveau from uh, 1792 has, um, I'm sorry, it's from 1692, has a map in it that shows the New World, but it has to be from somewhere around 1650. Uh, based on the information that's communicated in it. So the publication date isn't always going to be the map creation date. And, and again, it's just an observation that having um, you know, access to these various maps um, starts to allow us to see. Um, the bonus of the Ratzer map would probably have to be this view that's included at the bottom um, by the delineator. And, is a view of Lower Manhattan from Governor's Island. Uh, and again, since it's a fairly high resolution um, map, once the website has an opportunity to refresh, uh, you, you get this highly evocative uh, view. And um, he even goes so far as to tell you a, a Southwest view of the city of New York taken from the Governor's Island at, and then he's got a little asterisk. And sure enough, if you navigate up to Governor's Island, you find the asterisk and the place <laughs> from which the island is being viewed in all its glory. Um, and an another simple feature just from comparative mapping is the coastline and realizing that as you fade 
these coastlines in and out, you get your pretty good approximation of why Red Hook was such a disaster during Hurricane Sandy. Um, because the fill line that is tracked all over the place, right? This is all landfill, land created, um, often by developers whose sole interest is in getting the land high enough to be above the water line, but not above the 14 foot flood water line, um, leaves historical vulnerability for future generations that um, we experience. We also see that. Um, the detritus from the first subway tunnel, the six train being dumped to extend Nutmeg or Governor's Island out further into New York Bay, currently being converted into the park. Um, and you can you know, take, take this over to Manhattan and realize a pretty good uh, sense of the flood zone that occurred there as well. Although, I have this sort of blinking blinking cursor situation that I'm not sure what that means, but um, you, get, you get my, my drift. Um, and um, let me move then in the last few uh, minutes, I believe 15 minutes or so, to um, what it is that um, my students and myself have been doing. Um, there, are, there are many other um, interesting maps that I'd encourage you to explore um, inside this interface. So it's available simply as an online, interactive, cartographic collection at a minimum. If you want to exploit the media content capabilities, you would sign in and click on collections right next to this map view, right? And if you wanted to navigate for the purposes of people who are interested in, um, God forbid, cities other than New York, um, you might use the world map to click on um, one of these other locations, like um, perhaps Berlin um, or Rome or LA or any of these other spots, and you'll see that um, Google spins things around pretty fast. Um, but, but once you've clicked into your, your collection, um, you'll see a few options of public collections, things that have been made available, classes that are taught at UCLA, at Baruch College, at Stanford, um, a couple other places. And then um, under your own saved uh, category of my collections. Um, and I apologize because it's a little hard for me to, to see this. So forgive me as I wander to pick out the right um, collection that I wanted you to be able to um, sample. And uh, I think the, the student's work should perhaps um, be the highlight. And uh, in that connection, um, Anupa, I'm looking for one that says final project. I don't know if you can see from where you, oh, I thought you might have had a different. Um, that's the one. Can you do me a favor? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move my cursor over. There, all right, I'll take it from here. Okay. All right. Um, the icon over here might be hard to see, but it's meant to resemble a book, um, an open book. And when you click on that open book, we call it narrative mode. You're clicking on the presentation that has been saved. In this case, it's a collection of student presentations um, ranging from Wall Street to the World Trade Center site, the Highline Park, the evolution of broad, Broadway, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then um, ideally you're going to use your scroll bar to find the one you're looking for. Um, and I'm going to, um, let me see, take a look at, I'm trying to do this in an economical way. One of, one group of students I had one year, um, like the best dressed students I ever had, were very interested in fashion. And so I said, guys, for your final project, if you really want to teach us about the economics of fashion in New York City. And they went with it. Um, and so this student, um, whose name is Masha Pazdirkova from Staten Island, one of the ones who motivated me to get more maps from her location, um, did a wonderful job in um, what then still existed as Google Maps in a 2D setting. And then we learned how to save KML files and transfer them into um, 
hyper cities. And, and, and this is something that Matt Knutson has emphasized as well, which is systems that are being built online at the New York Public Library, um, when they're being done at the highest academic standard by cartographers, programmers, et cetera, they're emphasizing a buzzword known in the industry as interoperability. It's the ability of one system online to communicate with another system. So in this instance, what Masha did was take Google Maps in its simplest form, make her maps, save them as KML files, and then import them into HyperCities. Um, it's something that I eventually learned how to do, but I will be honest and say, I'm learning a lot from students who are ahead of me with their HTML skills and their Python skills and other programming skills. Um, and together, we've, we've figured out some of those interoperabilities. Matt Knutson and I sat down in his office at the NYPL for 45 minutes and realized, oh my god, HyperCities and the NYPL digital maps collection can talk to each other so that you can import maps from their servers. Uh, unbelievable. He didn't plan it that way. I certainly didn't because I'm not a programmer, but the people on that programming level had been looking ahead downstream uh, to how these things will evolve. So she has, um, you know, this, okay, we're not talking about like award-winning research. We're talking about a student project in which a mashup of videos from the Double Wears Prada could be placed next to a JPEG that provides some of the details about the New York fashion pyramid. I didn't even know there was a pyramid. There's a fashion pyramid. And, <laughs> and, you know, talking about New York City's niche, which companies, how it works in industry, how it spills down from top to bottom. Essentially the same speech that Meryl Streep gives to the intern at that key moment in Devil Wars Prada where the girl's wearing blue and makes that offhand remark and is destroyed by her <laughs> boss's boss, right? Um, I thought it was a pretty clever uh, mashup and then on and on with her own writing interviews with Diane von Furstenberg. You get the picture. A um, couple of scenes, obligatory Manolo Blahnik scenes from Sex and the City um, and finishing. It was around the time of the release of the documentary about um, Bill Cunningham. And one thing you can do is close out of the collection, but I'm going to save time by back pedaling, back stepping to um, another student project. Um, which I think we saw briefly in the PowerPoint uh, in case the system had come crashing down on us. This Brooklyn Bridge project I found to be quite remarkable by um, CUNY uh, Baruch College sophomore um, Pavel Feinleib, which is one of my favorite names um, of students I've taught. Excuse me while I click on options and his initial presentation required clicking on 3D buildings. Uh, again, that June 1st, 2013 thing that destroyed the 2D Google Maps interface left us only in Google Earth, closing off the two-dimensional mapping possibilities, but opening up the 3D modeling possibilities, the, the interoperability, if you will, with the 3D warehouse in Google SketchUp and, and other um, built-in features like this. Um, so that can be a, a pretty evocative way to fill out um, a map. And in Pavel's case, um, being himself a Brooklynite, he was really interested in this phenomenon by which the bridge was created. So he's, he's combining um, a lot of things here. If I could just take a moment to show you um, an overlay of an 1870 map onto an 1829 map reveals a street grid from 1870 that simply didn't exist in 1829. The 1829 map shows urban development only extending around this area of the Fulton Ferry. And um, from there, he um, uses a variety of secondary sources, primary sources, freely available um, images and things um, of life on the river line, copies of the bright, clips them, makes them communicating a rich media. Other uh, student examples, I would like to close perhaps showing um, maybe one of the um, pedagogical uh, attempts that I was making um, in using HyperCities. I'm just zooming out first. 
appreciating the disorientation, <laughs> clicking on the <laughs> N for North, which ideally this N for North, when you click it on the compass, gets you back to the familiar view. Um, and again, uh, one of the, the assignments I was exploring the possibility of creating, one of the things I liked to do in my classes is um, have the debate, uh, have the students engage in structured debate and they're assigned which side. So this is called the New York Gothic Revival debate and um, two teams had to come together and uh, represent two different takes on the Gothic Revival and this Hypercities site or collection was designed to give them their initial salvos of ammunition in the rhetorical battle that would ensue. Um, and so you get the 1849 map, the extent of the city at the time of um, the latest version of Trinity Church, some background, and the ability to highlight text and create links, um, in this case to Gothic revival primary source texts, which again on the Internet Archive site makes this type of interoperability pretty attractive. Um, and now I have to get back to where I was. Um, and so this, this goes on. It, it, it furnishes the rhetorical ammunition I don't have time to share with, but, but uh, they were asked to debate the subject matter. Um, you know, is the Gothic arch part of a kind of collective ornamental unconscious, a symbol of moral civility in the New York landscape, or is it simply just a magical sign of capitalists who exploit one another in private empires of wealth. That was essentially, <laughs> that was essentially the, the stakes of the debate. Um, we, um, and I think I have about three more minutes before 10 o'clock, so let me show one, one last bit. And I'll just do this um, at risk of violating the um, mapping New York credo um, by um, actually showing you a bit of research um, over in Berlin, uh, if I can. I don't know if I'm going to succeed in this. We'll go out to this version. Um, okay, I'm signed in here. We're going to click on Berlin. We're going to click on collections. Because at the high end, and what Todd Presner and his West Coast colleagues are polemicizing about to some extent is, what's the future of 21st century? One of these questions is how scholarly research with bibliographies and, and source attributions, um, in this case of um, my research on the Berlin Palace and its many reconstructions, the, the, the book mentioned by David in the introduction, it's from 1450 to 2020, because the darn thing is being rebuilt at a cost of 600 million euros, and it's going to finish in 2020, which is partly why the title of the book is The Eternal Palace, because you can kill it, but it's going to come back to life anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, so this, this was my attempt to incorporate the, the historical mapping capabilities with other um, media to show the, his, the archive important historical site. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. That really sort of opened up a whole series of questions that I know will only add to um, throughout the morning and the afternoon. Um, our next speaker is Stephen Robertson. He's director of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media and also a professor in the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University. And I have to add that uh, Roy Rosenzweig was a true digital pioneer, uh, a wonderful collaborator, uh, and a dear friend uh, to several of those, many of us actually in the room, uh, and he's dearly missed. Um, Stephen's most recent book, Playing the Numbers, Gambling in Harlem Between the Wars, uh, was written with several other Co colleagues and collaborators, uh, Harvard 2010. It's a prize winning book. And speaking of prize winning, Stephen also has his Digital Harlem, Everyday Life, 1915 to 1930, that we'll hear about today, 
this digital project won the Roy Rosenzweig Prize, as you can see the pattern here, for um, uh, digital uh, history, um, for innovation in uh, digital history of the American Historical Association, as well as, in, in, among others, the ABC Clio Online History Award with the American Library Association. Uh, he's written many other essays on New York and on sexuality and New York and sexuality. Um, and he also has a strong interest in pedagogy with numerous teaching prizes and awards and publications on doing history with hypertext. And is a noted speaker, finally, on digital humanities and digital Harlem. And to that end, uh, he'll speak today on putting Harlem on the map, visualizing everyday life in a 1920s neighborhood. Stephen. So I'm a lot less brave than John, so I'm not going to go on to Digital Harlem Live. Um, I'm going to stay with PowerPoint and um, the static images, notwithstanding um, the limitations of that. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I've only been the director at the Rosenzweig Centre since August. Um, before that, I spent the last 13 years at the University of Sydney. Um, and in fact, my colleague and collaborator on this project, Shane White, is sitting in his usually preferred option of right up the back in the audience there. So um, you actually have more than one part of this project. Um, which has moved around a lot. Um, it's actually quite an old project. Um, the site went live in 2009, and in a lot of ways it's technologically quite limited, um, but I would be very surprised if it's not new to many of you in the room, which is, I think, one of the challenges of digital history in the world in which we live that perhaps we can talk about later, that it can be there, it can win prizes, and people still can't find it and still can't talk about it. Now, um, I typically start my presentations by pointing to this image and saying that this is Digital Harlem. Um, but in fact, it's not really Digital Harlem. It's a historical map made from a real estate pub map published by Bromley in 1925 to 1940, overlaid on Google Maps. And often when I'm talking about mapping, I'm the only person talking about overlays on Google Maps. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning of this talk about the difference between that and other kinds of mapping. But in fact, you're kind of getting the Google Maps API version of digital mapping here today between me and John. And so perhaps it's not entirely represented. Um, in fact, this is a better image of what Digital Harlem is. The map is still there, but data has been added to it. In this case, the results of a search of our database for all the events. Um, all right. Okay, can we hear me now with the adjustments of volume? I don't usually have any trouble projecting in a room of this size. Um, okay, so this is really what Digital Harlem is. It's a map with the results of a search of our database for all the events in it from one month, January in 1930. Now, I'm opening with these two images because given that mapping is the organising idea for the symposium, I want to frame my remarks today by talking about exactly what kind of mapping is involved in this project. As with other areas of the digital humanities, as the community expands, mapping has come to encompass a range of different approaches, practices and tools. Distinguishing among those types of mapping is important in understanding just what each offers historians. In the case of Digital Harlem, I want to highlight the ways in which the site is not an example of historical GIS. Ge geographical information systems, in the sense of involving the use of software originally developed in the 1980s for geographers and other social scientists as a means for the spatial analysis of quantitative data. As ArcGIS software was the only option for mapping of which I was aware in 2003, I did imagine using that software when I contributed a few sentences mentioning doing something on the web to a grant proposal that Shane was writing for a collaborative project on everyday life in 1920s Harlem. But by the time I began working on a digital map with a team of collaborators, these gentlemen at the Archaeological Computing Laboratory at the University of Sydney, they were the GIS folk at Sydney, there was an alternative, thanks to the release, as John has already talked about, of an API by Google for its map platform, an application programming interface that, as he has described much better than I'm going to for you, allows Google Maps to be embedded in a website and data to be overlaid on that map. I titled this talk Putting Harlem on the Map in part because that is quite literally what Digital Harlem does. It places our sources on a map, one that we did not have to take the time and the resources to create ourselves. And it's important that placing our sources on a map is essentially all that Digital Harlem does. 
The site does not offer any way to have a computer conduct a spatial analysis of what is displayed on the map. There is no way to have the computer read the map for you. GIS software, on the other hand, does make possible the manipulation of data in a far more complex ways than simply layering it on a map. But that functionality requires time-consuming work creating more precise maps and data and working in a more complex and just plain confusing interface and is not very still, very web-friendly. By comparison, working with Google Maps is a shortcut. But I think crucially for most historians, it's a shortcut that does get you to a point that it makes it possible to analyse the qualitative sources that most of us continue to work with. Rather than relying on the computer, the spatial analysis enabled by a digital Harlem involves the user looking at the map and discerning for herself what patterns appear on it. Mapping in this sense is a form of data visualisation rather than the kind of statistical analysis associated with GIS, hence the subtitle of my talk, Visualising Everyday Life in the 1920s. As Trevor Harris, Jesse Rose and Susan Bergeron argue, the visual display of information creates a visceral connection to the content that goes beyond what is possible through traditional text documents. It's not just that map data is seen in its geographical context. Layers of different data, and hence large quantities of data, can be combined on a single map, providing an image of the complexity of the past. And this is about as complex a map as you can, well actually it's not, but it begins to hint at the complexity of maps that you can produce on Digital Harlem. You can examine maps of sources at different scales, as John showed us on Google Maps, and discover relationships by visually detecting patterns that remain hidden in texts and tables. It's important to understand that in the words of Richard White, and actually David's quoted some of this passage already, but I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Visualisation and spatial history are not about producing illustrations or maps to communicate things that you have discovered by other means. It is a means of doing research. It generates questions that might otherwise go unasked. It reveals historical relations that might otherwise go unnoticed. And it undermines or substantiates stories upon which we build our versions of the past. More broadly, mapping is crucial to what Karen Haltonen identified as the second wave of the spatial turn in the humanities scholarship. The move from constructing a spatial analysis that tended to the metaphorical and employed the idiom of borders and boundaries, frontiers and crossroads, centres and margins, to a concern with spatial issues more materially. Or as Richard White puts it, mapping helped shift historians' attentions from the language of spatiality to the spatial experience. This certainly describes my experiences with Digital, digital Harlem. It became a research tool performing the role of revealing patterns and spatial relationships that prompted questions I might otherwise have ignored and facilitated comparisons that I would not have considered. Answering those questions required going from the map to the sources it displayed, the pairing of visualisation with close reading. In other words, spatial analysis involves more than putting data on a map. With that framing in mind, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of how Digital Harlem lets users put material about everyday life on a map. And then I'll elaborate one example of the questions my own mapping raised and the answers I developed through a close rereading of the sources. Some of the show and tell that often dominates digital humanities presentations is going to be at work here, but I'm going to put my emphasis today really on coupling that with the elaboration of the difference that digital mapping made digital mapping made to the analysis that we developed in 1920s Harlem. The difference being something that we often leave out when we get carried away with showing off our shiny tools. As I mentioned, Digital Harlem was part of a larger collaborative project that aimed to get beyond the stock figures of 1920s Harlem, those familiar from the ever-expanding literature on the Harlem Renaissance and on black social and political organisations to examine ordinary people in everyday life in the neighbourhood. And that is me and Shane hiding up the back, who put together the project, his long-time collaborator, the recently deceased Graham White, and Stephen Garton, who probably wishes he was back working on this project, but for his sins is the provost of the University of Sydney currently. Um, this is an unusual collaboration anywhere in the world um, uh, that arose from the fact that Shane looked around and realised that, in fact, there were a group of us working on New York City, um, and he wanted to emerge from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, where he spent most of his time studying African Americans in the city, and come forward into the 20th century. 
Our core sources consisted of almost 3,000 case files from the files of the District Attorney, which both Shane and I have used extensively on our other research, files that contain accounts of crimes by or involving blacks and involve magistrates, court affidavits, grand jury indictments, witness statements, transcripts of hearings and trials, memos, the notes of the prosecutor, and items of evidence ranging from letters and photographs and on one quite remarkable occasion, a switchblade knife. We coupled those legal records with thousands, hundreds, thousands of pages of black newspapers, the New York Amsterdam News and the New York Age in particular, supplemented with a range of other published and archival material, including the records of New York's leading anti-prostitution organisation, the Committee of 14, records from the Bedford Hill Prison for Women, the WPA Widers Project on Harlem, black business directories and census schedules. We could do all of that because there were four of us and we were funded reasonably generously by the Australian Research Council. A database organises and integrates all of that information on the basis of street addresses. Every event and location that we found that included an address is in the database. This material wasn't machine readable. Both those black newspapers are now available digitised. They were not available digitised when we did this research. Um, so it's been entered by hand. Um, and what is in the database is not the documents, but synopses of the documents. Digital Harlem is not a digital archive, and I can talk a little bit about the copyright issues and logistical issues that explain why we did that. The range of activity captured by Digital Harlem can be seen in this list of the event types in the database. There are a lot of crimes in that pull-down menu. Um, and people who don't bother to go beyond looking at that have criticised Digital Harlem as dealing with crime, not everyday life. In fact, at present, case files constitute a minority of the sources in the database. Their prominence in the menu reflects how the variety of different offences in the law effectively disaggregates crime more than the other categories we've used for events. In fact, Digital Harlem highlights that black life in the 1920s was not dominated by crime any more than it was by the Harlem Renaissance, but was far richer, featuring parties, weddings, concerts, parades, basketball games, tennis tournaments, dances, lodge and social club meetings and parades. Recurrent events such as plays, movies, church services, YMCA activities and street speakers don't appear in the database as event types, but can instead be located by looking for their venues. And this list of location types in the database thus offers a further indication of the extensive picture of community in the 1920s offered by Digital Harlem. The site allows users to map the results of searches for events, for places and for people, to limit those searches in various ways, including by date, and to layer, most crucially, different searches on the same map to juxtapose different sets of material and begin to consider what kind of relationship they might have between them. Now, if I was braver, I would do this online, but I'm not going to do it, so we'll look at some screenshots. This is an example of a map of places in New York City. The biggest legitimate black business in the 1920s was beauty salons run by women. Um, but what is striking about those business is very few of them exist on the main commercial arteries in Harlem, which were um, Lenox and 7th Avenues and to a lesser extent 8th Avenue. Instead, the businesses are in cross streets, which means and points to the fact that they're located in the homes of most of the women running them. And this is the result largely of the fact that most of the business real estate in Harlem is owned by whites who were very unwilling and to rent it to blacks um, and were in fact using most of it themselves. You can click on any of the icons that appears on a map on Digital Harlem. It'll give you a first level of information about the place and then you can click on that and go into the database itself. So it shows that the address that this particular beauty parlour was in was also the site of a range of other kinds of businesses. Um, there are a couple of prostitution arrests at this address um, and an arrest for an assault as well. You can also map events. Um, this is a map of parties and social club meetings from the 1925, one of the underutilised aspects of the black press are uh, some very extensive social pages. Um, and one of the things that you can do mapping things like events is to trace change over time by mapping um, 
those activities at different points. So that's the parties and social clubs in 1925. That's the parties and social clubs in 1930. Um, and if you look closely, you can see some of those from 1925, but you can also see a vastly more active social scene for the black middle class in Harlem by the 1930s, some of which exists on the streets that I'm sure some of you recognise as the prominent um, middle class parts of Harlem, but actually a vast amount of that social activity is in parts of the neighbourhood that we do not associate um, with the middle class and that spills beyond the boundaries of black settlement, which is the lines that you can see on the map there. Um, there is much less um, opportunity to map individuals in Harlem. This is part of the project that got away from us. There are simply too many people in there for the kind of data entry we're doing. The maps that you can make are of individuals placed on probation um, because those records offer us slices of people's lives. People reporting to their probation officers every week where they are and what they're doing give us a real indication of how they're living their lives. This is one of our more ubiquitous examples of this, um, a man who we, we call Morgan Thompson because municipal archives would rather we not use his name, even though in fact his legal record is public. Um, a West Indian labourer who was on probation between 1928 and 1933. And what's very striking about this is that all of those lines that I've zoomed out so that you can see represent the places where Morgan Thompson worked at this point. Um, he is not working in Harlem, he's working in fact all over New York City and therefore spending vastly more of his life outside Harlem than in. The patterns for women are slightly different. This is for a woman, again, pseudonymously called Annie Dillard from the Bedford Hills records um, on parole in New York City. Again, not working in Harlem overwhelmingly, but working as a domestic servant um, on the Upper West Side um, in a hotel in Midtown and then as a laundress in an industrial laundry down at the bottom. Some overlap with where male workers are working, but other areas that are quite distinctive. Um, the reason why there's no work for either of these people in Harlem is the same reason why there's no space for any of those black beauty parlours on the main avenues in Harlem. The businesses in Harlem are owned by whites and they're operated by whites. Um, and these maps raise questions about the white presence in Harlem, a population that's been a population that's mar marginalised in both contemporary and scholarly views of the neighbourhood. And so this is the point where I'm going to move from show and, show and tell to make an argument that shows, I think, the difference that digital mapping can make. So, James Weldon Johnson, the African-American polymath and leader of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, offered one of the classic images of Harlem's place in the city in the survey graphic in 1925, and I'm going to read the quote even though it's up there in front of you. A stranger who rides up the magnificent 7th Avenue on a bus or in an automobile must be struck with surprise at the transformation which takes place after he crosses 125th Street. Beginning there, the population suddenly darkens and he rides through 25 solid blocks where the passers-by, the shoppers, those sitting in restaurants, coming out of theatres, standing in doorways and looking out of the windows are practically all Negroes. And then he emerges where the population has suddenly becomes white again. Now, federal censuses confirm Johnson's picture, even as they truncate somewhat the area in which residences turn solidly black to between 128th and 144th streets in 1925. The racial homogeneity of the residents of Harlem and the other neighbourhoods in northern cities in which black migrants made their homes in the 1920s has led to them being interpreted as places where blacks found rest from white folks as well as from labour. However, Johnson did not present Harlem as entirely populated by blacks. Rather, his visitor journeying on 7th Avenue saw practically all Negroes. That unstated white presence of, was of little account in Johnson's view. I know of no place in the country where the feeling between the races is so cordial and at the same time so matter-of-fact and taken for granted, he wrote. The situation only improved in his eyes during the second half of the decade. Returning to the topic in his Black Manhattan in 1930, he claimed, it is apparent that race friction, as it affects Harlem as a community, has grown less and less each year for the past 10 years, and the signs are that there will be, not be a recrudescence. Scholarly accounts of Harlem echo Johnson in making only passing mention of the white presence and treating race relations in Harlem as essentially inconsequential in everyday life. The whites that attract a mention are business owners and slummers frequenting the neighbourhood's nightlife and to a lesser extent the police who patrolled its street. 
But mapping the white presence in Harlem, I found not only those white business owners, police and slummers, but also delivery men, salesmen and bill collectors, public school teachers, hospital staff, drivers and sports fans. And I'm going to explain this slightly confusing map as I go along. Those whites were marbled throughout the neighbourhood to such an extent that they were part of the everyday life of black residents. A close reading of the sources found that these unaccounted for aspects of life in the neighbourhood produced interracial encounters that frequently led to conflict, revealing that Harlem was a place of contestation, negotiation, resistance and accommodation, rather than some kind of straightforward refuge. That's not to say that friction with whites present in Harlem overshadowed the web of institutions, organisations and social and cultural practices that residents created and that the scholars of African American urban experience have reconstructed. Rather, it is to recast the context in which that community took shape. So before I look at those interracial encounters in Harlem, I want to describe in a little more detail the white presence visualised on this map. The neighbourhood businesses lined the avenues that run north-south through Harlem, as well as the, on the cross streets of 125th, 135th and 145th Street. A survey by the New York Age in 1916 found that whites from outside Harlem owned 75% of the 503 businesses in the area where blacks lived, and employed only 150 black workers. By 1929, another survey reported even greater white control. 81% of the 10,319 businesses in Black Harlem were run by whites, with no change in their refusal to employ blacks. From the avenues, white businesses extended their presence into the residential streets. White deliverymen, insurance salesmen and rent and bill collectors all ventured on Harlem's residential cross streets and into its apartment buildings and houses. So too did the Italian ice dealers, who for much of the 1920s had a monopoly on providing the ice on which Harlem's residents and businesses relied to store food as well as cool drinks. Whites could also be found on the avenues themselves. White conductors and drivers manned the buses that traversed 7th Avenue, as well as the elevated railroad that ran up 8th Avenue and the subway that ran under Lenox Avenue. Lenox and 7th Avenues also saw more traffic than any other roadway north of 59th Street, most of it driven by whites, including the vast majority of the taxis serving the neighbourhood, thanks to the refusal of the three largest taxi hair companies to employ black drivers. This is one of those classic racial encounters that I'm not actually going to talk about between the black traffic policeman and the white streetcar driver. Institutional spaces scattered throughout Harlem remained under white control. Black police officers did serve in the neighbourhood, but whites made up the vast majority of the police in the station on 135th Street and who patrolled posts along the avenue and manned traffic posts at the major intersections. All the firefighters based at the station on West 137th Street were white. New York's only black firefighter worked downtown on Broome Street. Harlem Hospital which filled a block between 136th and 137th Street east of Lenox Avenue in the very heart of the black neighbourhood. Had no black staff until a few nurses were hired in 1917 and no black doctors able to visit the patients or conduct surgery until 1925. More strikingly, as late as 1929, whites also made up one third of the patients, reflecting the fact that the hospital's district reached all the way down to 110th Street. Attending school likewise took Harlem's children into spaces overseen by whites, although unlike the hospital, by the end of the 1920s, few whites joined them. In 1928, 400 of the 500 teachers in Harlem's eight public schools were white, but only 2,000 of the 15,000 pupils. That same pattern was also evident in two of the three Catholic schools in Harlem. The third, right up there on West 153rd Street, was associated with a parish in which whites were still a majority in 1929 reflecting the relatively slow place at which blacks became the majority in Harlem's Catholic congregations. Every evening, crowds of white visitors numbering in the thousands joined those working in Harlem. The neighbourhood's famous nightclubs and speakeasies were never the only entertainments that drew visitors. Whites made up a significant minority of the audience at 7th Avenue's Lafayette Theatre. They attended basketball games at the Renaissance Ballroom and at the Manhattan Casino on Harlem's northern border. Boxing belts also drew large crowds of whites to the Commonwealth Casino, the venue on East 135th Street owned by the White McMahon brothers. During summer, 
afternoons in the 19-teens and early 1920s, whites could also be found among the fans at baseball games at Olympic Field, a block north of the Commonwealth Casino at 5th and 136th Street, and at Lennox Oval on 145th Street, 45th Street, and later at venues in the Bronx and Washington Heights to which Harlem's teams relocated. Part of the draw of all those sporting events for patrons of both races was that they frequently pitted blacks against whites. But even games between black teams drew white fans. Most reports in the 1920s put the proportion of white fans at somewhere between one quarter and one half of crowds that numbered in the thousands. Beyond the stands, at least until the second half of the 1920s, many referees and umpires were also white. The relative harmony evoked by James Weldon Johnson is evidence in sports events and many of the encounters between blacks and whites who ran the neighbourhood's businesses. But those commercial exchanges also produced conflict and crime. Clashes echoed in residents' dealings with police, drivers and criminals. Many of the most violent interracial encounters in Harlem involved police officers, a ubiquitous presence patrolling the streets both in uniform and in plain clothes. Policing involved arrests without cause and on suspicion and random beatings when in custody, including the officially sanctioned abuse of suspects that in the 1920s acquired the label the third degree. Harlem's residents individually and collectively challenged that behaviour. To take just one example, just after midnight in September 1927, Carter Watkins, a 28-year-old barber, was on the stoop of his home on St Nicholas Avenue with several companions when two officers ordered him inside. Carter refused, asserting that as a tenant he had a right to be there. The officers, claiming he also had made an obscene remark, tried to arrest him, batten swinging. Carter's friends scattered, but his younger brother Peter came to his aid, resulting in a fierce brawl that left all four men with bruises and broken bones. The Watkins brothers allege that they sustained at least some of their injuries from beatings administered after their arrest. Two days later, when arraigned in the magistrate's court, they were still so covered in blood and bruises that a reporter described their features as unrecognisable. Nonetheless, they continued to challenge their treatment by the police, a not uncommon occurrence in Harlem's courtrooms. After a two-day trial, Magistrate Silberman dismissed the charges against the brothers and instead urged action against the two police officers. When the police and residents clashed on one of the neighbourhood's major avenues, at times when more people were about, crowds could be drawn into the violence. Precisely what happened in such encounters was the subject of much debate in the New York press, with white papers quick to see any gathering of blacks as a riot, and their black counterparts equally certain that such assemblies were marked more by curiosity than any desire to commit violence. Accounts of a disturbance on Lennox Avenue near 138th Street in July 1928 bared the completely different perceptions of the white and black press. A woman had yelled out of a window at a nearby traffic police officer, Charles Cubio, that he should stop a fleeing black man named Clarence Donald. After a short, short and sharp chase, Donald was apprehended. At this point, the press accounts diverged along racial lines. The New York Times reported that Donald knocked Cubio down, whereupon a crowd rushed to join him in attacking the officer. The Age in the News, by contrast, reported that bystanders were provoked into violence by the sight of police beating Donald as he stood with his hands in the air and then striking a nearby woman who rebuked the police for assaulting the suspect. Even the age, however, had to admit that many of those who subsequently joined the fight had no idea what had started it. For them, it was enough that blacks were fighting police officers, an attitude that reflected, as the reporter put it, individuals embittered against white police. Although the Age editorialised warning of the danger of Harlem cultivating a sentiment of being again the police, generally the paper took the lead in protesting against police violence. Marilyn Johnson has argued that anti-brutality activism lay largely dormant in the 1920s, pointing to the small number of cases taken up by the NAACP. But notwithstanding that organisation's acquiescence, the Age extensively covered cases of police brutality, and its editor Fred Moore helped victims gather evidence, make complaints and find lawyers. Traffic accidents involving white drivers led to clashes similar to those precipitated by police. In the mid-1920s, an average of almost 10 people a day, including two children, suffered injuries in automobiles automobile accidents between 130th and 155th streets, mostly, as you can see in this map, on the avenues. 
Neither the traffic police stationed at the most dangerous intersections nor signal lights installed in 1928 helped much. And I have to tell my favourite story here. The stories on why the traffic lights didn't work suggested that people had no idea which colour meant go and which meant stop. <laughs> and so they simply drove through the traffic lights. Given that most drivers, including all those driving public transport and most behind the wheel of taxis, were white, many crashes were interracial affairs, and some fled into confrontations that drew in bystanders. After all, they're happening on Harlem's main streets. Such was the case one afternoon in June 1925, when a crosstown streetcar had a black labourer named Thomas Emanuel as he tried to cross 145th Street near 7th Avenue. Apparently he suffered only minor injuries, at least until he demanded an explanation from the white motor man about why he'd driven into him. A short pithy insult directed at the black man led to blows and then another motorman joined in and countless bystanders followed suit. A wild brawl accompanied by a cacophony of swearing, screaming women and children, whistles and car horns ensued for, ensued for some 25 minutes, stopping traffic and ending only when a police officer arrived. In a decision suggestive of the way things were in Harlem, police charged a manual, the black man, and not with insulting, not with assaulting the streetcar driver, but with inciting a riot. Whites who visited Harlem could also draw hostile reactions depending on where they went. Those seeking sex and cheap liquor on Harlem street corners and side streets provoked more antagonism than did those patronising entertainment venues. Some men in search of prostitutes mistakenly approached respectable black women, inflaming both the women and male bystanders. More often, white men in search of a good time became the prey of thieves, who took advantage of their unfamiliarity with the neighbourhood. George Domerant, a 19-year-old elevator from the Bronx, for example, and his friend Edward Zabrinsky, were walk walking on Lenox Avenue one evening in January 1930 when Edie Robinson approached them. He offered to take them in a, to an address where they could get a drink and a girl. The two men followed Robinson east down West 129th Street, off the well-travelled main street and into a side street, into number 31 and up the stairs. Two black men entered the hallway behind the group, pulled knives and robbed Dommer and Zabarinsky of $15 and stripped them of their overcoats. It was January, after all. Such interracial crimes did not dissuade Slummers and Johns from spending time in Harlem, or at least on the avenues and in entertainment venues. Two men who had been robbed in 1926 after being lured in a similar way into a hallway with promises that they would find prostitutes were back in Harlem seven weeks later attending a show at the Lafayette Theatre when they recognised one of their assailants and caused his arrest. Whites making sales calls, delivering goods and collecting bills had no choice but to leave the avenues, traverse Harlem's residential streets and enter buildings, making them easy pickings for thieves. The appearance in the Washington Heights courts of an eight-man gang arrested for more than 75 hallway robberies in November 1925 grew a crowd that the newspaper reporter described as delivery drivers for Gimbel's brothers, Macy's, Hearns and Best's, old grey-haired insurance collectors and real estate agents to file complaints against them. Thieves also targeted ice dealers and taxi drivers who ventured into, ventured into Harlem's residential streets to do business. As almost the only whites on those blocks, off the avenues, they were conspicuous and easily identifiable as worth robbing. Nonetheless, like Slummers and Johns, they did not abandon Harlem, although many likely joined Frederick McKee, a gas company collector, in changing their behaviour after being robbed. He armed himself with a revolver and in December 1928 shot one of a trio of men who tried to rob him for the second time. Harlem's sporting events, by contrast, saw a greater accommodation between blacks and whites. Despite the racial mingling that must have taken place in unsegregated venues, the press reported no violent clashes at baseball and basketball games or boxing bouts. That is not to say that tensions did not exist within the crowds. Romeo Doherty, the sports editor of the Amsterdam News, characterised many white boxing fans as hoping to see the coloured fighters knocked from their thrones and to enjoy the satisfaction of witnessing the defeat of the coloured boys. By the same token, Gus Amos, the white assistant matchmaker at the Commonwealth Casino, complained that whenever the Negro fighters win from white opponents at this club, and they usually win, their supporters become so enthusiastic that they often make unsportsmanlike and sometimes insulting remarks to the white fans. But black fans really went further. Though when they felt a black fighter had been cheated of a win over a white opponent, Amos recounted, they did throw peanuts and pieces of hot dog but seemingly at the judges and the referee, not the white fans. 
Reactions to white businesses in Harlem were even more mixed than to whites visiting the neighbourhood. Although some businessmen were shrewd enough to hold prejudice and restraint for the sake of trade, as columnist Kelly Miller put it, poor service, a lack of respect, cheating and racist jibes all prompted angry reactions from black customers. In July 1930, for example, the screams of one woman attracted an angry crowd of several hundred to a hat cleaning and shoe shining establishment on Lenox Avenue. She claimed to have been struck by the right proprietor, Philip Nasselbaum, during a, a, during a dispute over ribbon missing from a hat he had cleaned. With the crowd besieging the, sh besieging the shop, a police officer on the scene had to summon a squad in order to arrest Nasselbaum and protect his store. However, in most cases, residents did not respond to objectionable behaviour with conf confrontations. The age lamented that most customers meekly accepted their treatment. Characteristically more biting in its judgment, the interstate Tatler noted that aside from the occasional West Indian woman or housewife fresh from the South, the rest of us seemed to glory in being victimised, with women of the notion that to insist on what they ask for or to protest against short weight would be unladylike. More was at work, however, in continued patronage of white businesses than a lack of fortitude or a concern with respectability. Some residents actually preferred them, choosing not to spend their money in stores run by members of their own race and refusing to make payments to black collectors, to be served by black waiters or taxi drivers, or to be examined by black physicians. In explaining their behaviour, those residents claimed white businesses carried more stock, provided better service and charged lower prices, and that white professionals had greater skill. And in many cases, thanks to the refusal of whites to provide blacks with capital and access to training, they were correct. Marginalised in the legitimate economy, a small group of blacks did find success outside the law, running gambling on numbers. And I'm going to say a very little bit about what we wrote a whole book about here. Invented in 1920 or 21, the numbers game had by 1924 exploded into a racket turning over tens of millions of dollars every year. Confined in the 1920s to black neighbourhoods and taking the form of thousands upon thousands of small bets of only a few cents, numbers largely escaped the attention of whites outside Harlem. Not so the gangsters and bootleggers who ran most of the clubs, neighbourhoods, clubs and speakeasies. In 1924 and again in 1931, whites tried to take over the industry. First Mo Immerman, Hyman Castle and a group of Jewish bootleggers, and later Dutch Schultz, a Bronx bootlegger with ties to the Mafia. As well as trying to lure black runners and collectors into their employ, paying black bankers debts when a popular number hit in return for a share of the business, and using police contacts to have competitors harassed, white gangsters employed a strategy that reflected the neighbourhood's spatial order. They attempted to shift the locus of numbers gambling from the apartment block and street from Black Harlem to its stores, the businesses run by whites, including a chain of stationary stores, the castle established and staffed with his own relatives in order to be a front for gambling. While both Immerman's group and Schultz wrested much of the numbers racket away from blacks, neither gained complete control of the game in Harlem. Much of the explanation for that failure lies in the way that residents reacted to the white incursions. The New York Age and its editor Fred Moore campaigned against gambling, helping in 1926 to provoke a police crackdown on businesses running numbers that increased the cost of the racket and cut white bankers off from their customers. More tellingly, black players showed a reluctance to place their bets with whites. Collecting a bet involved a performance that selling illegal liquor or groceries did not. Talking easily and well in a banter drawn from the dreams and details of life in Harlem and a slang it spawned to create a sense of intimacy. Whites struggle to hit the cultural notes and tone and manner that accompany playing the numbers, and even to gain a hearing when they called at homes to collect bets. As the black writer Claude Mackay noted, in this context, coloured folk are not comfortable with whites penetrating into their homes. Black runners and collectors responded to the white takeovers by organising and appealed to residents to patronise independent black bankers and on occasion went on strike. At the same time, Numbers Queen Stephanie Sinclair directly challenged Schultz, attacking his businesses and unleashing a wave of violence and killings. After a white assassin's bullet finally put an end to Dutch Schultz and his efforts to control numbers in 1935, blacks and whites reached an accommodation. Most of the money bet on numbers continued to leave the neighbourhood, but blacks operated some banks and handled most of the day-to-day -day operations of the game, 
which as which as it had been from its invention, took place largely in Harlem's black spaces, its residences rather than its businesses. Such encounters puncture any sense that Harlem offered a world apart from whites or a realm in which blacks could relax their concern about racial discrimination and violence. To be sure, there are a multitude of places within Harlem controlled by blacks, mostly residences, but also churches, fraternal lodges, and some dance halls and theatres. But right controlled businesses and public spaces ran through the heart of Harlem, fragmenting the black district in ways obscured by conventional maps that represent the district as a solid area, area of black residences. Mapping the places that made up Harlem and the breadth of everyday life that occurred within them reveals the variety of interactions that blacks had with whites in the neighbourhood. In the context of that contestation, negotiation, resistance and accommodation, the riot that occurred in Harlem in 1935 was not an abrupt departure from the character of the neighbourhood in the 1920s, nor a sudden exposure of violence. Racial tensions and violent clashes with whites were a recurrent feature of everyday life throughout the 1920s and up till 1935. What appears new in 1935 is not the violence, but its scale. If James Weldon Johnson's stranger had taken his journey up 7th Avenue on the morning after the riot, along with crowds of blacks, he would have seen white shopkeepers cleaning up the 697 plate glass windows shattered by their black customers. But exactly where were those windows? Answering that question could shed new light on just what happened that night in 1935, and that is just what my collaborators and I are currently working on using Digital Harlem to do. Thank you. So we're going to take a brief coffee break, and there are some freshmen outside, and we'll be back at 11. Hi.
sorry to move you around so abruptly and brusquely, uh, but we have a full day, and so we're. And we're um, Eric Sanderson is a senior con conservation ecologist in the Wildlife Conservation Society. He works to find sustainable relationships between people and the rest of nature. He's published widely on species and landscape conservation, including on the global human footprint, uh, range-wide and landscape approaches to conservation, to species conservation. He's also director of the Wakeia. Um, Wakeia. Wailakia? Wailakia. Yeah, you have to say it three or four times. Yes, I practiced <laughs> earlier. I looked up a pronunciation guide uh, in the Lenape uh, that was online, and I transliterated it, and I, amongst the nervousness here, m mangled it. Uh, so thank you. Um, um, on the historical ecology of the five boroughs of New York City, which grew out of the Manhattan Project, an investigation of Manhattan on the eve of European discovery 400 years ago. That project led to a best-selling book, uh, in 2009, a museum exhibition, which many of us have seen, uh, educational curriculum, TED Talks, uh, and two websites uh, on the past ecology of the city and Manhattan uh, 2409, which is what we're going to hear about today, which is a platform for imagining Manhattan's environmental future. He's also the uh, author of the recent book, Terra Nova, The New World After Oil, Cars, and Suburbs. And he's going to speak today on the Manhattan 2409, uh, Conceiving and Sharing the Future of New York City. Eric, thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks very much for all of you for coming. Um, so, you know, I, ha I feel like I feel a little bit a fish out of water because uh, on the one hand, I'm an ecologist. I'm an amateur historian or economist or um, urban planner and architect, as you'll see. But, um, but my training is really in ecology. I'm really a natural science guy. Um, and I work for a conservation organization. I don't work for a university at all. So, so that's one difference between me and the two previous speakers. And uh, another difference is that um, um, although I use history in a lot of my work, my real ambition is to shape history, to shape the future of where, where we're going in New York City and the country and, and in fact, in the world. That's the, the ambition of the Wildlife Conservation Society is to find ways for people and nature to, to get along in the 21st century world. Um, but what I do share with the previous two presentations is a, is a deep love and affection for maps and spatial information, what we call a spatially explicit perspective in the natural sciences, and, uh, and particularly digital uses of that. And so um, in the course of the next uh, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I'm going to show you three large examples of how we're trying to bring cartographic um, map representations, all sorts of kinds, together to try and and meet this ambition of, of building a more sustainable relationship between people and nature. And um, I'm going to talk um, in three parts, sort of a trilogy, um, a, a little bit about Mana Hata, about our work to understand the ecology of New York City as it was 400 years ago, um, a little bit of work to understand how we got the city we live in today and how it might change in the future. That's uh, this book, Terra Nova. And then this third book that actually um, we're writing together. It's maybe more of an edited volume, and it's entirely digital. And that's this Manahata 2409, and it's something I hope um, that maybe you'll have a look at um, after, after today. So part one, Manahata. Um, this is, of course, the place where we are. And after a decade of research, this is our idea of what it might have looked like 400 years ago. Um, on the eve of Henry Hudson, that's Henry Hudson's ship there in the Hudson River on the left, um, <laughs> sailing in. This is, this is a, an image by Markley Boyer, who was a graduate of the Bard Graduate Center, was a huge part of the, the project, um, to help us understand Manahata. Manahata means island of many hills. That's a Lenape word. And that smoke you see rising from the Cluck Pond in lower Manhattan was a Lenape settlement there. Uh, there have been people living in the New York City region for about 8,000 years, of which the Lenape were just the latest culture. At, uh, in 1609 when Henry Hudson showed up. Uh, we think this island had a thousand different species and 55 different ecosystem types and uh, it was truly extraordinary. It's truly extraordinary in our world because it actually had all its parts interacting with each other in a full way. And um, I often start my talks to students from kindergartners to university students asking them to tell me what they see different in these two, these two images. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's actually the same place just offset in time, right? And if you've got nothing else out of anything else I'll say, 
that's the important, you know, that's a really important point that the landscapes change over time and they, they change through sets of historical processes that we can uncover and understand and that we can shape going forward. Um, we do a lot of this work by using maps, so using historical maps in particular, and this is uh, the British headquarters map, not from Hudson's time, but from the American Revolution, approximately 1782, 1783, uh, made by the British military occupying New York City. It has a fascinating uh, history, um, but what really got me jazzed about this map is uh, not the, the pink blocks of the city you see here on the, the left, as cool as that is, I don't know. I'm not pushing hard enough, the top button. Anyway, well, you see it. That's New York City circa 1782. It was basically Bowling Green, the City Hall Park. And then north of that, the map's on its side, of course, is the Collect Pond, our marshes and wetlands, our beaches and hills and streams, um, all of which have names where, where the landscape of New York, you know, for, well, for thousands of years, really. This is the island of, of many hills that's revealed on this map that uh, in the National Archives, you see the, the physical copy of it. It's 10 feet long and three and a half feet wide and six inches to a mile scale. It's really an extraordinary map. And it's called the British Headquarters map um, because it's thought that it hung in the British headquarters on Wall Street during the revolution, the culmination of uh, literally hundreds of maps made by the British military during, during the Revolutionary, Re revolutionary War. And you can see it goes all the way up. There's Harlem. Um, so that's digital Harlem circa <laughs> 1782. Um, so when I see, you know, 137th Street and the police station there, I'm thinking, oh, was that where the wetland was? I think that's where the wetland was. Um, and, of course, it goes all the way up to the northern end of the island. It's Harlem Creek or the Harlem River, as we would call it, Jeffrey's Hook, where the George Washington Bridge goes across, and the winding ways of Spite and Dival separating Manhattan from the Bronx. Um, so we, as was mentioned before, take this map into a geographic information system and georeference it. And um, because of the, the original quality of this map, and there's a whole historical story about why this map was, I think, so accurate. I think it's actually a, a we're very, very lucky to have such an early map that was so precisely done. Um, we were able to georeference it with a, a root mean square error of about 40 meters, so which is about half a block. So that we're seeing features, and you can see that particularly here in Lower Manhattan, the features we see on the map are within about a half a block of their original location. Um, and then you can take the computer, you can start uh, decomposing the map, deconstructing it, um, literally tracing the streams, um, reconstructing the hills, um, eventually modeling the soils. You add in other kinds of information. This geographic information system technology is a really powerful thing, and it, it, is, it does, certainly does have a learning curve associated with it. Um, but the rewards after you get over the curve is that you can um, model, model relationships in physical space, in geographic space. Um, in the end, we had 1,600 maps describing the historical landscape of Manhattan, all laid on top of each other, and which georeference to the buildings and the streets of the city today. Um, and to do that, you know, these maps, they represent, as I say, relationships. They represent our understanding of the world. So um, there's a famous American ecologist, uh, G. Evelyn Hutchinson. He talked about the ecological play. The play is played on a stage, which is the physical factors of the landscape, the soils and the slopes and the topography and the shoreline and the watercourses. And in some sense, you know, if nothing else happened, that would determine where different plants and animals would live. But in fact, something else does happen. It's drama, it's disturbances, and it's Hurricane Sandy is a, is a disturbance to the ecological system. Um, things like winds and fires and floods and sea level rise and hurricanes and flooding, some of which come from species, including from people. We talk about anthropogenic disturbances. That's what conservation, we're very concerned with those sorts of things. There's also non-anthropogenic ones. And they interact with the stage. They're the drama on the stage, if you like, that then um, gives a role for the players, for the ecosystems, and for the species inhabiting those ecosystems. Whether we're talking about a mid-reach stream, or a high salt marsh, or a chestnut oak forest, or the other 55 different ecosystem types that were on Manhattan 400 years ago. Which, um, I'm a Californian, I'm not from New York originally, and I, I was completely amazed. I never would have projected that there was this many ecosystems on this little narrow island 400 years ago. To give you a contrast, um, Yellowstone National Park, which is 2.2 million acres, has 63 vegetation types. 
Manhattan's one tenth of one percent of that same area, and it has 55 types. And you know, you don't have to have a PhD in ecology to know that if you have many different ecosystems, you have many different habitat opportunities. That then becomes the basis for a, a diverse biological um, situation for biodiversity. People as part of that story. Um, people living in hemlock northern hardwood forests and creating grasslands. We, when I think of Harlem, I think of it as a grassland that was probably created so by Native Americans lighting fires. And there was a whole line of the research where we modeled fire at different frequencies to figure out how often would you have to burn Harlem for it to become a grassland. And then comparing that to historical records of what the Europeans were saying about the Lenape. Uh, this is what uh, the Kleck Pond, the freshwater source for New York for 200 years, for the Lenape people for thousands of years before in lower Manhattan, about Foley Square, if you know that area, what it might have looked like. Uh, the forest around here would have been this sort of coastal Appalachian oak pine for forest, very kind of open and warm and very fragrant, particularly on a day like today. Um, there were 66 miles of streams on Manhattan. Um, we think up to 300 springs, of which we located about 85 different springs. Um, about 25% of the island was wetlands. Um, and about half of those were salt marshes, and salt marshes are the ecosystem that grows on the edge of the land and the water, and uh, it's the places where the floods go. And as, as John indicated, it's also the places that Hurricane Sandy flooded, right? If you, if you map for the whole city the relationship of the filled wetlands and the flooding zones for Hurricane Sandy, there's about an 80% match. Um, so, you know, forgetting about marshes and beaches is a problem, <laughs> um, as we're finding out. So there were beaches on the Hudson River shore up to 40th Street and, and pockets on the East Coast shore, on the East River shore. And of course, there are the, the ecosystems that people make. People make ecosystems. These buildings are ecosystems. The streets are ecosystems. And that wigwam, which uh, my son many years ago helped me build um, at the New York Botanical Garden, is an ecosystem. So are fields and trails and shell middens. Um, so just to remember, of course, that Manahata wasn't an uh, unpeopled wilderness. It was a peopled wilderness, um, a peopled with these people. This is a, a Lenape person from down near Pennsylvania. They lived from here across New Jersey and down into, in a, uh, into Pennsylvania. William Penn knew about them. They were an Algonquin-speaking people. They lived in small bands. They didn't have a king. They didn't have a written language. They had a very rich oral language. Uh, they made wampum, which you see, that's a wampum belt there, which was a customary trade good that they would give away to mark respect. Because they didn't have uh, our modern capacity to have a, an unlimited bank account, right? You know, you, you can have as much money as you want in your bank account or as much money as you can put there. But for Lenape, they didn't have that. They just had the respect of their friends and their colleagues and their small communities. Um, there's a lot to say about them, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, keep moving along. Talk a little bit about their horticulture. They grew some of their food. We think about 30% of their food in um, these three sisters' gardens which is a symbiosis of corn, beans, and squash, um, a really wonderful way to grow your food. They also hunted and fished and um, gathered shellfish, particularly clams and oysters. And uh, in the process, they were a disturbance agent. You know, they had their camps and their active fields and their old fields, which were then eventually become shrublands. So there's a whole successional sequence, you know. You clear the field, and after 20 years, you have to abandon it, and that becomes a grassland. And then after about 70 years, that becomes a shrubland. And then after about 100 years, that becomes part of the forest. And of course, what kind of forest depends on the soil and topography and um, the pattern of, dis of disturbance. So you get tulip tree forests and oak hickory forests and oak pine forests and beaches and salt marshes. And I just want to say, you know, this map is, is also a model and it's also a way of understanding. Um, it's also a, a mapping of neighborhoods, right? So when I give public talks, I often say, well, you know, these were the neighborhoods of the Lenape people. You guys know Tribeca and the Upper East Side and Inwood. They knew tulip tree forest and oak hickory forest and beaches. And, and it's not even so dissimilar. I mean, you know, like modern New Yorker, if you could blindfold them and drop them in a neighborhood and they take off the blindfold, they'd look around. They would see what kind of food can you eat here, right? <laughs> they would see, you know. <laughs> what other kinds of wildlife are walking down the street, and they would, you know, know what ecosystem they were in. S same thing for these guys. So, um, of course, they lived in a world with lots of other organisms, too, and they knew all the names of them. They knew chicken mushroom and, and 600 species of flowering plants, uh, 
uh, flowers and shrubs and trees, uh, 75 different species of fish, freshwater fishes, saltwater fishes, anadromous fishes, the ones that go back and forth, um, 350 different species of birds, um, most of which you can still see in Central Park. Not this guy, unfortunately. This is the, the heath hen, which uh, was a grassland specialist on the East Coast that went extinct in, the, in 1929. Um, also, the passen we've lost the passenger pigeon and Eskimo curlew, but that's only three species out of 350. So that's actually not bad, um, if you think about it that way. There were beavers on Manhattan. Um, this is a, you know, from Audubon. Audubon lived on Manhattan. He made many of these, these pictures from his studio on Manhattan. I like, uh, I like to talk about beavers because they're uh, what we call a landscape species or a, an ecosystem architect, which is to say that they mess things up, you know? <laughs> That, um, you know, beavers, their evolutionary trick is to build dams, right? And why do they do that? You know, they build the dams because it raises the water level and lets them move their food supply, which is logs, over to their lodge, which is in the middle of the pond. So the, the pond is also a moat. It's a defensive structure against wolves and bears and things. And, um, you know, a beaver hears running water, and what do they want to do? They want to build a dam, and they can't really control themselves. They just build the dam. <laughs> so... From the perspective of a fish, uh, you know, if you're a fish that likes a, a fast-moving stream, then you really hate beavers, you know, because they just destroyed your habitat. They just took it away. How mean of them. But if you're a fish that likes ponds, then they're a great thing, right? And um, I think this is a, a way into seeing the way that human beings shape the landscape and shape the maps because we create structures that we build for our, our very own reasons. We can't really help ourselves. Um, but have consequences for all kinds of other species, some of which do better. You can suggest which ones by looking outside, and, um, and some which do worse. Uh, there were wolves on Manhattan, and brown bear, or black bear, elk and deer, whales and porpoises in the harbor. There's actually quite a diverse uh, biodiversity in Manhattan. Sometimes I say that if uh, this country was settled from the west to the east, so that by the time we got to the east, we were thinking, you know, maybe we should just set aside a little bit of something for nature. <laughs> we might have set aside Manhattan Island. And uh, Manahattan National Park would have been the best national park in the whole East Coast to come and visit. Right, okay, so um, to, to, to create these maps and create these images, we had to know the relationships of all the species to each other. And that, that we did through this network diagram we call a mirror web, um, which actually, each one of those little points um, is a different plant or animal or stream type or soil type. And each gray line is a separate habitat connection connecting that species to something else in the network. And uh, using this kind of understanding, which, um, which is kind of new to have this complete of an understanding of a place, um, allows you then to map the distributions of all those species. One of the things that's great about a network is that you can stand, any, any node is the center of the network, if you like. There's no, there's no right view. This is one view, this is another view. Any one of the nodes can be the center of it, the network. In fact, I think that's the way networks work. We're all the center of our own network, and yet we participate in this, this network of, of otherness that we depend on. So then Mark um, took these maps that we generated and created the topography and then laid in the soil and the water and laid on top of that the maps of the different ecosystems, what we call the landscape ecology of the island, and then filled that with little 3D models of the plants and animals. And because it's based on that georeference framework, this isn't just any place. This is Times Square looking west 400 years ago. Right? Um, we can you know, literally take a picture out of any window in Manhattan and reconstruct what that view looked like 400 years ago. Um, and this is the kind of thing we can do with digital media, right? with digital mapping. Um, it's not easy, it's a lot of work, um, as Mark will tell you. <laughs> um, but um, you know, we have such incredible tools to see our world in new ways. Um, this is a view, perhaps, of, of Murray Hill from the East River. I think maybe about where the UN is today. And um, there are 15 different ecosystem types here. And if you look very carefully, there's a sea turtle, and a bald eagle, and a pack of wolves. Um, and they're hard to see, you know, they're hard to imagine, but they were part of Manhattan. You can fly uh, down the Hudson River and sort of see how Manhattan is a place not isolated by itself, but actually connected to a much wider world 
the world of the Hudson River estuary and the Atlantic Ocean and the climate system. And, you know, that's, those are birds on the fall migration. And there's fish under the water that are, that are traveling. That uh, Man Manhattan, as well as Manhattan, depends on these connections to this wider world. Or even imagine that moment of Henry Hudson, right? Maybe this is the next day, you know, and he's at 42nd Street, or what will be 42nd Street, and maybe one of his men shoots a, a musket and a flock of a thousand passenger pigeons flies into the morning light. And, um, you know, Henry Hudson didn't care anything about that. All he wanted to do was go to China, right? That was his entire ambition, and he thought the Hudson River was the way, um, but he was wrong, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, unfortunately for him. And unfortunately, a little bit for us because, um, because Hudson was blind to what was just in front of him, the wealth that was in front of him, which was that mirror web and those relationships. And, you know, trying to remap and reconnect to those relationships is something that's so missing in our world, right? We have, you know, lots of things from China, but, you know, we don't actually have a place like Manahat anymore that has all, all of its parts all interacting strongly with each other. Um, because we've transformed it as we've transformed the world to make it better for us. But it's not over. History uh, doesn't end today. It just begins. And so, you know, the second part of what we've been trying to do is to try and understand how this place came to be, and not just this place, but I realized to understand New York, you had to sort of see it in the context of the whole country and, and look maybe not so far back in time but um, to more recent times, to the, the times of my grandparents and my parents and, and even my generation, um, where we live in a world of cheap natural resources, or what were once cheap natural resources, um, that gave us this huge energetic potential that allowed us to, to transport ourselves in a particular way, which then allowed a certain kind of land use. And that land use has kind of come back to bite us on the butt, I think, um, in terms of the way the suburbs now trap us into driving our cars and leading to economic problems and changing the climate. And the, the way those cars then trap us into a sort of wars and political actions to maintain this cheap oil, right? That we need to think about these relationships that underlie our, our lives and how we, how we do our basic things, how we get around and where we live and the energy that we use. Um, and so in Terra Nova, I tried to figure this out, tried to figure it out for myself first and then try to tell the story in a way that, that everybody can understand. You know, like the story of, of oil, this is, these are all the places in the lower 48 that we've looked for oil and natural gas. All those gray holes are empty boreholes. Those are places we looked and didn't find anything. The, the, the blue colors are places where oil and gas were found. And, and to a geologist, this is a map of ancient seas. Those are the margins of the ancient seas that used to come into the middle of America 100 million years ago. Um, you can see all those ones off, offshore, including the uh, somewhere way right around here. There's the deep water horizon uh, in 2010. You remember that little piece of history? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you know that the Deepwater Horizon, by the way, had a very good name because that was a drilling rig that could go uh, 5,000 feet in the water and then 10,000 feet into the ground underneath. It was really a piece of technology that was working on the horizon in very deep waters. And uh, it's amazing that the economic system can actually um, take on that kind of risk, right? Um, and sometimes those risks go bad, as, we've, as we saw. Um, of course, these oil riches that was America, America was the Saudi Arabia of oil once upon a time. Um, we just we sort of forget that when we tell ourselves our history, and it enabled these automobiles, which started out as electric cars. If you read the early history of automobiles, there's a lot about electric cars versus gas cars, and it wasn't at all inevitable that gas cars were going to win, but they did. Um, and this is the world we live in today. This is the modern American condition. Anybody recognize a picture like this? Anybody ex ever experienced something like this? <laughs> yeah. Um, and what what's, that's also meant is that, you know, for generations, people were moving out of the city, and that had huge consequences for the city. This map on the left is a GIS map where we just tried to figure out where you could build, where you could build in today's world. The uh, light gray areas are places that have all been built already. The dark gray areas are places that are protected. There are parks or reserves. The blue areas are either water or wetlands. The black areas are places that are too steep to build, more than a 15% slope. So the white areas are the places you can build. If you wanted to find a green field, as the developers like to call it, you have to go to the white area on this map. And they're way out, 
their way out. This whole drive to qualify thing that is especially true for young families trying to get started that have to move to, you know, the far side of New Jersey or South Jersey or up into the Hudson River Valley or to Suffolk County in order to be able to find afford a house and then commute back through all the traffic to get to where we are. That's an ad from one of those magazines you get in the one of those newspapers you get in the subway. Stop renting and start owning. Buy now. Right? You can get the um, the heritage or the country home in the Poconos. Low property taxes, four commute, four buses per hour, only 90 minutes to New York City. Um, and as I write in Terra Nova, you can map this onto the economic system. And uh, this is a graph of gasoline prices, housing prices, consumer prices, and the monetary base, the amount of money, the amount of US dollars in the world um, between 1950 and 2010. Up until 1971, the U.S. government, through various mechanisms, was um, setting quotas for oil that, that kept the price low and stable. And uh, after 1971, uh, American oil peaked, and they weren't able to do that anymore. And so they opened up the taps, and uh, this is what we've had since then. Um, and I just think about like the last 15, 16 years I've been in New York, and think about you know the huge historical. Um, Terrible things have happened. Historical disturbances have happened to us. 9-11, you know, the protests over the Iraq war, right? The financial collapse, Occupy Wall Street, Hurricane Sandy. And these are all treated in the popular media um, as separate events that have separate roots and that we need to address separately. But I think uh, what historians will say someday is that they're all manifestations of the same underlying problem, um, which has a solution. It's... Um, apparently not a politically tenable solution, but it has a solution, um, which is to, you know, actually appreciate the value of natural resources that come into the economy um, in a way that helps us make better towns and cities, in a way that helps us have, sorry, it's hard to read, uh, better transport, in a way that helps us um, actually move to that renewable energy generation uh, world that even the oil companies know we're getting to. They just want it to be in 2050, um, whereas we should all want it to be yesterday. Um, and if we did this, we would make a lot of money for the people alive today in a way that then would support um, the system and a, a positive feedback that would lead us in positive ways. So um, this is all, in my sense, a kind of mapping, sort of trying to map this information onto the world in a way that people can see and understand and therefore take action on. Um, and at the end of Manahata, I tried to bring some of these ideas together by taking pictures of the city today and then making visions of what the future could look like, the putatively 400 years from now, 2409, right? Henry Hudson comes in 1609. The book comes out in 2009, the quadricentennial of, of Hudson. What's 2409 going to look like? Can we stretch our minds to, to think that far ahead? And uh, I don't know, I kind of like streetcars. How about streetcars instead of cars? Um, I like streams instead of storm drains to move our water around. I don't have anything against London plane trees and Madison Square Park, but why not have real forest, right? Real forest is kind of cool. Um, and we have beautiful native trees and shrubs, um, oaks. So, you know, but trying to imagine a future for me that, that includes people, includes architecture, but includes some awareness of the environment that we live in. Not that we can, you know, not the presumption that we can control everything about it, but actually accepting and celebrating the things that we can, we can include in our world. You know, the Upper East Side covered with green roofs and maybe a stream coming out of the reservoir and around the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and, um, and through the East Side. Or even more... ...functional, beautiful, economically productive, creative cities connected perhaps by light rails and streetcars that were surrounded in a mosaic of, of farmland and, and natural restored areas so that you could, you know, be a banker, you could go to see the Yankee game, and you could be, you can know the person who grew your food, right? And not because they drove 100 miles into the green market in the city, but because they walked <laughs> um, from your street. So those are all, I mean, those are all visions, and we can talk about whether that's realistic or not and whether that kind of mapping is helpful or not. Um, but it seemed to me that, um, A, I mean, I don't know that that's better. I mean, there's ways of trying to measure that. And B, I think everybody should have a way to say what they think the future should be. And that's where this Manahata 2409 project comes from. Um, to try and um, give people... 
<laughs> give people mechanisms so they can see how the ecology of the city, um, how, what its sort of uh, fundamentals are, and how it can be built into the city going forward. Um, you know, the point of Manahata and all this work isn't to go back to the forest and to undo the city. In fact, it's trying to build elements of the forest into the city, if you like. Um, one thing we can say about Manahata is it was in that form for several thousand years before Henry Hudson showed up. Not, you know, fixed and unchanging, but changing in a way that it could accommodate disturbances, can accommodate hurricanes and fires and floods, but in a way that allowed all the plants and animals, including people, to live there for a long time. So, if we love that, and we love this other thing on the right, the city, which I do, then I want it to last that same way. You know, I want it to be able to accommodate the ecological play, which is disturbances. I want it to respond to its physical factors. And I want it to support the, the habitats for all the people that live here. But I don't think in its current form it's sustainable, right? And the sort of Terra Nova discussion really convinces me that this is not a sustainable form for the city. Does anybody think that a thousand years from now, Manhattan will still look like what we see there on the right? Raise your hand. <laughs> I mean, that would be kind of an anti-historical idea, right? To think it would not change at all. And yet we live in a world that um, is just about keeping it that way, maybe adding a new skyscraper or two. So, and that's because I think we, we don't see the network. We don't see where we are in the network, right? That's the Lenape node, by the way. That's, that's the human network. Um, and of course, if we were to zoom into that node, what would we see but this other complex social network, right? Which is where most of us live all of our lives, um, is our relationships to our friends and our family and our colleagues. Um, you know, I think for human beings, because we're such social animals, that sociality sort of, um, completely captures our vision. And it's only rarely that we get glimpses of this larger, larger world. But if we don't remember and don't take into account this larger world, then we'll make, make mistakes. So Manahata 2409 allows you to understand how the ecosystems of the city have changed, where buildings are ecosystems and streets are ecosystems and parks are ecosystems. To um, ecosystems are the combination of non-living environment and living things. So you can change the ecosystems. You can change the lifestyles of the people living in the city. It turns out that as people move to the city, their per capita resource use seems to go down. That's what the, the current evidence seems to suggest. These are three, three graphs. Excuse me for showing quantitative data. I hope that's OK. <laughs> um, so these are three bar graphs. That's average, average American uh, per capita water consumption per day on the, on the top. So average American and average New Yorkers. Water consumption, electricity consumption, and waste generation. And this is per person, not total. So, and on a per person basis, the average New Yorker uses 74% less water per day than the average American. Uses 35% less energy, electricity, and generates 45% less garbage. It's not to say that we don't use a lot of electricity, water, and make a lot of garbage, as you can tell by walking down the street, right? But that's because there's so many of us. And if this is true, and if the whole world is urbanizing, which it seems to be, then this is actually a way to lower our take on the environment while still having the things that we love so much, our social networks and our economy and our art and our culture and um, even our science, right? Um, so cities, lifestyle is a very important part of the way we interact with the environment, and urbanization seems to be a big part of that. And then finally, of course, you know, we can't talk about the 21st century without remembering that the climate is changing. Um, this is a satellite image of Hurricane Sandy. Um, just, to, just to remind you that it was a very, very big storm. It's a very, very big deal. The other thing to say about Hurricane Sandy is it was first detected eight days before it hit New Jersey. So it was a, trop a named tropical storm in the Caribbean eight days. So that was how long we had, eight days. And that was the second most damaging storm in U.S. history. Um, and, you know, the predictions are we're probably going to get more of the same or more of the worse, if you like. Um, they, these are from the New York City Panel on Climate Change, uh, showing warmer temperatures over the next, uh, next 100 years, higher precipitation, increasing sea level rise. This, in, this is the 2009 report, which sort of equivocated on how much sea level rise we might get. The city is now planning for at least 31 inches of sea level rise, two and a half feet. Um, so Manahata 2409 allows you to manipulate these factors and make your own map, your own map of what you want the future to look like, to change the ecosystem, to change the lifestyle, and to change the climate, 
and then see how that would change the environmental performance of the, of the city in terms of the water cycle, the carbon cycle, biodiversity, and population. And then to compare your vision to the way that part of the city works today and the way it used to work 400 years ago. Yeah, to provide you some context for understanding the changes in environmental performance um, in the past and in the future. So you can go to the website, manahata2409.org. This is the third book that you're all helping me write. Um, you can make an account and set up a vision. You give it a name, you can call it what you like. Um, you can give it a year. You don't have to imagine 2409. You can imagine next year if you like, or 10 years, or 50 years. It's actually a fascinating question. What do we plan for? What are we thinking of as the future? You can write a little description of your idea of the city, and then you can either choose to start with the ecosystems of Manahata 400 years ago, or the ecosystems of the city today. It comes to a web map like this that allows you to, to zoom in, and there's a tool, it's the Vision Extent tool, it's that one with the little gold box, it allows you to pick an area of the city that you want to work on, at least one block, but it can be several blocks, it can be your neighborhood, it can be, you know, it can be all of Manhattan if you want. And then it fills that vision extent with a representation of the ecosystems that are there today. That's what these little squares are. The purple and um, pink ones are buildings. The orange and yellow ones are transportation types, sidewalks and streets and so forth. Um, there's dots for the subway underneath, uh, underneath Broadway there. You can see those ecosystems in the context of the whole city today. There's a little, as John was showing, there's a little slider bar over here, so you can turn them on and off. You can also see them in the context of the ecosystems that were in that place 400 years ago, um, where greens are forests and different wetlands and stream types. And then over here on the right are a series of tools to paint ecosystems, kind of like Photoshop, but, but now you're, you're painting ecosystems that are described with a set of parameters. Um, that allow you to measure their environmental performance. So buildings and um, natural kinds of ecosystems, uh, different transportation types and modes, um, different sets of utilities and modifiers, green roofs, streetcars, cisterns, you know, all the things that come out of the, the current dialectic about sustainable cities and green architecture. And then once you've created your vision, and if we have a little time later, I can demonstrate it for you, but after you've created your vision, then you say, um, oh, sorry, you choose the lifestyle of the people living in the city. Uh, we, have, we have five lifestyles. We have average New Yorker, uh, average American, average Earthling, a Lenape person, and this thing we call an eco-hipster. <laughs> so I'm sure all of you are eco-hipsters. Yeah, eco-hipsters are people that live in the city, and they, delib they make deliberate choices to reduce their resource consumption by riding their bike and using public transportation when they can and choosing to get their energy from renewable sources, which we all can do. Um, doing these sorts of things that, um, that are the lifestyle sorts of choices we can make, both, both individually and as a society. And then you can choose the climate. Are you going to plan for the climate as it is today? Or do you think we should plan, plan for the climate in 2020 or in 2050 or 2080? It's up to you. You can choose different precipitation events, you know, a hurricane or a rainstorm. And then it actually gives you metrics, it maps metrics of the water cycle, the carbon cycle, biodiversity, and population. So in those gold lines, that's your vision. That brown line you see over there on the far right, that's um, for like the stormwater one at the top, the blue one. That's your, that area of the city as it performs today. And then over here on the, on the left for the stormwater one, that green line is the performance of that area when it was a forest 400 years ago, the historic ecosystems. So it actually gives you a context to sort of think, right? If you read Plan NYC, most of the sustainability things are like, you know, let's do 17% better than we are today by 2020, right? Why 17%? Nobody knows. <laughs> right? Nobody's saying that that's sustainable. They're saying, well, that's better than we are today, and that seems doable given what we have to do. Right? Somebody's judgment about what's possible. This is a way to, to have all kinds of conversations about what's possible and what's not, what's realistic and what's not, what's radical and what's not. Um, you can see a flow diagram and a statistical breakdown of, of, of your vision. Um, I'll skip. And then most importantly, when you're done, you can, you can click a button and make your vision public. So you can share it. 
And of course, this is the great thing, and I think you know we saw it in, in the two previous presentations as well, that these digital mapping tools allow you to use the internet to connect to people with maps in a very broad-based way, in a very democratic, democratic kind of way. Um, you know, map making's often been, you know, the province of experts and, and governments and so forth. But now, using these tools, it's something that we can all participate in. Um, and we can comment and discuss and, and therefore create um, a better vision for the city. So, um, I have a couple visions to show, but maybe I should stop here because I know we have a discussion to follow. So, so thank you very much. And I guess I should use the microphone to remind folks, because there don't, do seem to be people out there on the live cast that they can use Twitter to send questions for the panel. And I'll try to field them as best I can. Um, and there's one other thing I wanted to remark. In addition to my mangling, my um, Lenape pronunciation, I also forgot to thank Mark LeBlanc, uh, who's really the most important person to thank, um, uh, who has really uh, been a sort of masterful uh, figure in, in planning and putting together this symposium. And so I uh, want to make sure he gets uh, recognition. No. See Mark here. But again, my thanks to him. And maybe it's the end of the day. But with that, floor is open. Um, we've been talking and we'll talk some more, I suspect. But um, we wonder about comments or questions. Yeah. Um, thank you all for your really interesting paper and very different I can't believe they couldn't be any more different, really, could they? <laughs> <laughs> and um, Dr. Sanderson, you said uh, something that really struck me, and I'm, I'm not quite sure yet how I want to frame this question, but you said, any node is at the center of a network. And thinking about information and network information as these nodes, I wonder if each one of you could really talk about how that, that idea of a network and seeing information in a network changes the perspective of the kind of stories that we Historically, or um, you guys want to start? Sure. You were the first Nicholas, maybe. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, um, you know, there's a there's a history, of course, in ecology of thinking about the world in a, in a networked way um, that has really important parallels in in the social sciences and, and economic sciences and so forth, and provides these kind of tools you're seeing for mapping the networks. Um, and I I really think that that's one of the big ideas that our time is contributing to the future. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's what Facebook makes its money on, right? Is it knows the pattern of how you all are friends with each other, right? Mm -hmm. It makes billions of dollars. That's also what Google knows about the world, right? Is how the internet is connected together. And that's what allows those rapid searches, is by having that sort of network perspective. Um, so I think that that idea is really, really important to us. And, it, and for me, it helps um, resolve some of these things I used to really struggle with about, you know, how each of us have our own perspective on the world that we see. And how do we, you know, how do we get out of that, or can we get out of that, right? And for me, these network representations are a, are a way to sort of do that. That I can sort of pick any one of the nodes. I can pick the wolf, or I can pick a Lenape person, or I can pick a, you know, a, a gray alder, and I can see what's important to them, and then I can zoom out and reconfigure the whole network from that perspective. So I think that's, I think it's very cool, and um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean. Network analysis, I think, is one of the sort of three big digital humanities tools we have. You know, we're talking about one of them today, which is mapping. Um, without any literary critics in the room, we're unlikely to talk about text mining and data mining, which is one of the other ones. So <laughs> maybe we do have a few. Um, and, and I think often that in the humanities, that overshadows the others. And then the third is network analysis. And I think, in fact, it's still... Um, it's still the smallest one 
of those in the way, in the extent to which it's been embraced by humanity scholars. You know, there are a couple of very prominent um, network analysis projects, the um, Republic of Letters mm. project mm. that maps and light the correspondence is probably the one most people uh, are likely to be familiar with, and that interestingly is network analysis over mapping, in ways mm. that are yeah. kind of tricky. Um, I think it is going to be one of the powerful tools we look at. Um, that notion of any node as the centre, I think, is a powerful one to hold on to, because in most cases, when you're presented with network analysis, you're presented with static images, and any node is not the centre. A particular node has been chosen to be the centre for you when you look at that visualisation, and I think that that can be quite problematic in terms yeah. of how we interpret them. And in fact, it goes to one of the real challenges of these kinds of visualisations that, that, that I'm talking about. They're not... You know, one of the things I guess that appeals to me about Digital Harlem is that at some level the kinds of maps that you can produce there are relatively easy to interpret. Something like the network analysis that we took there before is not straightforwardly easy to interpret. Uh, and I think that, mm. that we need to be a little bit more aware of what visualisation gives us and doesn't give us. And I think at the moment a lot of the complex network analyses that people generate they often look really cool and they produce, you know, aesthetically some quite attractive kind of things. For the life of me, I don't know what most of them are actually saying. And I think that that, you know, there's a, if you like, a digital literacy question there. There is a reminder that a lot of what is going on in the production of that analysis is an algorithm at work and about our need to actually understand that algorithm and what's going into those kinds of documentations. So I think it has real possibilities for us, but I think it's a tool that for humani as humanity scholars we don't understand well. Um, and it is in some ways one of the more mathematical kinds of, you know, they're all mathematical tools, they're all computational tools, but it's the one where that is closest to the surface and more in some ways difficult to make sense of going forward. So I think there are real possibilities there. Everything we do in humanities is about relationships and networks and visualising those I think can be really powerful. But the net, the straight up network analysis one of that, I think we're still trying to work out what that means and I and I think more so than most of the digital humanities tools we produce, what we produce, what's being produced when we do that is not immediately intelligible to people in various ways. And Republic of Letters I think is in some ways, we understand correspondence moving around, we understand it on a map, but there there are in fact a whole lot of kind of holes in that 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 visualization masks. Mm. So there are, you know, and the people involved in that project will tell you that, you know, there is an enormous amount of data missing from that. You know, there's a lot of messy data that doesn't get mapped. It's, it's presented in a certain kind of way that makes some things obvious and hides other things. And and I think we've got to learn a lot more about those if we're going to really take advantage of that tool. But it's absolutely one of the tools that you know those one of that tripartite set of digital humanities tools that I think we've got that can give us a completely different perspective and force us to confront as you know as far as you know without even being able to understand that mirror. Muir diagram, we can see interconnectedness. What it's telling us beyond that, I think, is the next thing that we have to start thinking about. I was just reflecting on what a great question you asked because it's, uh, you know, possible to take three very different presentations and ask one question and have three <laughs> engaged people respond. And in the spirit of those three very different um, presentations, my, my answer will be uh, pretty different too. And, and kind of through the lens of that short presentation on hypercities, I was referring um, at one point briefly to, you know, television networks and the fact that media presentation through the 1960s and 70s model um, was very one way and corporate. And so for, for me as an art and architectural historian talking with students about <laughs> digital mapping um, and digital cultural mapping, um, as I again alluded to in the presentation the 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 key difference I want my students to understand as they um, you know surf Facebook on their phone while I'm trying to lecture <laughs> is that that they are creators of media now and each of us has the power to you know be our own channel um, to, to ha whether it's a YouTube channel literally or if if it's a hypercities project which uh, is in a way a kind of format for the endless augmentation and annotation of maps. At one of the Hypercities conferences at UCLA, the, one of the persons in the audience raised the point that it's sort of Talmudic, that you are generating endless commentary and modification. But the difference, the key difference being that whereas a lot of, you know, um, 
British generals or U.S. or state governments were producing maps with expert cartographers, now is an, an unprecedented age of possibility for the democratization of the knowledge around the digital cultural mapping uh, that we're trying to teach. So for me, that, that network question is so interesting. You're, you know, and to quote you, you said, any node is at the center of its own network, and you're paraphrasing Eric. And um, so I guess I'm trying to teach critical thinking and critical media literacy skills within the context of the media generation that we are now uniquely capable of. But I, and I, but I get that if you want to take that back to mapping, I think that is the, the, one of the true and most obvious powers of the digital mapping tools that we've got. You know, we were, and Google Earth makes you very aware of us because it kind of makes you sort of seasick. But you can go, you can move, you can change scale in a way that has always been, you know, you've had to choose your scale as a scholar often. Um, mm -hmm. But there's an enormous fluidity to scale that is another way of thinking about networks and relationships that I think is enormously powerful. So you can go from the neighbourhood, which is the typical way of you know, looking at a part of a city, and a map can zoom you right down to the micro level and you can find the individuals, mm -hmm. um, as, as Eric was talking about. And I think that kind of sense of a spatial location and, and being able to change your perspective on that, every node is at the centre, but you can go out and you can see those relationships in a much more fluid way that I think has some, has some real impacts for how we think about our projects and, 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 and that question of scale, which has often been a, a static thing right. across a whole range of fields. There's also, you know, in, in the sciences, we, we build models. I mean, there's a very mm -hmm. literal connection between the mirror web representation mm -hmm. and, and the, the 1,600 layers that describe Mauna mm -hmm. um, So that, you know, if, say we, say we discover a new stream on Manhattan, we could add that in and then press a button and then a series of models would rerun the whole ecosystem and generate a new map for every, every element in the node that then, you know, could ultimately feed into the, the visualizations like Mark was working on. So, um, and in, in, in my world, that, that, kind of, that kind of quantitative modeling is a very, not just quantitative, but modeling in general is a very important way that science moves forward, you know, because it expresses a set of hypotheses that generates a set of data that then you can verify against other sets of data to see how well your model fits. And if it doesn't fit, then, then you know, it forces you to go back and question your model assumptions, right? And be very explicit about all that stuff. Can I ask a follow-up of Eric? Uh, what's the what are the early, um, Results from the website uh, have have you had a lot of people creating? Yeah, so it, it's really interesting actually. We it's been up for about two months, mm -hmm. and um, we've had about eight thousand users, of which about um, about four hundred have, have made accounts. So there's a lot more people browsing it than actually making accounts, mm -hmm. and most of the people that make accounts try and make a vision, but only about ten percent of those people make their vision public in the end. <laughs> so that's um, crowdsourcing. Diminishing yeah. percentages. That's right. That's right. A lot of people look. Some people dabble. A very, very small portion of them do what you all yeah. would like them to do. Every crowdsourcing project will, will show you that same grade. Are you also um, giving people the opportunity to create a a name that's a username that's not their real name? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, we don't have any control over their name. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So they can create whatever name they want. And then you can log on anonymously or as a username and also um, discuss other people's visions. And then you can also copy their vision. So you can compare their vision to your vision. You can also copy it into your workspace and then modify it from there. Great. Yeah. Thanks. But, but yeah, we, we, we're still working out that, like, we want, you know, I, I would. So in, um, and I'm just trying to sort that out. So if we have ideas in the, in the hmm. group, I would love to hear them. hear them later. Yeah, and I think later on I'd love to ask a little bit more about sort of pitfalls. I think we sort of nibbled a bit around the edges of that question about, especially for humanists, in terms of the, the promise, which is obviously so great of, of uh, geospatial work, but also the sort of pitfalls. Um, but I want to make sure some other folks get questions. Mapping technology. 
technologies in terms of changing how we actually think about urban space and you know thinking about this very seductive power of the map to somehow render urban space completely knowable or containable or controllable. So I'm wondering, I guess, about um, sort of that issue and about the limitations of some of these kinds of technologies and, and what they also obscure. Um, so I wondered if you, if you guys had some responses. Yeah, look, I'm happy to take that up. I, I think that no one who works with these tools mm. th thinks that they have any kind of totalising ability to do it. You're constantly confronting the things that you don't know, the data that you wished you had, the holes in what you do. Um, and I think in that sense they're no different from any kind of scholarly work we produce. If people engage with them properly, they recognise their limitations. If they skim them, then they can distort what you're doing. Um, and, and I think that in some ways... That's one of those areas where I think that we can get carried away with the idea that there is something just different about doing this digitally. I think it has all of it, you know, tech, you know, arguments made on the page can have the same ability to be misunderstood and the gaps in them to be passed over. So on the one hand, I'd say, yes, um, that's a worry, and it's a worry in anything that I write mm -hmm. as well, um, in terms of the fact that people can choose not to recognise the ways in which you're limiting things or not limiting things. I think also the other part of that is is that recognition that people want to gloss over that none of these meth the digital components of these analyses stand on their own, you know, and it's something I try to make more and more pronounced in the way that I talk about this now. You know, the, these maps are suggestive. They are, pose questions, they don't offer answers, and, and the analysis that comes out of them, and, and certainly in my work, involves going back and doing the kinds of close reading that we we, we traditionally do, so that they're part of what we do. I think, um, I, again, I think it's something about how people choose to engage with them, whether they want to see them as standing on their own or not, but I think in the end they represent a tool, like a, a whole range of other tools that we've got. They're the tool of our generation and they're surrounded by rhetoric that wants to make them something more that they are, but I, I think you'll find that most of that rhetoric doesn't come from the people who actually use the tools. Uh, it comes from the people who want to tell a more simplified story about them. So anything that I've learnt from Digital Harlem is learnt from the maps and then from reading the sources that the maps raise questions about. Um, and in that sense, they're not, you know, it's, it's not providing anything straightforward and totalising, and it's full of holes. Um, you know, I know that for Shane, coming out of the 19th century, we were drowning in material in the 1920s, but, you know, that drowning amount of material is a drop of the material we would like to know. To, um, and I think maybe sometimes people confuse mapping with augmented reality or virtual mm. reality or second life or something else where you somehow yeah. can immerse yourself in the environment. If you try to immerse yourself in digital Harlem, there would be lots of holes <laughs> everywhere that you turn because we have, it's still a fragments of the analysis. So it's a different perspective on the material that works in conjunction with other things. And I think we just have to guard against people wanting to turn it into something else, but the practitioners are not the people saying that it represents something else. So it's as seductive as anything else, I think, when it comes down to it. We're always being seduced by our tools historically. The digital is not a unique case. But it is interesting to think that among the different terms all of us used, um, uh, or could have used, we've talked about visualizations, uh, we've talked about um, uh, spa you know, mapping for as a sort of a presentational platform, as well as a sort of research tool. So one can understand the sort of slippage uh, between, because those are very different means. Some of them are interactive, user interactive, others are, are not the presentational model. Visualizations can come off of the spatial, but are not necessarily built out of. So, Well, and at this point, they should all be interactive, and that yeah, in some yeah. ways is the other kind of check. You know, you can go to Digital Harlem, and you can actually pull up any map that I pull up, and you can look at every individual item that's on it and decide what you make of it in a way that would not have been possible if that was a present, you know, you can't do that on the screen, but you can go away and do it, and that way mm. these tools are often open to a far right. deeper right. interrogation yeah. um, than the kinds um, of tools that they're often being juxtaposed against. Um, and I think anybody who presents you in this day and age with a static image and says, this is, this is my map, you should immediately yeah. stick up your red flag on that and say, if I can't interrogate that data, why? Um, um, just a quick comment yeah, no, no. as well. I think what you saw in these three platforms is really very different ideas, but they're all related to the idea of, of maps 
enhancing storytelling capabilities. And something I really admire about Eric's new website is the predictive nature of the storytelling. It's not just the analysis of the past, but then how can we actually apply some of those lessons to, to experiment with what the future might look like. Um, and I, I don't see them necessarily as totalizing. They, they certainly are seductive, but I don't see them as an attempt um, by their creators to totalize, but rather to empower. But that just might be my idealistic humanist bias. Um, Dan, do uh, Thank you for the presentations. I, I, I want to follow up on storytelling, John, because as I listen to the three presentations, they're actually quite different in that I would say that, that, the, that the second, the, the um, Stevens and, um, I'm sorry. Eric, Eric, Eric. are These are classic narratives that are actually quite familiar. This is the ecologist narrative of diversity and, and, and change that existed before the mapping and the digital world. The story that, that Stephen is telling is, again, a story that's familiar. The, this is about power, it's about race, it's about urban space, and as Stephen just said, this is not the end, the end of the story. And I know that in John's presentation, we spent m more time um, floating around with the technology and less time on your student stories, and you've evoked storytelling just now. but. I think that there's a, actually um, there's a sense about authorship where often the digital is saying, oh, well, we'll let other people tell their stories. And I think that's part of the democratic impulse. It's what gets funded for us to be able to say that. But, but it's hard to deny that, that, at least in the second and third, there's a very familiar narrative there that's powerfully told because of the tools that you're harnessing. And in the first presentation, I was less certain what the story was. Do architectural historians not have a story that they care to tell that really is, is contending with vital, moral, um, ecological, political um, uh, forces that, that we, you know, it's sort of like, we're rolling out this technology and we say, well, we'll let fig people figure out what that is. And I was less certain, John, in your presentation, what, what if, you know, what, what is the story there? What is the willingness to, to say, I have this tool and there's something vital that I think I ought to be under, uncovering, which was less the case again in the second and third presentation. Great question and, and a great set of observations. Um, yeah, I think, you know, back when I taught in a school of architecture, uh, actually in a department of architectural history, um, the kind of question you're asking would be one that would put direct pressure on the disciplinary, you know, obligation to take my architectural history master students and mold them into the next generation of architectural historians. Um, but now I'm teaching at CUNY and at Baruch College in a Department of Fine and Performing Arts uh, and the Macaulay Honors College with a diverse group of students, uh, many of whom have no idea what they're going to be majoring in. Um, just to give you an example, in 2008-9, when I first was, uh, you know, wading into the deep end of the pool of digital media, I actually gave my students a final project which was uh, entitled, um, you know, write a uh, do a hypercities multimedia presentation, and it's got to be a biographical history of your neighborhood, right? That that's where I was at. I wasn't about imparting some grand sweep of architectural historical developments. It was really I was learning as much about these tools as my students um, and wading into that mapping exercise. Now. Nowadays, I'd be way too nervous to um, ask the students to identify their house on a map, you know. And, and even at the time, I was like, just make it your block. You know, we don't, we don't need pictures of the front door or whatever. Um, but the fact of some of these imaginative authors riding a bicycle with a helmet video cam, you know, and narrating, like, that's my grammar school. That's where I had my first job. 
and then embedding that video in the map of their neighborhood alongside the pictures and the writing and the stuff. It was just kind of a fundamentally new authorship process that I was investigating as opposed to um, the, the scenario that you described. Um, I'll, I'll just say, yeah. I, I do have a story and I was explicit about it. <laughs> Digital Harlem is in Digital Harlem. You can search it, you can pull it up. You can't export it out of that. We've, um, and there's no reason for that other than the fact that we didn't build the capability. And it's very, very messy data, and I think it probably in some ways wouldn't be worth anybody's time to export. I, I believe in open data. That the, the Digital Harlem is not a ar digital archive in the sense mm. that the data that you would get is a, a lot of spatial data, but not the documents themselves, because of a range of issues that we don't talk about enough when we talk about sharing data, and that is about rights. So the legal records reside in municipal mm. archives. Um, they're not protected in any way. We could conceivably share them. The archives is not overly keen for us to do it. We didn't take archival standard images. We took research standard images, so they would be of limited use to people. It's not machine readable. Most of them are handwritten forms that wouldn't OCR anyway. Um, and so that would be messy, but in the end, the archive didn't want us to share it. Um, the newspapers are still copyrighted. As I said, they weren't digitized when we used them. Um, they are now digitised, but Amsterdam News is part of the ProQuest Historical Newspapers Collection, which I'd be gobsmacked if more than a handful of people in the room have access to. It's one of the most expensive um, databases that exists, and why most academic libraries will subscribe to some of them, very few subscribe to all of them. Um, and I think that that is a real challenge for us. We've basically sold a big chunk of our cultural heritage at ProQuest, and they're now selling it back to us at a prohibitive price. Mm -hmm. Um, the other news, New York Age is actually in a new newspaper digitisation site called newspapers.com, which is owned by ancestry.com. That took me hmm. about half an hour to work that out because the site doesn't make that overly clear. Um, and whatever you think of ancestry.com, because it's their site, you can buy an individual hmm. subscription to that collection that you cannot to ProQuest because they won't sell you an individual subscription. They did once, I once had access to ProQuest through the Baseball Historical Society that Roy <laughs> put me onto, and then ProQuest decided that business model didn't work for them and they shut down all of those kinds of subscriptions. Um, that material is digitised. The digitisations they do are probably high quality, but one of the other things ProQuest won't do is tell you what their OCR accuracy rate is. So all of you using ProQuest historical newspapers should know that you actually have no idea what you're getting out of that search because ProQuest won't tell you whether it's 95%, 97%, 98% accurate, which will affect all of your search results. Um, neither will Ancestry tell you how accurate their newspaper is. Um, we should be able to mine that material in all kinds of ways. They won't. Um, and one of the things we need to be asking those places to do more and more is give us APIs. If somebody wants an API to Digital Harlem, they're welcome to it if they could work out how the hell we would build it out of the gerrymandered, very old database that exists. But the data that you see there, you can mine all the way down to what it was. I think anybody doing that work, doing work does in fact these days make it available if they actually are able to do. And I think the, the, the wrinkle we face is, particularly as humanities scholars, the material that we want to use is not is not open access, um, and where you know digital newspapers are and should even be far more than they are crucial sources for most humanity scholars. But we're not, with the exception of Chronicling America, using databases mm. we can use. So, so digital Harlem's available. It would be more available if anybody wanted it. I don't know that it would be worth the effort. I really wish the database was better, but it was built in making all of the mistakes that make people make in these early kinds of projects. Um, yeah, and let me jump so, in, yeah. Stephen, and, and because there was actually a question someone asked out there. Um, Dave Ball, um, it was a HyperCities question, actually, John, about does HyperCities allow others to use, manipulate, populate 
the platform with their own waypoints. And I guess the other question would be, uh, and pull in, I would add to that, pull in their own maps and so geo reference. Great question. Um, so the map infrastructure that I was showing, um, the 40 maps of New York City covering 400 years of history, all had to be individually processed through the ArcGIS software that is what positions it accurately on top of the Google Maps API, which is all a long way of saying, no, you can't add your own maps. Yes, you can make a request for um, adding a map to HyperCities. The problem is the ArcGIS processing. However, it can be done, and there's an application form right at that um, entry point of HyperCities.com um, under getting involved. You, you go there and find the tab for add a map to HyperCities, and you will explain who, who are you. Are you a student or are you a researcher? What's it in connection with? And they can add it through that process. Can I just say, I think, yeah, I think, um, I think um, Matt Knudsen at the public and overseas is also importable as overlays into hypercities with the KML file connection. So, but that will be kind of a map that's hovering over your um, collection. It's not incorporated into the infrastructure in the way I described earlier. Yeah. Um, and to your earlier question, like we shared the Monohot stuff with John for hypercities, and you can download shape files a lot of the Monohot data from our from our website, and we're in the process of extending the project to the rest of the city. That's the Wailikia project. And we'll do the same thing there. There's already um, sort of preliminary projects for Newtown Creek, if you're interested, and, and the West Bronx that are up on our site. So uh, I was thinking of a, a couple of terms, that, uh, kind of phrases that we use here as we, we teach students. And one is that I think native. Well, we find that most are digitally naive. Um, and uh, the second was uh, one of the first classes I sat in with David in this whole project a long time ago was, and I heard all the students reminding me that all maps are lives, right? And that this is a, a general issue with most visualizations, and yep. you were touching on that, um, is that no matter how much we don't want them to be, sometimes they become these totalizing objects when people come into them without a lot of um, background understanding of what the project is. And so I think there's a a confluence of the tools of both being able to create these things and then also being able to share them rapidly and easily. And I was wondering if within your projects you've taken steps to create pedagogical systems to mm -hmm. enable people to learn how to better read these maps rather than coming with the assumption that, oh, people are going to come, they're going to know the differences that I see in the map. I mean, I don't, is there anybody who still talks about digital natives? I mean, I think that, 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 that Anybody who's ever taught us students in this generation knows that they are only digital natives as consumers of material. They're not digital natives in being terms of located. So I think everybody teaching this is, you know, I, I think it's a media term that people like to throw around, but I think everybody knows that the, you know, what that was meant to say is wrong. Um, Context is the big one of the big problems that we face with Digital Harlem, and it was built as a research tool, and, that what, and that's how it operates, and, and it's difficult on the site itself to do context. What we created, and it flashed by on those slides, was a blog that exists alongside mm. it, where we basically told the story of some of the maps we did, you know, maps that produce questions, we provided answers. And so there's a whole, you know, I think... <coughs> several dozen more than that perhaps posts mm. that are exactly mm. about reading maps and the other kinds of material you need to do to make sense of them. One of the problems with the way we build it is that it's not integrated into the site and I would love to get the opportunity mm. to reintegrate it and redesign it. I think both because our primary thought audience was ourselves and because um, I conceived the digital part of that project at a moment where people were really talking about the need not to overstructure digital things so that you know people could find their own ways through them um, and that if you didn't you know if you put too much scaffolding in you were actually foreclosing opportunities mm. for people mm. to explore them themselves I think that we went way too far with that I think the reality is that most people 
cannot, in fact, make sense of most of the things on their own. I think it's one of the biggest problems with the notion of a digital archive is that we are democratising access to a amount of the material that people have no idea what it actually is or how to make sense of it. And so that scaffolding any kind of digital material you're putting on in some way, I think, is absolutely integral um, to what we do. And, and there are some projects that do that well, but I think there are, in fact, too many projects who to still to succumb to somehow the sense that the purest form is to let people make sense of it themselves. That's not what we do. I don't think it's what anybody does. There's got to be some kind of scaffolding and context to anything you put online if people are going to be able to make their own sense of it, because nobody comes to anything raw we don't come to it raw so my you know we've tried to do that through the blog um, that you can link to through the site I think the reality is that it doesn't work always people can come both ways and I think the interesting thing is that most people don't go from the blog to the map they will take our packaged account of what it does and then they won't go and do their own exploration um, and that again that's partly a design issue because when you get to the site itself it's very hard to make sense of it. Um, and it's one of my ongoing frustrations that most of the visitors we get to the blog are there asking that question that we all know comes straight out of classrooms. What was it like to live in Harlem no. in the 1920s? That's the Harlem Renaissance class question. And Digital Harlem actually would allow people to answer no. that in a far, far richer mm. way than anything else they find. But we built it in a way that makes it almost impossible for them to come raw to the site and work out how it answers okay, that question great. for them. Great. Yes. Um, I'm curious about if you could elaborate more on the role of New York's public transportation system in the maps you're all creating and how the evolution of that changed things um, and how the mapping that system has evolved, like um, the Vanelli map of the 1970s that was more abstract and geometric, but people preferred a more literal geographic one. And Eric, I especially thought it was interesting you mentioned streetcars when New York had above ground rail systems and has phased them out thinking they're impractical. So how would that fit into the future of yeah. New York again? Wait, well, you know, people people often have the mistaken impression that Manhattan's population was, you know, zero once upon a time and then just like went like this. <laughs> but in fact, you know, the highest population in Manhattan was in nineteen ten when there were two point two million people living on Manhattan. Um, and then you see a, a decrease that's associated mm. with the streetcar suburbs. And, and the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn's population is really going up. And then you see another decrease that's associated with the automobile suburbs um, and people moving out of town. Um, and it's only in really, really the last 30 years that the kind of New York renaissance that we're experiencing, that we're all living part of, is part of this, you know, people actually coming back to the city or the net flows being into the city as opposed to out of the city, as opposed to transportation. So when people say, you know, streetcars are impractical, et cetera, et cetera, and I write a lot about this in Terra Nova, I say, well, you know, in 1910, that's how everybody got around, mm -hmm. right? <coughs> when there was 600,000 more people in Manhattan, you used to be able to stand at 34th and 5th Avenue and 573 streetcars would go by in a day. So that's right. this, this <laughs> idea of, you know, frequency is freedom, which some of the transit writers mm -hmm. talk about, right? You know, people say, I don't want to take the bus or the streetcar because it's going to take too long. But if, if you can, mm -hmm. there's a picture in Manahata where you can look up Broadway, you can see every block, there's a different streetcar. Mm -hmm. And if it's like that, you know, you could stand out here on 86th Street and you just have to wait two minutes, then you don't really, you know, it's the same convenience as having a car. Um, More. So, and, <laughs> and, and it has all these, you know, other benefits in terms of its power source that's not dependent on fossil fuels, but electricity that can be made from many things. So, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I just, uh, I'll just mention very briefly, sorry, that I'm sorry. I wrote, <laughs> I wrote a little blog that was picked up by CNN for Earth Day. About um, about green cities. It said, you know, you want green cities, lose the car. And in a day and a half, we had almost 3,000 comments. <laughs> Most of which were about how people either can't use public transportation in the places they live because they're so uh, not dense enough, or because they have all these ideas about public transportation. That, hmm. um, but that's such a that you know, it just struck me that that's such a nerve in American culture, and I think that's because it's a it's a really tender nerve. Hmm. I, I have as you would expect, can, and as I think is useful here, can totally different kind of perspective on that. I think that putting, ex, putting public transport on maps, on historical maps, is absolutely crucial to getting us from a sense of place and space to the issue of movement. Um, and, you know, and one of the things that Digital Harlem helped me do that transformed my sense of the neighbourhood was actually to begin to think about people moving around. So the argument that I was offering about blacks and whites in Harlem is fundamentally an argument about how people move around. You know, Harlem is a black neighbourhood because of census data, which is data about where people sleep. 
Um, it's a black and white neighbourhood once you get those people out of bed and you start moving them around the city. Um, and too much of the way that we've often thought about mapping is about is something very static. And, and, I, and, and, you know, if the public transport's not on the map, you're not thinking, if you like, about people moving. You put those on the map and suddenly you realise, OK, you know, everybody's in Harlem because they built a subway station there in the first place. But everybody is working outside Harlem because they can get on streetcars and they can get on buses and they can get on elevated railroads and they can get on subways. You know, the 1920s is the hub for multiple forms of public transport that take people, as everybody knows, is the New York story, all over the city. And once you really actually put that on the map, you realise that thinking about people as living in a neighbourhood <coughs> is actually a real distortion of people's lives. You know, And I think that you know, the story of Harlem is about actually how little time African Americans spent in this black neighbourhood, you know, because they were working in other places and also taking their leisure. If you know Sunday is the one day you expect all African Americans to be in Harlem, after about 1915, there's no baseball field in Harlem. So if you want to go and follow the Negro League teams, you're going to Washington Heights or to the Bronx or to Brooklyn, even on your day off. So I think that our sense of you know our sense of place has got to have those transport notions on a historical map to get you thinking about movement and to get you really thinking about spatial experience, not kind of Correct. you know spatial structures. So we have time for one or two more questions, and then I think we have to free you for some lunch. Um, yes. David, I, I, was, uh, I think all of the presentations are pretty brief, but teasing me about the notion that the the sort of lineal narrative is really being challenged. And I thought all the three presentations took us behind the narrative and provided us with the source materials that were the basis of the narrative. And I think that's the revolutionary implications of digital formatting in which the word democratization, which we talk about as an accessible <coughs> availability, really now means a conversation between my sources and my narrative. And then multifocal sources, which might in fact disagree mm. with my narrative. And I think that's a that question. Mm. Just that all of the presentations mm. tease that question, which strikes me as a very <coughs> radical, a new way to look at history, and, and particularly history of migrants. Mm. Great. Yeah, I'm going to then take one. I'm going to say yes. Um, and uh, <laughs> my prerogative, and take one more question. Can I say one, okay. one thing, David? Sorry. Which, which is, I think, you know, John started his talk about how people love maps. And I, for me, I think that's one of the reasons people always love maps so long. They are, of course, abstractions, but they're abstractions that you can read in so many different ways, yeah. unlike, you know, maybe a novel yeah. or, you know, a, a text narrative. Um, so I think that's a lot of where the fascination with maps comes from. It's really follows up. I think quite nice on that. It goes back to a point that John made as a kind of throwaway. It's really a dull question I'm going to ask, which is about how you assess these things for promotion. Because John, ah. you made a really quick sort of throwaway gesture. Somebody's that said, up pretending. The monograph. <laughs> somebody somewhere. But the monograph is still the gold standard. But I think um, the real excitement that you all capture here, on the one hand, is about openness. But on the other hand, there's lingering within it um, the kind of expertise that committees will assess for tenure. So I guess what I'm asking you is to go back over what you said. You assess your undergraduate, these really quite wonderful undergraduate projects that there's a deep appreciation for them. But I think for, for the future going forward, we're all hoping to have students at multiple levels who will go on producing this kinds of things. So can you envision, all three of you, how we create you know, promotion committees that actually will understand how to do this? So I still remember Richard White coming into a Journal of American History meeting saying, how are you guys going to you know, do my students' work on El Paso? How are you going to run a peer-reviewed article about this that will allow him to get tenure? So I think that question is, in some ways, about a not very interesting way of looking at the future. But I'd really <coughs> love to hear you guys talk about what we might do. Um, I think we can handle it in short bursts. Sure. I can't be as short as David and just say yes. but. Um, <laughs> I think the institutional culture question remains crucial as long as there are hierarchies and standards of judgment that are talking about livelihoods and jobs and the permanence of that employment. Um, I think the, the most advanced uh, stage of this right now that I know about is uh, in the Modern Languages Association's appointment of a committee that is ex meeting and doing surveys and having discussions about precisely how to establish the standards of evaluation and criteria and guidelines for departments and things like that. I haven't seen it happening in too many other places. 
Yeah. So it's being, it's, you know, as always in academia, it's in process. <laughs> it's not either or. Um, you know, Digital Harlem is not the only part of this project. You know, we wrote, you know, a book, we published, you know, half a dozen articles, the blog exists as well. I think it's making people realise that the digital allows you to reuse the material, to package it in different ways for different audiences. Um, and I think we get stuck in an either or. It's got to be a monograph or a website. Well, actually, that's not the reality of how that work works. You know, the, the Digital Harlem blog consists of material in a lot of cases that didn't make it into the article, you know, in order to say, write a paragraph about traffic accidents, I had to do an awful lot more work than a paragraph could contain. So I wrote a blog post with all of the rest of the material in it for a slightly different kind of audience. It's not the same as doing, you know, vast amounts of extra work. It's about recognising the excess of what we produce and the opportunity that gives us to present that in a variety of different ways. So I think, you know, we've got to get out of this either or. Either I'm going out for tenure with a website or I'm going out for tenure with a monograph. That's not the reality of the kind of work we're doing. Um, pluralism. Use the material. I follow up to that. I just will, you know, give you the one data point of a recent promotion case, which was my own. Um, how much did I emphasise? work on the internet for my, uh, you know, promotion package or whatever you want to call it that I submitted, I didn't emphasize it hardly at all. I just emphasized the traditional markers of articles, the book, the translations, whatever, um, that this other stuff was going on, sure, but from what I saw from the evaluative standpoint, from the committees of people from different disciplines at different levels, it wasn't discussed at all. He's working on something called Hypercities. Okay, let's move on. What yeah, journals did he publish yeah. in? I mean, I'm hoping that in the, we'll have a final wrap-up session. I mean, I had that question of, even broader question about as a platform for scholarship, you know, not just for promotion uh, and tenure, but just as a way to hang our work. What's the spatial? Um, and I think another question that came up that we didn't really get to at all is, the touch on it is um, this sort of uh, spatial platforms for political ideology, which I think is really important. Uh, question as well. So there's shockingly still a lot more uh, to come. Um, we'll have some really interesting student work and a discussion about some of the pedagogical issues in a one rich case study uh, after lunch. And with that, it is time for lunch. Thank you.
you had a tasty lunch. Um, so we're going to start off um, the afternoon portion of the event. And uh, what I want to do is, uh, my name is Kiwan Karamidis. I'm an assistant professor and director of the Digital Media Lab here at the Bard Graduate Center. And uh, I'm going to kind of give a little background of some of the digital things that we've done here at the BGC over what is now five years. Um, and then we'll lead into some introduction with David about the specifics of the project. And then in fine fashion, we're going to get to see um, work that three groups of students have done towards um, the development of the digital assets for this project. Um, and it's work that makes David and I very proud. And you guys look at to see that great work. So I was brought here uh, five years ago to um, turn an empty room into a space for creation, uh, which is kind of a fabulous mandate to be given. And um, we had a, a pretty unpredictably um, productive five years. And I really feel that the BGC, because of the kind of creativeness of the students and faculty, is really pushing the edge of the way digital technology can allow us to do different things with scholarship and create new types of um, knowledge. And I think where that really comes from is that we engage with all of our projects here at the BGC with a combination of both um, intellectual rigor and academic scholarship, but also with the understanding of what design means. And that we've really approached the structuring and development of digital projects in a way of what their final look will be and how information is distributed to a user through those mo modes of creation. And we've gone from very early on, you know, simple tools that I had known, you know, we're using wikis and WordPress and some prezies, to now we uh, have a wide range of creative projects. Uh, we recently had a project um, from a course in the Colonial Revival, which did this phenomenal kind of hyperlinked uh, multi-image um, and uh, multi-navigable project. Um, and one of the kind of highlights of all of that has been the development of the Focus Gallery as a place for experimentation with the um, creation of digital platforms that really make an argument to enhance the gallery shows that we have down the street. And it enhances what I would call, um, earlier we were talking about the three things that digital humanities are doing. So there's kind of text mining, um, as well as uh, visualization and mapping. And what I've found is really important to what we do, and what I think is critical to the importance of digital media and the academy, is really how we compose digitally. And how we take the old forms of journal articles and books, which are highly designed models, and rethink those deliveries of information, and take those arguments and information and put them on platforms that are digital and find ways to either incrementally or radically alter the dissemination of information with new visual techniques, new navig navigation techniques, and um, breaking linear passages to create linear, non-linear and user-driven structures. And to that end, we're very lucky to have exhibitions as a kind of core backbone for the work we do. Because looking at exhibitions from a kind of an information structure, what they really are are analog versions of non-linear user-driven experiences. Objects are laid out in space, text is provided incrementally on wall chats and labels, and without control of the creator or the curator, a user enters that space and guides themselves through the material. And there's no, there's no way to hem that in unless you kind of literally put them through a straight hallway. Um, and it, it's a great way that I think that our students have found a way to relate to how they can take their material in a digital platform and create the similar nonlinear user-driven experiences that the digital totally calls out for. And what has happened in the Focus Gallery is that because of the scheduling and the structure of doing two-year projects, um, the, with the, let me give a little background of the Focus Gallery, actually. For those of you who don't know, our Focus Gallery is a, a small one-room exhibition space at 18 that is usually a, a six -month, four to six-month exhibition that is the end result of two to or more years of research by a faculty member or a staff. And those faculty and research time is usually augmented by seminar courses which students participate in. As the project has grown, the participation of the students has increasingly shaped the end result of those pr projects. Um, this Mapping New York symposium is kind of in the mid-process of David working on his project. I'm working on one for the spring. We've had five or six previous. I can't remember the number. They kind of go in a rapid blur. Um, and as the projects have progressed, the curators who are doing small, short-term projects are more interested in seeing the way that digital interactives can enhance what is a relatively small space. So we have about 20 feet by 20 feet. So what we've ended up is with the last 
four or five, I believe, um, are 27 inch touch screens that allow for the curator to make another set of arguments that supplement and add to the physical arguments that are made in space. And the students have been encouraged more and more to play a role in conceiving of designing and prototyping what those interactive experiences are. This is a great asset for us because not only do the students get to think about digital materials and think about the way exhibitions work, but they get tied into a process where they experience working with exhibition staff, with the curator aggregating objects and making argumentative decisions, and then ultimately playing in a role in um, the creation of very important argumentative and informational distribution um, systems in that exhibition. Um, so. The, the focus guide projects have become really the culmination of all the best things that we're finding the digital can provide our curriculum here. Um, and David's is particularly important because he is the first of the curators to actually eschew a traditional physical catalog. Normally there's a book that goes along with the exhibition, but David has decided that because of the spatial turn and because of the sp importance of being able to navigate information through maps, he wanted a digital publication that would also work with the interactives that are in his space. Um, so it's a new challenge for us, um, something that the students have embraced, that David has embraced, and that we've greatly been excited about and encouraged. Um, and we're gonna get to see a lot of the work that has gone into developing that project. Um, so that's a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, I'm going to start uh, introducing the student projects now, uh, sorry, with David. Um, David's going to introduce the project and then we'll get to the students. Right, no, thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the focus gallery really is what the exhibit, physical, there is going to be a physical exhibit which will open September 18th down the block at 18. Um, and so what you're going to hear about so I'll talk about the physical exhibit and some of the objects that you will see, which will be quite a few maps, um, and prints and prints that are like maps, um, and interfaces that are like maps that you'll see for the digital components. And there are three digital components that you'll hear much more about from the students, because students really have been, as Kimon mentioned, the sort of key figures really in designing um, really the bulk uh, of the digital components. Uh, one of the digital components, uh, the intersection of Broadway and Ann, comes out of um, one of the students' fall projects um, that you'll hear about. Um, and in fact, the digital publication has 21 essays. Um, and I'm not sure you guys are going to talk about why we did a digital publication, but I'm not sure they'll tell you that there are 21 essays. I wrote an introduction, but they actually have written the other 20. So this really is, I think, an interesting pedagogical uh, you know, overture on our part to really think about uh, faculty student or I think of student faculty uh, work uh, here at the BGC. Um, and so I think that's part of the overflow also from the morning is the discussion we started really on pedagogy uh, as well. And so I'd like to continue that in the afternoon as well as all the other questions that we didn't answer in the morning because we will have then two respondents after the coffee break um, and then have a, a final sort of round table of all the uh, speakers from the morning and the uh, uh, two respondents and one uh, surprise guest. Um, so this will um, uh, be a del delight. Okay, <laughs> with that um, in mind. So um, the Focus Gallery exhibit's really premised on uh, how 19th century New York was a visual experience, uh, really a spectacle for resident and visitor alike. Uh, New York's, I call them sort of visual entrepreneurs, turned to woodcuts aquatints, lithographs, photographs to make sense of the really booming metropolis and promote their own uh, manufacturers to a national, indeed, a international market. Uh, for example, and you'll see that the significance of this DRIPS map uh, later. This is in 1851, 1852, depending on which edition, which is the first map that has a sort of lot-by-lot lot, um, depiction when you zoom down um, to that level. Um, and back to the Bachman. Um, so bird's eye views took to the air to attempt to envision the bursting of metropolitan boundaries while Harper's woodcuts um, in Harper's Weekly descended to the street to depict visions of congested avenues filled with pedestrians and vehicles narrowly avoiding disastrous collisions. The latest scientific innovations such as daguerreotypes or stereo views uh, quickly crossed the Atlantic and entered into the booming commercial marketplace that was 19th century uh, New York. Um, and in that process, New York really entered, uh, this is the argument at least of the exhibit, um, uh, 
entered sort of national visual consciousness. And Broadway is the chief subject. As we looked at more and more prints, more and, uh, of all different types, whether it be sort of drawers full of stereo views at the New York Historical Society or, or other resources, there was just more of Broadway than anything else. All of our entrepreneurs sort of lived, so to speak, uh, on Broadway. Um, and it was really the site for the nation's leading commercial print and photographic houses, or we snuck in the fact that two blocks away was Courier and Ive. So they're all close to Broadway, um, at least. So the way the exhibit, the physical exhibit, is set up is you will enter the gallery space after an introduction, um, which will have this Bachman view as well as the Drips map, and then you will stroll, the conceit is you will stroll along Broadway, encountering a series of storefronts that are these four different uh, visual entrepreneurs. So first, you will meet, I'm not sure we're using meet as a term really, um, you will encounter, uh, you will read about, you will look at materials by Matthew Brady. As you know, Brady came to New York from the hinterlands, made his mark as a portraitist of celebrities and publishing ventures such as the Gallery of Illustrious Americans. In 1844, this is pretty early, right? 1839, Daguerre announces the Daguerreotype. Brady opens his own commercial studio at 205 Broadway. Uh, and so Broadway became the place where middle and upper middle class patrons went to be photographed, uh, as well as actually some uh, working class. I mean, there's really a range. It's, it's the hierarchy of this is quite interesting, and we will address that uh, in the essays. Uh, but we're choosing Brady as our Daguerreotypist because Brady of Broadway was the brand name. So we sort of launched on representative figures. And the photographer's gallery, or the saloon, or the salon, whoever it was uh, depicted in different uh, texts, was the place to look at and be looked at. So these public parlors that Casey Greer's talked about become really how people become uh, parlor people. And everyone uh, comes to be photographed by Matthew Brady. So when uh, Barnum brings uh, Jenny Lynn to town, uh, she sits uh, for uh, Brady, and this is a whole plate, so it's really a large uh, uh, tinted gold um, daguerreotype. And you could go to his gallery and gaze at the portraits of these illustrious figures, and that becomes part of the scene, as well as look at your fellow New Yorkers. Behind the Gentile Salon uh, stood a series of rooms devoted to the various specialized functions of portrait making, from preparing the plates uh, to finishing. And so that's something else we're very interested in. When you stand in front of the storefronts, you will not know about the labor process, uh, the very intricate division of labor, the women and immigrant uh, workers who made all of these goods, um, even if Brady was the impresario. And so you'll hear more about how we try to address that you know, historical problem uh, in the digital interactives. Uh, or, oh, I'm out of sequence. Aha. Okay, so Edward Anthony opens his stereoscopic emporium in May of 1860 at 501 Broadway, another one of the grand commercial palaces that lined mid-century Broadway. Uh, and again, New York was the subject of many of Edward and it became Ian H.T. Anthony's stereo views and also the center of Anthony's national system of production and distribution. By 1873, their trade list included, these are stereo views, so sort of 3D stereoscopic views, uh, 11,000 views. Uh, and of course, Anthony was doing a lot more than just stereo views. He was also uh, producing carte de visite and, and, a whole, and a whole range of photographic supply. He started out as a daguerreotypist, but quickly recognized that the photo supply business was much more lucrative uh, and a place where there was far fewer competitors compared to the overcrowded supply of daguerreotypists who were just flooding uh, New York uh, and, in fact, the uh, itinerant uh, ways of uh, throughout the Northeast. Uh, Anthony uh, focused on capturing the and, and selling, that's important too, the glistening streets and crowded sidewalks of, of Broadway. And so this is really an iconic image of his. At the time, it was considered uh, iconic in that he shipped copies of this uh, Broadway in a rainy day to Oliver Wendell Holmes looking basically for present day like blurbs, as well as uh, Scottish and English photographers. And they came back with uh, you know, really interesting discussions of what this was called the instantaneous uh, photograph. Otherwise, before this point in time, you really would have scenes of city views that were on Sunday morning. So there'd be no 
uh, people in the streets or you would see shadowy carts moving by because exposure time was so long that you really couldn't capture motion. But through a variety of photographic mechanisms and chemical uh, innovations, Anthony was really able to reduce exposure times to about a 30th of a second or something like that. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, this was a depiction of urban space uh, as modernity. Uh, this was, though in some ways the scene and the way it's set up is quite conservative. All of the urban views look the same uh, with sort of a triangle of sky at the upper end and then sort of long uh, diagonals of uh, streets, whether they be rainy streets or not rainy streets. So here you have this long perspective along glistening streets and crowded sidewalks uh, filled with umbrella-covered pedestrians and horse-drawn vehicles, all caught up in mid-motion. And so this really becomes uh, a whole range of different Broadway uh, depictions uh, for Anthony. Let me go back. Um, Courier Knives. So this is the, so now you've moved around. You've gone from Brady uh, to Anthony, and you're in front of the Courier Knives um, shop. Uh, Courier Knives, the grand central depot for cheap and popular prints, offered a vast array of subjects, probably over 8,000 different subjects. Uh, they would... Uh, I forgot what the number is. Every three or four days, they really would be producing a new uh, lithograph. Ones that sold well, the best sellers, they would keep the stones. The others they would erase um, and work on another one. And they stored these in a, in a factory building that also uh, you'll hear about more. So that's part of the manufacturing aspect. So we're really not just interested in the front <coughs> view uh, or the guys who are doing this. We're really trying to think about uh, who made these and the who part uh, is a much broader uh, series of people. Uh, Courier, they really outstripped all of their rival lithographic firms. They became really an international, international supplier. But New York views, if city views were their, is everyone okay? If city views were their most largest category, New York views represented the most popular of the lot. And they increased their production. Uh, even if they're really developing new systems of marketing um, and distribution, they are really using a handheld system, uh, hand, you know, in a factory-like plant on 33rd, on, on, um, on Spruce Street, uh, that we'll also hear more about, where women colorists worked in an assembly line fashion to produce a mix of nostalgic views. You know all those treacly Thanksgiving scenes of a carriage coming up to a snow-covered, uh, but also these bird's eye views, uh, you know, really certain kind of a, a mapping of New York, such as this 1876, the city of New York. Now, as you probably know, that um, there is no Brooklyn Bridge in 1876, um, but they are looking forward uh, to the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, there are a succession of uh, white buildings here in sort of what is increasingly becoming sort of midtown, so they've really moved, this dep depicts the city moving uh, northward. It's a differentiated cityscape, and compared to their earlier bird's eye views, it represents really a higher perspective. The city's growth is such that they sort of moved upward to sort of capture uh, more of what's really bursting at the seams. And as you can see, uh, I'm not so sure you can see manufacturing works uh, along the margin. So again, it's a, a socially, industrially differentiated space. Uh, but it, what's most clear is it's a monumental in scale. Uh, and this is actually a chromolithograph, so it's using multiple stones uh, to produce that. So you're getting a slightly more garish color. Um, and then our final stop on this tour is um, Harper's. No, oh, sorry, see, I, uh, it's Harper Brothers. Uh, New York became the center of American publishing, and Harper Brothers was the city's largest publishing house, really the largest in the world, with 4,000 works in print. Harper Brothers formed a partnership. You see the Harper Brothers on the top left, uh, which became uh, founded as Harper Brothers in 1833. Their what we're really going to focus on is the illustrated periodical Harper's Weekly um, and the views of New York. Just like with Courier Knives, to do all of Courier Knives, do all of Harper's Weekly would be a life's work, which none of us um, uh, wanted to pursue. Uh, and more importantly, we wanted, and you'll be the better judge of this, we wanted to have a sort of focus uh, and our focus becomes really uh, the New Yorkness of it. What makes this a sort of New York story? Um, while well, Winslow Homer and other artists often sketch the genteel and refined side of the city and appeared in Harper's images, uh, they also had contrasting visions of the high and the low. 
while lithographs detailed the dynamism of the exploding metropolis, photographs and the illustrated periodicals pulled in closer, um, offering street scenes and character studies and using a mix of old and new technologies and visual genres. So you have here riotous street scenes, uh, others had overcrowded housing, even the everyday and what we think of as a common practice of crossing Broadway in these somewhat sensationalist visual narratives uh, become uh, come in for copious comment in image and text. And again, what's really interesting here for us is that unlike some of our other visual genres, these will have a marriage of image and text, and we'll be using that in the gallery as well. So in this 1860 view of Broadway opposite Fulton Street, um, really far too many vehicles and passengers are converging on the same bit of urban space. Policemen raise their baton um, and whips against horses and sometimes pedestrians, um, and others attempt to escort uh, well-dressed women across the street. And in the text it has Broadway opposite Fulton Street is in its way the most striking place in the United States. No other spot conveys so good an idea of the bustle and the stir of the great commercial city of America. Even in pleasant weather, when the streets are dry and there is no temptation to encumber them with unusual vehicles, there is always a monument, monstrous crush and throng and hurry and noise and clatter opposite Barnum's. And then they go on to talk. But in the snowy season, it's even worse. And that's what you see um, here. And then the final piece of the exhibit, when you get to after all of our uh, stops here, there will be a parlor, because our argument is that these were all domestic cultural commodities, Stereo View, Print, uh, Harper's Weekly, that were destined for the home. Uh, they were cultural, they signified sort of cultural uh, capital, one could say, and that's why they were used to sort of position oneself in terms of a certain level of middle class identity, because there's a vocabulary here, a parlor vocabulary that's been well spelled out. So we're going to have a shrunken, uh, in terms of the things that will be out there, uh, parlor with a center table, I think some wallpaper, uh, and then a series, of, uh, good, a series of Stereo View and Harper's on the table, uh, and a wonderful astral lamp that we're seeking to borrow from uh, Gracie Mansion, where it's currently located. Um, and so that's really what the physical gallery, and I think in my mishmash here, sort of series of themes that connect or not connect. Uh, and we're really in the stages of finishing up our work. So after you hear from the students and our respondents, we're really also keen to hear from everyone about you know, things that catch your eye, suggestions, comments. But much more important is really the work uh, of what these three digital components, which the several students in some of uh, have really suffered through a series of sequence of courses um, in the fall and spring, uh, and have done just wonderful work, and they're going to describe their work. Uh, to you. So I think Kimon's going to introduce them and I'm going to disappear. So like I mentioned before, oh, okay, yeah, uh, I did do that. <laughs> um, we, uh, we're going to have three different presentations. They're, they're going to come up in cadres and show their work. Um, to, to note, the, as, I met, as I talked about, the, the structure of this is an interesting one and is that there will be two digital interactives in the exhibition space. Um, that will accompany the objects and design um, for that room. Uh, and those interactives will also exist within the digital publication. So this is a challenge of structuring for the web, structuring for um, a physical space and connecting arguments, allowing arguments to exist on their own. Um, and these are a lot of what the students have been working through and trying to answer um, over the course of the, the semesters, two semesters uh, at this point. Um, so the first group is going to talk about the digital publication writ large, um, and they are Kelsey Brow, Hannah Kinney, and Virginia Fister. Do you guys want to come up? All right. Um, as the first student voice this afternoon, I also just want to commend David for how much he has let us be a part of his project. Um, it's been really great as students to learn from him, but also to be such um, you know, active participants in this project. So thank you for that. Um, the title of the exhibition, Visualizing 19th Century New York, is also the underlying task of the digital publication project. Visualization happens in the gallery, as David mentioned, in one sense by presenting visitors with the visual and material evidence of the experience of 19th century New York. 
Our investigation looks not only at images as illustrations of places, things, and people, but further asks how they were constructed and to what ends. Our analysis happens on the micro level by deconstructing images to see how they work, but also on the macro level to suggest larger themes about a changing city, ideas which I think John Horner's view of the corner of Broadway and Canal on the left, and John Bachman's New York and Environs of 1859 really illustrate these different levels at which this analysis takes place. Um, it had been David's interest from early on in the project to use the Matthew Drips map as the basis of a digital publication. The map is the first, as he mentions, to individually depict the lots and buildings of the city, including some with labels that I'm showing here. Um, here is the corner of Broadway and Anne that one of the later groups will talk more about. And while the map is packed with this very precise data, it is framed with an artistic border of cartouches depicting individualized civic landmarks within the city. The DRIPS map thus provided a multi-layered view of the city that mirrored many of the exhibition and the publication's questions. And using the DRIPS map in a digital form thus added a second meaning to the intellectual task of visualizing. As we all know and as we heard this morning, digital tools are increasingly giving us new ways to visualize data and thus understand it in new ways. Uh, so our group first started by looking at other examples in the field, um, working with maps of New York and how to tell its histories. We found some examples that use big data to map change over time, like this one, the five boroughs, which uses uh, the years that buildings were constructed to kind of make these heat maps or the, like this New York Times interactive telling a narrative of change over time with a slider bar of the streets um, being opened um, along the lines of the commissioner's plan, or other projects that use multiple layers of data and information to reconstruct different parts of New York City. But our data set is a little different. It is small and comprised mostly of written text and images in the form of 30 objects that will appear in the gallery um, and their related label text, 20 student written essays that will be supplemented with additional visual assets um, that relate to objects in the gallery, and then an essay written by David, um, which makes it hard to do big data visualizations or to totally reconstruct a neighborhood. We just have this data set to work with. Um, another thing that was on our mind was that this publication, this digital publication, will accompany our fall 2014 exhibition, and thus it would have to be bound to some of the specific concerns of that exhibition, but it will also have an afterlife on the web, and in David's hope, it's going to be added to by future students. So there was this idea of duration and how do we make decisions now that will influence students in the future. And from this set of parameters, we as a group work to define what form our visualization would take. And we started with some very general musings on the essence of maps. And we came to a very broad statement, but I think one that helped us. And it's that maps hold locations and sometimes the invisible relationships that exist between these locations. And those relationships were what we believed was how we could revive that experiential quality of 19th century New York, which is so central to the exhibition. And we saw that that was our real opportunity um, to bring this idea and these ideas to the public. And Virginia is going to talk more about how we developed our themes to illustrate the spatial relationships we were interested in and how we visualized them. But first, I just want to share with you some general goals for the digital publication, which will help you understand the decisions that we've made so far. Um, and then that'll help you to understand where we're going with this. So our goal, first goal, is really to foreground visual evidence and narratives. Um, and by foregrounding the visual qualities of 19th century New York, we wanted to provoke the modern viewer, thinking a lot about the people who would come into the galleries being New Yorkers. We wanted them to have a fresh look at something familiar. So to do so, we found it important not just to lay 19th century position, points on a contemporary Google map 
which I think this map does really effectively to rebuild the city. But what we wanted is something different to kind of bring the viewer back into the 19th century landscape and to remove themselves from their experience of interacting with maps of the city. Um, and by foregrounding the visual evidence and narratives, we hope to kind of capture some of the experience of viewing these objects in the gallery and that non-linear um, ways of exploring content. And we thought that that's really important because it suggests that images and objects can exist and do exist in multiple contexts and can be read in multiple ways and through multiple themes. Um, we wanted to present multiple ways of exploring the relationships between singular locations and the larger city in ways that are spatial to show patterns about certain types of business establishments that were together or separations that existed between different classes of people in the city. Uh, the chronological aspect change over time, businesses moving up Broadway was important to us, and also thematically to show um, macro and micro histories which we thought would create a more nuanced reconstruction, um, so really emphasizing the relationship between the whole and individual parts. Um, and finally, something that also came up a lot this morning is empowering the user to follow their own interests and make their own connections between these pieces of material. I'm going to address the design of the publication and our methods of data collection. First, we needed to create a design that could best showcase the 30 objects and labels, the 20 student essays, and the introductory essay by David Jaffe. In addition to incorporating all of these elements, we wanted to maintain the original design of the DRIPS map as much as possible to illustrate the spatial, chronological and thematic narratives of the project. To approach these various design needs, we look to the DRIPS map and its use in its original context. When Matthew DRIPS created the map, it was not intended for navigation. Rather, it told a story about New York through the cartouches that framed its border. In the same way that these cartouches frame the history of New York through its important buildings, we wanted to use them to frame our exhibit narrative. By replacing these landmark buildings with images of our 30 gallery objects, our design adopted an exhibit style model. This model allowed us to recreate the gallery experience in a digital way while still telling a 19th century story. Our next challenge after incorporating the gallery objects was how to organize all the student content. Because this was a highly collaborative project, we needed a design platform that didn't prioritize one single author or one reading of the essays. Using a standard table of contents alone felt too constrained for our project. Instead, we wanted to allow for as many different entry points to the information as possible. Essentially, we wanted to make the digital publication as freely structured as an exhibit itself, in that it allows viewers to choose their own path of absorbing the information like they could choose which objects to view in a gallery. We thought that the best way to create this multiplicity of entry points was through locating specific essays on the DRIPS map itself. Rather than arbitrarily plotting the points in a visually appealing way, we asked the students to choose any number of buildings or intersections in New York that embodied the subject of their essay. They then entered these locations into our collaborative Google spreadsheet. For example, the student working on Courier Knives chose the New York Crystal Palace as one of her locations because of the firm's iconic lithographs of the exhibition. Right here. Other locations included Barnum's Museum, Brady's Gallery, and the intersection of Broadway and Anne that Anna mentioned. These diverse locations would allow spatial patterns and relationships to develop on the map in a way that a simple table of contents as an access point would not. To help create other nonlinear entry points to the essays, we thought a slider bar showing change over time in the locations would be a useful design feature. Students therefore entered important dates related to their chosen locations into the spreadsheet. Once we knew the dates, we could depict when the specific sites appeared, moved, or closed completely. This information assisted us in showing the chronological narrative of the growth and development of the city. 
The last entry point we wanted to feature in our design was a thematic one. Because students themselves chose the specific topics for their essays, they were truly the product of original student research. Therefore, we thought it fitting that the students should decide the themes themselves. They entered them into the spreadsheet, and from there, we created this tag cloud to visualize them. The larger the word appears, the more prevalent it was in the list of our compiled themes. Although it would have been interesting to use all of these topics on the map, the risk of overcrowding led us to pare down the selection. Through class discussion, we were able to select these seven themes that best capture the topics in our essays. From all of this information on the spreadsheet, we allowed the relationships between locations, objects, and essays to emerge organically from individual research. This inherently collaborative design materialized when we began plotting all the students' locations onto this shared Google map. Once the map was complete, we noticed significant spatial patterns in themes about New York. <laughs> For example, as you probably noticed, uh, the clearest pattern that developed was the immense number of locations along Broadway. While the Google map was a useful tool for visualizing these sites, we needed to see what they would look like in a 19th century context, which is not this. <laughs> to do this, <laughs> we first exported all our Google Maps data to a contemporary map of New York on Google Earth. Then we imported a digital layer of the DRIPS map on top of the city, and here's our result. Okay, so now that you've seen the background to this project, I'd like to walk you through, <coughs> excuse me, what an imagined visitor experience would be like. So this is how we're prototyping so far. We're still dialoguing with the developers and amongst ourselves as to what the final design will look like and how we can optimize the user experience and the use of the technology to tell the stories that my colleagues were um, talking about. So for now, um, it looks something like this. You come to this screen with a title, and if you have visited this website before, you have the option to skip the intro, um, but for today, we'll pretend um, well, we don't really have to pretend because it is our first time visiting the site. And the intro takes you th through um, some other examples of maps of New York and, um, as Professor Jaffe mentioned, map-like prints to tell you the story of the idea of mapping New York and why the DRIPS map is our visual platform for this site. So it takes you up this commissioner's plan of 1807, um, telling you the story of the development of New York and how visual representations um, as well as the actual urban development created the idea of New York City. No. Then you see the DRIPS map as it is as an object and then it fades into the DRIPS map um, with the cartouches replaced by the gallery objects that Virginia mentioned and the themes down at the bottom then becomes populated by the points. Um, today I chose semi-transparent white points to clearly show them, but we're still deciding if pins or what kind of um, visualization would be the best effect. So then you can navigate it in a few different ways. If we clicked on spectacle here, the dots that relate to that scene, or to that theme, will show up red, and you can click on them, and it will show you the relevant essays. So let's say we clicked on this one because we're interested in the idea of spectacle, and it takes you to this student's essay, which you could scroll through here, and when you're done, close out and get back to where you were before. Now it's gray, so that you don't end up reading the same essay several times. Um, and you can either continue by navigating here, or if you're really interested in this particular site, you can click on the other essay that's relevant to it. The other way to navigate is by clicking on these cartouches, and it will give you, like you would in a gallery experience, um, get the tombstone information as well as a brief information about the actual object, and um, they may or may not have a link to a relevant essay. So just to conclude with the design, the last item that we have down here is the slider bar for chronology. Um, originally, this eagle held a little bar that showed the scale. Um, 
So we thought that we would incorporate that 19th century feel by using him to slide from um, the beginning of our years, 1825 through 1875. And right now, um, the dots would become very sparse depending on which way you slide it. But um, our final goal of this project was to make it expandable for future classes to incorporate their work. And as more data points get plotted, the interesting spatial effects that we've been talking about will be able to be seen on the map in more rich ways. Thank you very much. So the next interactive we're going to get to see is um, of Broadway and Anne, uh, of great, uh, an intersection where there was a lot going on in this time period. Um, and Zahava Friedman Stadler and Laura Kelly Badich are going to show it. Um, and in absentia, Andrew Gardner uh, is a student who worked a lot on this project, and they'll tell what he did. Ladies? We have put together a proposal for a gallery interactive that places the user at Broadway and Anne Street, an important intersection in mid-19th century Manhattan. This project began with work I did last semester and an earlier iteration of this class. In my research, I was thinking about the visual spectacle of New York and how it was depicted in print culture of the period. I was struck by how often Barnum's Museum appeared in images of 19th century New York and how arranging them chronologically illuminated the changes the intersection went through over time. The buildings themselves changed very little, but the change in people and surroundings was very striking. I was interested in how the depictions of this site showed the change in available med mediums and influenced these new techniques had on images, as well as how they told the broader story of print culture and consumption of the period. As you can see in this video that I made last semester, this intersection is primary, primarily important because of three significant landmarks. Following one intersection through the time allows the gallery user perspective on the changes Lower Manhattan underwent from the 1830s to the 1870s, both in terms of how it was depicted and also how it was understood by viewers of the images. Each site brought lo together locals, tourists, and business people, mixing high and low classes. This variety helps to highlight the consumer culture that was centered on Broadway in this period. Barnum's American Museum opened in 1841 after P.T. Barnum bought the site from John Scudder. It attracted all classes of people and became known for its extensive exhibits, including collections from Peel's Museum in Philadelphia. Burnham added loud decorations to the building's facade and hired noisy bands and stuntmen to perform and draw crowds inside. St. Paul's Chapel was built in 1766 as a chapel of ease for Trinity Church's wealthier par parishioners. Its steeple is one of the defining aspects of this intersection and became an important marker in lo um, excuse me, an important marker of location in images from the mid-19th century period. It remains the oldest standing place of worship in Manhattan. Astor Place Hotel was designed as the Park Hotel in the early 1830s and was completed in 1836. At the time, it was considered the height of luxury, but it eventually went out of fashion as Manhattan's elite moved northward and as the intersection of Broadway and Anne became better known for the popular culture associated with Barnum's Museum. The challenge this semester was to tackle the more practical issues of making this survey of the intersection into something suitable for gallery audiences. As Laura mentioned, Barnum's Museum, the Astor House Hotel, and St. Paul's Church were all important markers of the intersection of Broadway and Ann Street, and they are all seen here in this lithograph that was made from a drawing by Augustus Kulner. These landmarks provide a story of temporality and highlight how a place changes over time. Depictions of this intersection in which these landmarks are situated also provide a story about the sensation of the city at street level. Therefore, the main questions framing our project are, how did Broadway and Anne look to visitors, and how did this perspective change over time? Spectacle of the street appears to be a defining feature of the 19th century New York experience. Some examples of, the sh of street spectacle that would have been depicted in imagery of this period include signage, transportation, fashion, architecture, and entertainment. Images of each individual site, as well as images of all three buildings together, will serve as tools for gallery visitors and will help them unpack the popular imagery of street spectacle and American commercialism. We hope that this interactive will give visitors the opportunity to closely examine the artwork and text of roughly 40 years. Through touchscreen navigation, visitors can access virtual renditions of artifacts that would physically be uh, displayed out of reach. 
I will now begin to present the various portions of the interactive. This is another project that we found. It's called Mapping Ararat which inspired our introduction to the Broadway Nan Interactive. It is significant to our project because it spatially orients viewers by situating landmarks on a map. We want to give gallery visitors a rich experience that both showcases the scale of Manhattan and shows the very specific intersection that we are looking at. We found this to be an incredibly useful example, partly because so much of the story of the 19th century New York and the visual spectacle of the street is foregrounded against the strict mapping put in place with the 1811 Commissioner's Plan that was used, that was used to establish order in the city. Orienting the 21st century viewer spatially puts into perspective the sheer breadth of the geography and isolates the relatively small intersection on the map. With this in mind, we imagined a, a short 15 to 20 second introductory video when the viewer first touches the screen of the DRIPS map, which now you all recognize, um, that is also being used in our, pub our, digi in our digital publication, as you, as you heard. The video will then end up or zoom into the specific intersec intersection and highlighted the three sites that we are discussing. Once the video introduction is complete, users will see this landing page with a short introduction to the intersection, along with the relevant portion of the DRIPS map. As you can see here, the intersection is indicated by a red circle, and each of the sites is signaled with a red rectangle. There are two options for exploration in this interactive, by landmark or by time period, as indicated by the two buttons in the bottom right-hand corner. The first option offers a closer look at the changes over time to the intersection as a whole. Much of this story is told by how the sites and their surroundings change and how these landmarks fit into the larger story of change in the cultural fabric of the city. The section, second option offers a closer look at each landmark over time. This approach brings the viewer to street level where they can experience a multi-sensory city. Depictions of these sites are important ways in which modern historians and interactive users can unpack some of what would have been experienced at ground level. So now I'll talk about why we chose two routes for the interactive. In terms of the pedagogical principles involved in this project, we wanted to work uh, through the complexities of the site and allow the gallery visitors the opportunity to access the information about each site from two perspectives. As mentioned, this is a two-pronged story, one that is temporal, indicating how a place changed over the course of time, and one that is sensational and was therefore repeatedly meaningful to locals and visitors who then depicted the visual excitement of this area in their images and texts. On the one hand, we were challenged by thinking about the most compelling way to present this to gallery visitors who would have limited time to explore this interactive. And we also considered how to keep visitors engaged for longer. It's challenging to try to do all of these things at once, but we also felt it was necessary to divide these two approaches since one, the temporal and two, the, sen the sensational experiences that they provide are slightly different narratives and therefore give different insights into the period. We should note uh, that the accompanying that accompanying each page will be a compass tool, seen here at the bottom left, that can orient visi visitors as to how the intersections and landmarks are situated geographically. This will likely be a virtual tool that can shift, um, and it further relates to the idea that spatial orientation and perspective of the site are integral to telling a story of Broadway and Anne. This is the landing page when you choose explore the whole intersection path. We chose the graphic essays to represent the change in space and interest in spectacle from the 1830s through the 1870s. The three graphic essays will represent one decade or two decades together. The narrative for each decade will build the case for the intersection over time. A prototype for these graphic essays is the Colonial Revival Project pioneered by Bard graduate professor Catherine Whalen. Um, photos and texts can enter the screen together or separately in graphic form. Here is our proposed oops, here we go. Here is our proposed prototype for the 1850s essay that starts with a genteel depiction of the corner that continues the display of the 1830s and 1840s. Um, the essay mainly focuses on the intersection being depicted as chaotic during the decade because that is what the print culture popularly depicted of New York streets as the decade progressed. And although I'm rushing through these slides, I hope that, you will be, that the depth will be illustrated. <laughs> um, the text for graphic essays include primary source material and short label copy accompanied by five to seven images at a maximum. Um, each of these three short graphic essays will provide a linear format we also wanted to include a nonlinear component so visitors can choose the order to explore the decades, meaning they will have the freedom to choose 1860s and 1870s, first or only if it pleases them. And nonlinear formats are often prioritized in digital interactives, as you've heard or, or know, to provide visitors with the opportunity to follow their own interests. Um, each short graphic essay will communicate a single narrative reiterated through its content. 
Um, and this path will meet the majority of our project goals by one, building the case for the landmarks collectively, and two, conveying the spectacle of this intersection, such as crowds, transportation, and American commercialism. Users starting um, with this landing page for the landmark portion of the pathway um, will see either Barnum's Museum, the Astor House Hotel, or St. Paul's Chapel. Each landmark will feature three images of the landmark from throughout the time period covered and a brief introduction to the site. And each landmark's image can be compared together to highlight elements exploring what is the same or different or how media influences the depictions and major themes such as street spectacle um, and how they manifest themselves. In a gallery setting, it is not possible to highlight details of individual images to unpack their often incredibly complex meanings. Pulling them into this interactive allows the viewer to focus on individual elements that can further their understanding of the larger themes of the exhibit. Seeing how transportation vehicles change over time highlights their innov the innovations necessary to the growing city, and the increase in legible signs on buildings emphasizes the commercial aspects of both the area depicted and the prints themselves. Where the gallery allows a macro overview of the images and comparisons between objects, the interactive is a micro level and focuses attention on the single images and their complexities. For example, in this 1858 photograph, we've highlighted the musicians on the balcony of Barnum's Museum with a hot spot and included supplemental images of other street musicians, a quote about Barnum hiring bad musicians, and a quote about street musicians in general. Each of the images will have similar hot spots, illuminating themes and details uh, that will add to the visitor's overall experience. The Astor Place Hotel and St. Paul's Chapel will have similar hot spot, um, excuse me, will have similar pages um, in the same setup, allowing comparative chronological images and hot spots. This section of the interactive was designed to meet several of our project goals. It emphasizes the depth of the individual images and encourages close reading, elucidates street spectacle of the period, and makes full use of the nonlinear digital format. Pulling out details in the selected images requires viewers to look more closely and recovers the 19th century experience of viewing prints and other images. Seeing the spectacle of the street at selected landmarks and an intersection as a whole allows visitors to the gallery to encounter these images in a way that would have been familiar to contemporary viewers. Broadway epitomizes the busy, consumer-driven se consumer sector of commercial Manhattan, and this 21st century technology allows a modern audience to have a very 19th century experience. Attempts to visualize 19th century New York through its print culture is a multi-layered process. By choosing a site of great change and much visual interest, we are trying to capture the sights and sounds of the place um, as it was documented and changed over time. This interactive is a visual aid that guides gallery visitors through time. It also serves as a rich resource of imagery and primary texts that provide the nuanced details of this lively intersection, like this image here depicting the chaos of the intersection that could otherwise go unnoticed by the 21st century gallery viewers. Okay, thank you. Our uh, third and final presentation <coughs> will be the Behind the Scenes uh, Interactive, and it will be presented to us by Martina D'Amato, Claire McCree, Kirsten Pritich, and Virginia Spofford. So from literal mapping in the, geo in the sense of geolocation, we're moving to a sort of visual map um, of a factory setting to return to the entrepreneurs and businesses and industries that David had highlighted before that will serve as the main focus of the physical exhibition. With this quote behind the scenes interactive, we want to tell a story that is integral to the idea of 19th century New York as an industrial capital, but which could only be touched upon um, in the, with the physical objects, objects that will be in the gallery. That story is an abridged one of the labor forces and technology that drove the industries highlighted in the gallery. That is, me, uh, visual media, lithography, daguerreotype photography, stereo views and publishing, and finally, to address the parlor culture in which these media would eventually live, uh, parlor furniture production. This interactive creates a dialogue between physical objects while also allowing the user to look beyond and get behind the finished products visible in the exhibit by illustrating the mechanical processes that made these products possible. Unlike the male-dominated front end of businesses highlighted in the gallery, lower paid laborers, particularly women and immigrants, can be discussed more fully and will live on within the digital publication. By the mid-19th century, in the wake of waves of technological developments, businesses put increasing effort into elucidating the labor and technology behind their establishments for a growing interested public. 
illustrated books as well as countless articles in magazines, newspapers, and promotional brochures describe step-by-step uh, goings-on in factories. One such publication was the 1855 book, The Harper Establishment, or How the Storybooks Were Made, from which the engraving that will serve as the opening inter interface for this interactive comes. The book, which will also be in the gallery, in part describes the activities of employees in the division of labor at Harper and Brothers' newly rebuilt factory, walking the reader through the process of the creation of a book. And it's actually the same process for um, their periodicals. The image is a somewhat idealized but generally accurate view of the seven floor Harper's Pearl Street establishment. I'm sorry, th this is the Cliff Street building. And it serves as a visually stimulating backdrop over which to discuss the topics of labor and industrial process at one of New York's most recognizable publishing giants. This is by no means an exhaustive study of the mechanics of such factories, but that is not our intention here. Rather, we wanted to give the audience a taste of the layers of labor and industrial practice that lay behind the works in the exhibition. By illustrating these layers, the interactive even, even to some extent highlights and mimics the promotional and educational aspects that these businesses like Harper and Brothers used. And while not all of the establishments that we are speaking of publicized their technical processes for the public so readily as Harper did, and I'm thinking specifically of Matthew Brady and Courier and Ives, the interactive allows for the chance to elucidate the behind-the-scenes process for even those more opaque entrepreneurs. By taking users through selected stages in the production of consumer goods and inviting them to choose their own navigational path through successive layers of image and text, which my colleagues will show next, the interactive complements the gallery objects. With limited gallery space, the ability to include an array of supplementary materials rounds out the selection of objects, while also allowing us to unpack works in the gallery, as well as amplify some of the exhibit's key concepts. So as Martina described, our interactive tool prototype, I'll reiterate, prototype, um, begins with a landing screen showing the 1855 engraved cutaway of Harper's facility on Cliff Street. An accompanied introduction explains the purpose and a broad overview of the content available for user engagement. From here, users can click on five hotspots to learn more about each of our future entrepreneurs and the behind the scenes activities that made their products available for consumers. Um, she listed some of them, but I'll just reiterate our entrepreneurs. They're Edward and Henry Anthony and Company, Matthew Brady, Courier and Ives, Harper Brothers, and um, Shrink Kaizen Furniture. So selecting a hotspot launches a representative image for each entrepreneur and their industry. For instance, the gilding room at Anthony & Co's establishment, which was published in a sales catalog, along with depictions of other departments in their production facilities. This image was chosen for its demonstration of women and men completing the same tasks and the appearance of both works in progress and completed products. A brief introduction presents the entrepreneur and the initial image before revealing more hotspots that offer opportunities to view further detailed information on laborers and technical, technical processes. Each of these hotspot locations on the base image are deliberately chosen for their relation to the information provided. The added content consists of images in a variety of media depicting people at work, production processes, and tools used in manufacturing. They are all authentic to the 19th century, and many were published intentionally by the entrepreneurs to provide customers insight into their operations. Our use of these visual, visual sources contributes to the larger efforts to recover a contemporary experience through the exhibition and the digital supplements. However, additional research presented through written content also offers less publicized um, information. Each level of progressively detailed content is designed to be quick and easy to read. A user will be able to move from hotspot to hotspot and between the different entrepreneurs to gain a depth and quantity of information based on their own curiosity and interests. So we wanted to provide some sense of the content visitors will actually see for each of these entrepreneurs. So Claire and I will each take you through one of the firms. Whereas my section on Courier and Ives focuses on the technical process of lithography, Claire's approach to Matthew Brady will deal with the daguerreotypist studio as both a space for making and selling images. Uh, so the landing screen for Courier and Ives will be this 1874 illustration of a lithography workshop, which is similar to the introductory cross-section of the Harper's Building and its schematic approach. However, this image was used as part of a didactic text that surveyed various trades and occupations in the 19th century. 
The text was published by Lewis Prang, a Boston entrepreneur known for chromolithographs like this one, uh, making it somewhat distinct from Courier and Ives' output. However, Prang's image clearly delineates the various steps involved in the lithography process, which will help visitors understand what exactly went on in Courier and Ives' factory building, since we don't have any extant images of their labor force at work. Um, um, in reality, both workshops would have been much more crowded and not nearly so clean, um, but we can consider this a paraphrase of the process. So the first of my hotspots here shows a lithographer working from a sketch to draw a design in crayon on limestone. Courier and Ives contracted certain artists that did their own drawing on stone, but in many cases they only provided sketches or paintings that were copied onto stone by an in-house lithographer. We'll actually have one of Courier and Ives' original lithograph stones in the exhibit, which is quite rare. So we've been able to highlight that moment in the production process and provide a link between the interactive and the gallery objects. Once a design was finished in crayon, the image would be fixed onto the stone using a nitric acid solution, and that's indicated here by the table in the foreground with a bucket and brush. Um, gum arabic was also used to seal the stone and prevent any more grease from settling on the surface. Um, so lithography operates on the principle that grease and water repel each other. For each impression, the printer would wet the surface of the stone, then use a roller to apply grease paste ink, which would adhere only to the design done in crayon. And you see that process here on the right. Um, and the Smithsonian's Courier and Ives archives include evidence of the firm's proprietary ink recipe, which you see here on their letterhead. Um, finally, the printer would lay a damp sheet of paper over the stone and use an iron plate to transfer the ink design onto the paper. So my final hotspot alludes to the hand coloring process that Career and Ives was known for, that they did start to outsource some chromolithographs around the 1870s and 80s, which David already showed an example of, and that'll be in the exhibit. Um, generally, however, Career and Ives relied on a team of colorists, mostly made up of German immigrant girls, who would work in an assembly line, each applying a different color to a stack of individual prints. Um, these workers used an already colored guide, but sometimes you can detect little idiosyncrasies between impressions of the same design. And Courier knives might also repurpose a popular stone with different coloring. Here you can see the original design uh, commemorating the opening of the New York Crystal Palace, and five years later, the burning of the Crystal Palace uses the same design, but just adds flames. So. <laughs> While Kirsten focused on the lithography process in her discussion of Courier and Ives, for Matthew Brady, I emphasized the dual function of his studio as both a commercial and manufacturing space. For my base image, I chose this 1849 satirical illustration entitled The Daguerreotypist. This illustration accompanied a character sketch written by the popular author T.S. Arthur for the periodical Godey's Ladies Book. In the text, Arthur describes a country bumpkin visiting a portrait studio for the first time, who ends up fleeing the studio in fear that the staff are plotting to murder him. The daguerreotypist portrays a studio built on a much smaller scale than Brady's studio. Brady's larger scale operation was well known for its lavishly furnished spaces. However, I think this image is still useful in helping visitors understand the daguerreotype portrait progress and its humorous subject matter draws the viewer in and sparks his or her curiosity to find out more about the process depicted here. Because Brady's studio functioned as a commercial space, customer relations were key for the studio's success. Accordingly, my first hotspot focuses on the customer experience. The daguerreotype's long exposure time sometimes required a tool called a vise, which held the sitter's head still. However, the vice likely made the portrait an awkward experience for the sitter. <laughs> In contrast to the satirical base image, this daguerreotype of a female sitter shows a successful portrait session in which the camera woman, or operator, has posed her subject with dignity and grace. Female operators were quite rare, typically if women worked in the daguerreotype industry. They did so away from customers in back workrooms. Brady's reputation as an excellent portrait photographer was due in part to his charisma and charm, which set customers at ease and led to flattering portraits. My second hotspot focuses on the operator, that is, the man who worked the cameras. Brady did not work as an operator himself at his studio. 
Instead, he tackled tasks such as publicizing the studio, posing sitters, and finding celebrities to photograph. However, even though Brady did not actually work the cameras, he still received the artistic credit for the daguerreotypes produced at his studio. Operators were seen as technicians rather than artists. In this daguerreotype portrait of celebrity vocalist Jenny Lind, we actually know the name of the operator, which is not always the case. This operator, Luther Boswell, received complimentary concert tickets from Lind for himself and his wife after the portrait session had concluded. All of the processing required to finish the daguerreotype took place in back workrooms, which the customer never saw. I have used hotspots on the wall of the operating room to evoke this part of the image production process, which was popularly understood as mysterious and quasi-magical. Directly before the daguerreotype was taken, the photographic plate would be sensitized in the workroom and then delivered to the operator. After the operator had taken the exposure, the plate would return to the hidden workrooms where the image would be developed using mercury vapors, hand colored if requested by the customer, and enclosed in a protective frame. While we know little about the laborers who processed the photographic plates in Brady's studio, an 1850 statistic helps illuminate some of the key demographics involved in the New York City daguerreotype industry. According to a trade publication, of 127 portrait studio proprietors, operators, and staff, 46 of these employees were boys and 11 were women. In conclusion, while much of this exhibition focuses on entrepreneurs and the finished images they produced, in this interactive, we wanted to highlight the laborers who don't always receive credit for the important <coughs> role that they played in New York manufacturing. We hope that after exploring this interactive, visitors will come to have a richer understanding of the images and objects on view in the gallery. So just a, a couple of closing remarks. What I think the three presentations by the students and David's presentation show is um, the capacity to really make a whole set of arguments that share common centers but branch off in different directions and that we're really looking to create these nonlinear experiences that allow users to discover those arguments on their own in a sense. Um, and the students responded fabulously to the, that challenge and as you see from their work and um, as it gets put together with the exhibition, which will be another layer of that, um, it will be interesting to see, especially now that we are working with the developer to further refine these projects, um, what the final output will be and we invite all of you to come and see the show in September. Um, at this point, we're going to take a, a, a 15 to 20 minute coffee break and when we return, um, we'll have two respondents who I'll introduce when we return um, uh, to respond to this material and uh, have a good break.
Barbara Clark Smith and Josh Brown. Um, and then what we're going to do is um, open the uh, floor to general questions from all of you. Um, and then once we've gotten kind of past that section, we're going to ask the, all of the panelists from all of today to come up here and we're going to have a kind of open discussion about everything that we've addressed today. So um, Barbara Clark Smith is a curator in the Division of Political History at the Museum of American History, Smithsonian Institution. She is a social and political historian of early America who has worked in a variety of genres. Her most recent book is The Freedoms We Lost, Consent and Resistance in Revolutionary America, New Press 2010. She has curated many important exhibits at the Smithsonian, to name just a few. After the Revolution, Everyday Life in America, 1780 to 1800, and a related book, After the Revolution, The Smithsonian History of Everyday Life in the 18th Century. Men in, another book is Men and Women, a his, another exhibition is Men and Women, A History of Costume, Gender, and Power, and most recently, the traveling exhibition, Three North American Beginnings, Jamestown, Quebec, and Santa Fe. Joshua Brown is the Executive Director of the American Social History Project Center for Media and Learning and Professor of History at the City University of New York Graduate Center. He is author of Beyond the Lines of Pictorial Press, Everyday Life, and the Crisis of the Gilded Age America, co-author co of Forever Free, The Story of Emancipation and Reconstruction, and co-editor of History from South Africa, Alternative Visions and Practices, and has written widely on the history of U.S. visual culture. He is visual editor, most recently with David Jaffe, of the American Social History Project's noted textbook, Who Built America? Working People and the Nation's History. And also co-authored and co-directed the accompanying Who Built America CD-ROMs and documentaries. In addition, Brown's art appears regularly in academic and popular publications, including the graphical historical novella Ithaca, which was serialized on the Commonplace website from 2010 to 2013. Barbara and Josh are going to start with some responses to the student work, and then we'll move forward. Yeah. Great. Um, I, at lunchtime, I said to somebody that I was feeling kind of uh, like I'm this archaic person from an archaic institution <laughs> that uses an archaic medium, uh, namely the museum <laughs> exhibition. Um, and at one point, the Smithsonian had a secretary um, early in the 21st century who made a big deal out of bringing this, how his, his goal was to bring the Smithsonian into the 21st century. And, um, you know, that made a certain sense to me for, say, the Air and Space Museum. But it was a funny thing to say to historians, that what I want to do is bring you into the 21st century. And although my hope had been that meant we'd all get new computers, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what it meant was, you know, we were going to get new donors with new money and a new understanding of our institution as something called a brand, right? So that was its moment. But I, I thought it, at the time he was saying this, it really struck me as odd. Did he understand that he was talking to people who, for a living, preserve things from earlier centuries believe that those are the most valuable things, um, and that we also preserve 19th century ways of looking and ways of thinking. Or at least we, um, if you just even look at the ways our artifacts are categorized and the way people talk about the collections, sometimes you hear Linnaeus speaking in there, that there's a, a way they're talking about, well, there's this kind of artifact and that kind of artifact, so is there a gap in the collections? Which is always very, you know, as if what we're doing is collecting types of things, and if this were the Enlightenment, that would be great, but it's not where we are. And so there's something very archaic about of uh, the museum exhibition as a medium and collections and, and stuff. And so what I'm excited about right now, I'd just say at the outset, is from all that's gone on is the de what's exciting me is the degree to which the questions that uh, people are raising about these presentations and what you can and can't get across and what your choices are and how are people going to actually use this and will they learn from it and what is learning if when you have this sort of experience. Um, those are questions that the museum world has too. And so I, it's great to know that we're addressing the same questions and we're in it together. Um, I w thought I'd make a couple of remarks. I'm really excited about this whole um, exhibition and the digital uh, products. It strikes me as there's a lot of creative work. And I just thought I'd mention a couple of things that came to mind to start things off. Um, from each presentation. Um, David, I'm gonna start by commenting on your presentation, <laughs> and then students second, okay? Um, I, I love, you know, there are all these great things. Um, I, I like the inclusion of the parlor, which when I first heard about it, I didn't get, I get it. 
Um, and, and I love, um, I guess in the most large, lighthearted way, my question was, do your visitors are going to come in and go down Broadway? You really have to decide how much chaos and noise and stuff to throw at them. I mean, if one of the things you're, that points about Broadway, it's not a leisurely stroll. Now, maybe if you're lucky, the place is packed with people and then, you know, they, they get that experience. But it's just a question about um, choosing to both, you know, kind of, evoke this experience of walking down Broadway, but you don't really want it to be chaos because you're hoping they're like paying attention and, and learning stuff. And there are exhibit techniques, um, some of them laughable and some of them subtle and interesting that are worth kind of thinking about, like, is this going to feel like a walk down Broadway? Uh, the other thing was with the parlor um, is I thought it was at least worth raising the question what it is to end with a parlor as opposed to begin with a parlor as you could begin with the consumption of these artifacts. And I think there's lots of reasons why I think you probably made the right choice and too many people have seen too many period room parlors and would they focus on these particular, this daguerreotype, in it, if you started there, probably not. But I do like the way that when you get to the parlor, um, what it should do is help visitors look back at the stuff they were looking at from the point of view of, of a pedestrian on the street and uh, these entrepreneurs and these uh, the production, and now look at it from a kind of consumption end. And I don't know if there's a way to, um, in an exhibition, to kind of encourage that look back, to remind people um, this is what's behind these artifacts in this parlor. You know, you, you saw that first. Let's remember. That, that so but th I think that's really that's that's what came to mind about that um, the a couple of things came to mind about the mapping New York um, uh, presentation and actually all of these things probably you know apply to all the presentations just some of the questions came to mind with one rather than the other I thought there were wonderful strengths with that I love um, the reuse of the cartouches I think that's brilliant <laughs> and people get it um, I would wonder if, you, if there was a way to, um, oh, and I love the fact that your notion of no table of contents, that's exactly like a museum exhibit where the visitors insist on going through backwards half the time. I mean, you can plan incredibly well, and they just don't, you know, they just are going to go the way they're going to go. And so you really have to think, does this make sense if you start here instead of there? And, and that's kind of a, a good feature. Um, I thought there might be ways of raising questions about the DRIPS map. One thing would be, uh, what was it meant for originally? You know, wh is, what's the difference between the, what the way people were expected to look at it then, and the way people did look at it then, and the way we're looking at it, at it now? That that might be, because that makes us a little more conscious of our purposes in looking, looking at it. You know, that we're, that we're looking at it from a different, for different reasons. Um, and again, I like that you pre present multiple ways of experiencing this map, both through these particular buildings and, um, and uh, temporal and, and uh, spatial changes. Um, just an open-ended question for all of these presentations, are there ways of suggesting that there are even additional ways of approaching this that we're not going to do here? Okay, it's not that there are two ways or three ways or eight ways of seeing this. And it makes me think of that one of the most effective museum e exhibits in my, that I know of um, years ago was Fred Wilson's exhibit at the Maryland Historical Society where he, one of his best uh, moments was we saw all these columns with busts of famous um, he uh, Henry Clay and Calhoun, famous white political leaders, and then he had busts that were empty with I don't know, you know, ben, Frederick Douglass, ben, and so he he brought your attention to the absences, and that was very eloquent. And I, I, how you do that on in an exhibit on the exhibition floor, or um, you know, in a digital presentation is, I think, really an interesting question. And it just sort of, you know, sometimes when you have a list of, of alternatives, maybe they're, you know, none of the above, or the <laughs> there needs almost to be a, a question some somehow introduced. Um, to people. Um, I love the intersection of Broadway and Anne, and I'd only think, well, I'd love the point this morning that every place is a node. So what if 
Broadway and Anne is a note, and one of the questions I would have about the way people experienced as a historian, I'd have the question, what are they doing there? And I assume a lot of people are there to go to Barnum's that probably, you know, other people are living at the hotel and some people are worshiping. But it's an, in, it, it, I might al also almost want to build out from there and think about what routes are people taking in and around here? I mean, why, what, what makes this the center other than, um, other than it being a destination or a, a living place. I'm, I would want to know something about what people were doing there. And I, I don't have a good idea about how you, how you should evoke that. I mean, I don't have a good idea how you could do the research to find it out, for one thing. But if you, you know, if you, to the extent that there's reasons for being there, that this is a, on a route in somebody's life other than I'm going to the museum, that'd be kind of a, um, an interesting part of understanding why they, how they actually do visualize. For behind the scenes, I really did love the story of the industrial, uh, somewhat idealized industrial world. Um, I thought it raised a question of why they, was it Harper's that, that visualizes its own production process? What are they doing that for? I mean, what, why do they want you to know? that we have these workers behind the scenes in these apparently happy, pristine conditions. <laughs> um, and why do some places not? I mean, that's an interesting thing that some, some, in some entrepreneurs will foreground and others are not interested in foregrounding that. Um, once you understand about the laborers, I think it reflects back on how we'll see the entrepreneurs. And once you understand about the production process, again, it reflects back on how you see the entrepreneurs and their products. And again, I try to think of a way to signal to, to try to evoke people looking at the site to ask the question back, um, okay, we now know this stuff. What does this, what does this daguerreotype look like now? That, or what does this map look like now that we know who, who what was involved? Um, I was struck by the absence in this whole commercial scene of money of um, salaries, prices, um, profits, you know, and uh, I think there's interesting uh, questions about that, which which might work with the exhibit too. That there's something that circulated from um, these entrepreneurs to the parlor, but also from the parlor back through and to the workers, um, making that visible in an exhibit. I'm I'm not sure, um, but I really just to conclude, I thought. The um, there is something there's something really valuable about uh, getting visitors uh, to reflect back on how the they saw images at the beginning and how they see images at the end. Now that's structured as if there is a beginning and end, and you can do that to some degree in an exhibit, despite what I said earlier. Uh, you can have a big sign saying beginning and end, but maybe maybe you can. Um, <laughs> Uh, suggest looking back, you know, at a certain points, um, or say, you know, after the, suggest after this, you might want to look at this or ask a question uh, about it because I think sometimes um, that sense of revelation people get sometimes in front of an artifact or, or a lithograph or in the course of an exhibition is partly from having seen something and then seeing it again and realizing, okay, I've got that there are these layers now. And that, there, that having that be an ending experience or a repeated experience is a very valuable one. So a lot of those are many more questions than they are specific ideas of how to do them. So sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, I enjoyed it. Well, I'll probably I'll only exacerbate that problem. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> Let me first say that uh, it, you know today the the conference uh, the symposium today has been terrific. The morning sessions were really wonderful, as as was the, the most recent presentation. It did also make me feel somewhat antiquated, um, and that's yeah, we're old. Uh, um, the in in my case also because aside from I think my first commercial job was doing a map uh, by hand. The, uh, I recall, in fact, uh, going to Avery Library at Columbia in uh, the mid-1970s because they wouldn't let you even near there with a, actually with a camera at that mm. period of time, and having to trace out the Paris insurance maps that now are conveniently online uh, to, to use for my MA thesis. And then 
uh, later on uh, going to New York Public Library and being allowed to photograph until Matt Knudsen, whose name has been brought up many times, <laughs> very nicely last year when I contacted them again to take some photographs, again, of the Paris um, uh, insurance maps. I seem to not be able to get away from that volume. Uh, and he said, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. That's, you don't have to do anything like that anymore and, and indeed use the 2D uh, Google Earth mm -hmm. Uh, a resource, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the wrapping program that the New York Public Library has done, uh, and it changed my life. <laughs> I mean, I still had to do other drawing on it, but it still was really great. Anyhow, on that note, um, I, uh, I also thought that anything I have to say here are really more suggestions, or, and in some cases, things I would suggest in light of the great points that you made about keeping this uh, not only nonlinear, but also uh, expansive, so that indeed you know, your, your your successors <laughs> will be able to do this uh, uh, and expand upon your work. Um, uh, so many of these questions, many of these are really sort of questions and suggestions that are down the road for other people to worry about, but to just sort of think about. Uh, one that that comes to mind, and, and as as in Barbara's case, uh, I may speak specifically. But they often are touching, you know, many of your both, uh, all three presentations. Uh, came up uh, in the Barnums, but it was also um, it also struck me uh, when David uh, gave his presentation in the beginning, and that is. Um, I was wondering about uh, the only interiors that images that you see uh, are, are indeed th those of the workplaces. Um, and I was wondering, particularly in light of the fact that at least the institutions that you are uh, highlighting in, in many cases, uh, particularly the Broadway institutions, are enticing people inside. I mean, the whole purpose of Barnes, I mean, as you pointed out, the joke was, you know, the music was so badly played on the balcony to drive people inside. But nonetheless, the, the point I guess I'm getting here is that it seems to me those interiors are as much a part of the, the mapping mm -hmm. and it, indeed will be, I think, you know, exciting and interesting for, for people to understand that people equated uh, the exteriors with the interiors. Um, now, I don't know if you can do that in all cases. In some cases you can, and, and that's something to, you know, to consider. I also wondered about um, uh, the challenge of unpacking the visual evidence a little more. Um, you, uh, particularly in indicating the hot spots uh, around, for example, the flags around Barnum's Museum, as you indicated in one case, um, that uh, uh, there is, there, there's, it's an unspoken, it seeming, seems as if you're taking these images as un, uh, as documentary, uh, you know, without any question attached to it. Uh, and I'm not su suggesting so much, although it doesn't hurt to be able to ask some questions in terms of accuracy per se. I was also wondering though about, uh, and I think you touched on this a bit, the visual language mm -hmm. of many of these, uh, of these, in fact, all of the images. Uh, but I mean by that, I guess, anywhere from um, uh, the, the narratives that are embedded in them to indeed the social types that may be presented in, in particular mm -hmm. in particular images. But I think this is part of the uh, of the unpacking of the visual evidence that will also be informative. Uh, that mm -hmm. and and the, how the different visual images really do, or rather, I'm sorry, the different visual media offer different types of information and different types of ways of conveying the information. Um, and finally, on a, uh, actually touching on something that Barbara said, we didn't actually communicate yeah. this beforehand, uh, <laughs> about nodes. Um, and that is that, and this question about, well, why are people even in the area, aside from you know, people just wander up and down Broadway all the time, which I guess they do do in some <laughs> cases. Um, indeed, I was wondering about, and Barnum's came to mind in particular here, contiguous businesses and institutions. Yeah. Now, because of another project that we worked on. I know, for example, just for what it's worth, that in Barn in the basement of Barnum's Museum in 1865, there was a dining saloon, and there was also a hatter. Uh, and then you probably know this, in, in, in buildings next door, there was the, I think it was called the Live and Let Live restaurant, which certainly sounds ominous. <laughs> and, a, and a clothier, 
Vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> that they would get in B or C. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Also called Captain's Live and Live, live Restaurant. But um, a billiard parlor, a clothier's dining saloon, there's a broker, uh, there's a patent agency, another hatter, and another restaurant. My, my point being that, and, and in those cases, I don't think you're going to find any <laughs> interiors. But there's certainly, I, I know that the, in some cases, that was, the, that information came, I think, from the New York Times coverage of the, of the burning of Barnes Museum as, as one example. But, um, but I just raise it because I think the notion, our tendency is to think of street life now pretty much based on these big attractions. When Broadway is a, you know, is a, a, a small and large entrepreneurial, uh, uh, you know, venue. Um, and then just uh, to round out, um, in, a, in, in terms of the maps, uh, I, I wondered two very unrelated things. One, one is wondering a bit more about creating, as you pointed out, I thought it was a terrific point, about wanting to make clear relationships, the relationships to the objects and also relationships to, uh, of the different institutions. And one that struck me in particular uh, for, the, for the types of, of, uh, of themes and, and institutions that are so far highlighted, the publishing institutions, the photography institutions, and so on, is theater is, is, is instrumental in, in its backward and forward. Theater is for photography, certainly for lithography and engraving. Uh, and of course, in a similar fashion, all these things are used to, to promote theater. And that is, you know, right next to the theater district and both the working class and the, and the, and the, and the uh, middle class theater district mm -hmm. at the time. And then as a, on a completely more nerdy point, um, I wondered uh, about uh, the hot spots, not only in the maps, but also uh, in the, uh, on the, in the, for the uh, behind the scenes section. And that, so one of it has to do with questions of perception of people who are colorblind, people have, uh, you know, have, uh, have seeing difficulties. If I, either icons in the ter and, and uh, Stephen's presentation of the Harlem maps uh, in the morning made me think of it as, oh yeah, icons that are also perhaps indicative of the theme. So it just help in terms of identifying more than, than color. In the case of the, uh, of the um, behind the scenes images, which I thought was terrific, that was a great idea, but maybe this is a question of you know, uh, outlining, you know, doing a hotspot out outlining. I, I don't know what the technical term is, but it, it's pretty straightforward and, and very, very common. As a, and, I, and that will also signal uh, even more strongly with that. I, I would say it's in keeping more with the image while at the same time it's directing you to, you know, to click on it. Um, and finally, um, uh, tied to the behind the scenes, uh, I, I, and you, you may have already said this and it may be there, but it strikes me that almost everything we're talking about are new technologies at this time. This, this strikes me as something that it never hurts to emphasize to that mid-19th century print, uh, you know, photography are I mean, it's a it's a visual revolution in terms of, in terms of media, um, and I also think it would be good because it's a, it, it may make interesting links to the present and the whole issue that you raised about unskilled uh, or low skilled labor and exploitation of labor, uh, which we are very well aware that a lot of the new media companies are are, are guilty of, and indeed the new media companies in, in that period of time were guilty as well. And finally, in terms of that, um, I also wondered if there are certain institutions that would allow, that do show, this is pretty much tied to what Barbara said also, that institutions that might be, provide illustrations and additional information that were not specific to, let's say, like Harper's, for example, or, uh, or, uh, or the lithography. What, what I mean, for example, is thinking particularly in terms of women's labor and the difficulty of finding a location. And one possibility is, Cooper Union. The Cooper Union um, at that time had a uh, women's uh, art and design school, which was run actually by a former Frank Leslie's uh, art supervisor um, and former chartist. And, uh, but I raise it because not only are there illustrations of that, but part of the reason that was created was specifically because it was, it was supposed to be a benevolent institution to protect women who they knew 
uh, were indeed working in these areas and needed perhaps a, a middle, uh, an intermediary to, to, labor, to negotiate fees and so on and so forth. That didn't mean that they were particularly paid well. But I raise that as there are other in, uh, related institutions in New York in the mid and late 19th century uh, and certainly Gilded Age that could provide additional information. But I, I really thought this is a terrific project and, um, and I learned a lot. Thank you. Great. So um, I guess what we'll do now is we'll open up questions to the larger gallery. And um, if they are for the students, we'll have a person who feels most representative of their group um, come up uh, and answer questions uh, here. Uh, Following a little bit of what you were saying, one of the things I noticed you almost completely lack of is any reference to literary sources. Let me give you one. <laughs> you need to see some of I mean, there's, there was a ritual of pouring tea, for example. And it's not, there are a tremendous number of period sources on how it was done. And, and doing it in a way that gives it real authenticity, even, even the use of lighting of the mid 19th century parlor is something that we're totally unused to. We're used to light with flux, not so bad. I would say, responding to that, that in the first semester of this project, because this, there is a group of us students who have been working on this project since last semester, in the very early stages, we were like throwing out all sorts of ideas <laughs> like this. Like, yeah. okay, if we have mannequins, if we have different <laughs> points of view that you would walk through the gallery from this, like, um, you know, mm -hmm. member of society, or you're a patrician, or you're a working class person. So we really played a lot with all of these ideas, and I think one of our biggest constraints in the exhibition space is it's like a 20 foot by 20 foot. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a tiny thing. So while it would be great and that's something that we've really thought about, all of these experiences from the sounds mm -hmm. to the smells to the lighting, mm -hmm. um, part of the problem is really the space constraint. I'm not saying you have to actually yeah. act in yeah. space, but you can digitize that. Yeah. Um, you don't even have to hire actors. <laughs> you know, I think one of the one of the the uh, Hannah hits on one of the great points of the focus gallery projects is that they're they're forcibly restrictive yeah. and and the students go through these projects and and we tend to uh, fit a lot in there and the digital interactives give us a possibility to expand that a lot and then it forces us to ask the questions you're asking like yeah. well how do you explain the lack you know and what you weren't able to do and how do you how do you modulate those um, things and that's one of the biggest challenges. But let me throw back to the to Barbara and Josh, um, both in the exhibit space and uh, in the um, digital components, the whole issue of uh, immersive experiential experiences, because we have thought, and we haven't really finished yet, with the idea of, let's say, sound. I think the web developers we've been talking to 
think they said they didn't like the idea of using sound in a really small space like that because you well, the, the exhibition designer will say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I mean that is a question about evoking noise, evoking voices. We also talked about you know voiceovers, whether Whitman's you know the smell thing was at the museum. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, there's, yes, there's the whole there's forest too. and newer issue. Uh, two. Sleighs um, sliding on snow <laughs> across the gallery floors. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but maybe the the more specific question is other senses, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and then the larger question is more experiential because that's definitely something that we keep using all of us involved but haven't really figured out exactly what we mean by that in terms of how that might work. And we haven't really done that much with that. You know, it's sort of, there, there's a case, of course, of too much, mm -hmm. which, is, which is the Barnum music problem of, do we hire someone to play really bad music and <laughs> make this out? Yeah, and there's just the question of what, you know, when I first met David, the early days at the museum, yeah. The, the then director, who was the one who wanted there to be smells, I'm just saying that it was suppressed. Um, but it, it took a lot of curatorial hours to not have this happen. Um, but beyond that, he would talk a lot about transporting visitors to the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, well, but the visitors are going to be, this is how old I am, in the 20th century. And there's something to being aware that I'm in a different place looking at people who are not me. And that's what the discipline of history in some ways is doing. It is making a connection. It is understanding that there are connections and getting interested in these other people's lives. But it's not just about this feeling. I kept thinking he was suggesting we would all feel what it was like to be on an 18th century farm somehow. And I thought, nobody wants to feel that. You know, I mean, it's like, and, and, and so you could kind of fool yourself into thinking that, you know, mm. this is what it's like. And I think in some ways it's, it's it, there's a fine line because, yeah, you do want evocative, you do yeah. want that sense of the, there was this, we're, we're reminding you there was this kind of world, but we're not trying to duplicate it in a kind of colonial Williamsburg yeah. Disney. Because, first of all, we'll yeah. never do it as well as they do it. And second of all, they don't do it very well. You know, they, they do it by making a fiction out of things. So I think, you know, you could imagine something like if you wanted to evoke, I mean, part of what's interesting about the walk down Broadway, and I, I don't know what I really think you should do with that, but in some ways, you know, it's not as if people come in and they're suddenly in 1850. So in a way, they're walking back in time, too. And, and you know, it's people, we have a lot of people at the museum who would say, well, you would have this nice kind of subliminal shifting of sounds from mm -hmm. the modern and mechanical to the less so and the clip cup of horses hooves and stuff. And that's great if you've got lots of money to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's some made and I, yeah. we can, I can look in the files. But it's also <laughs> a good question of just how, you know, where, what are you actually asking people to do? And, um, you know, when are you setting up something that they're going to ignore? Yeah, I would just say that um, it's going to be, uh, I actually have no doubt you could easily, relatively easily, because there are enough sound libraries, yeah. construct mm -hmm. something together, except it's going to be a fiction, as, as you yeah. raised it, and it'll be yet one other thing you're going to unpack. It's says, well, we're trying to evoke this, but this isn't necessarily how it sounded. We don't right. know, I mean, right? it's going to be a fiction. Yeah. 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 Right, so it's an excuse. Uh, I, first, I'd like to commend the students. I thought it was terrific. Um, and what, what you'll learn is that uh, the people, when people are commenting on what you've done, uh, there's the, the cheap and easy way is just to talk about what you've left out. And I'm cheap and easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, again, frighteningly, since before you lot were even born, I've been, <laughs> I've, been trying to, I've been trying to get New Yorkers to include African Americans in their story, not as some segregated... I always loved the fact that the New York Public Library had the Amsterdam News up at the Schomburg and not down on 42nd yeah. Street, which, again, the people you want to be reading the Amsterdam News are not the people who go up there, it's the people who are writing about the Guardia <laughs> or whatever you who are using the 42nd Street mm -hmm. Library. So I'm going to talk a bit about this because you're talking about Broadway, and Broadway 
in the 19th century, it was an African-American site too. Uh, and they're the ones who are walking up and down. There's a wonderful mm. account from some guy who had an idle hour on a Sunday morning on Broadway, and he counted the number of African-Americans who walked past him on Broadway, and it was over a thousand in an hour. And it's that many people who are literally dressing up and are walking up and down mm -hmm. on display. And so it was only 20 people, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, can, you can be the optimist or the pessimist. The numbers are just, you just sort of read this. Shit, I can't believe that. Uh, uh, but it is an African American site, too. Um, and, they're, uh, and they're in these, a lot of these pictures. And Right, and some of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something I think you can, uh, could, could, should be. Sure should be drawn out in, in, in some way, uh, shape, or form. Uh, and I, I think it should be integrated into the, that New York story. So uh, you'll, if you carry on, you'll hear a lot of what you've left out of comments. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. I was yeah. just going to say, I think part of it, too, is that it is going to be expanded. So yeah. we personally were given the freedom to choose essay topics on our personal interests. This is the first round. Um, we're just trying to get started. So I think pointing out holes, pointing out um, parts of the city that haven't been mentioned, that over time, that will definitely mm -hmm. be filled in. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something to clarify too. I, we've kind of mentioned it, but I haven't said specifically. The, the goal and the design of the digital publication is that David is likely to teach further classes and that the back end will be easy enough to use that subsequent classes will be able to add through a CMS and other material, and it will just appear on the digital publication. So it's very much a, 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 a tool with a life. Um, and so that, that leads to what Virginia's saying, and that hopefully we'll cover everything at some point. <laughs> Mm -hmm. people were there. Yeah. They were on Broadway, they were over on Church, they're, you know, they're, they're there. And once again, it's this invisibility mm -hmm. of this very important group, a dominant group of people who are working, who are working for individuals, who have, you know, are traveling far and wide, who live in the neighborhood and have been there for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be really egregious of you not to show them when you start right. You open it up with a yeah. splash. And, and you know, be go behind, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, because here's what Harper's will show you. Yeah. Yeah, who's and in then, the back and alley? And, and, and then there's more. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Catherine, and then? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I, a couple, two different things. Like, first of all, it's, it's really exciting to see how this project is grown. I'm here at BBC and I've seen some of the earlier iterations, and I'm really impressed uh, with what David and Ron and all the students, what, what you've done. I wanted to respond to this earlier discussion about you know incorporating other senses and kind of other components of, of life on Broadway. And it, it seemed to me that going back, is is it still called visualizing New York, David? Is that uh, the yeah. <laughs> Think so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. It seems to me that it's really about we're talking about vision and the importance, the privileging of vision, yeah, that's right? True. During hmm. the that's true. time period. That's like an important part of the photography. Yes, no, print. that's true. Okay. So seems to me these questions are things like smell, it isn't, and you have actual smell, but it's about the representation of smell, and how is smell visualized, right? And I also mm. like this comment about text, it's about um, a text that relies on essentially creating a visual image in your mind of walking around, so that maybe it's this question of imagery that then becomes a way to think about what are these aspects of these other modes of experience that you want to address, but it's always going to be this layer because it's through this representation that's visually oriented, whether it's mm. textual or, mm. or, or whatever. Okay, that was one part. <laughs> um, but my other question was really for the students, like what happened along the way that you just didn't expect? I mean, what, these things are very, <laughs> stuff happens. And I want to hear more about your experiences and you know what, what light bulbs went off and what things, <laughs> or what things didn't work, right? Yeah, it was bad too. <laughs> yeah. I Be wrote an essay I've been working on Anthony Syracuse, and one of my essays is on the science of optics in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. So, which in the period, 
decades after it was invented and distributed on Broadway, people still didn't understand, um, even at that time. So, uh, but tying that into all of their essays and into this New Yorkness and this week, mm -hmm. it was a challenge for me. So I think maybe with everyone too, trying to take our personal ideas and these unique essays and then, but knowing that it's going into this larger collection We all kind of came up with our own ideas, and then seeing those themes manifest from that. We wrote our individual essays, we did that tag cloud, and then we were narrowing it down. So in a way, mm -hmm. through that process of narrowing what the themes were, it gave us another opportunity to talk about, like, well, what are you really writing about when you're talking about John Foxman? What is that bigger thing? Um, so for me, it was like productive to work collaboratively with other students to like, as a part of my thought process as well, and as a, as a part of the refining process at multiple like, And also to build up what I just said, the thematic connections mm -hmm. that came across in our essays and in our in object descriptions that we were writing that we weren't expecting to come across. So from this sort of tag cloud and other elements like that, um, we were able to find pieces of essays linked that we never, we didn't initially think could, especially because in a sense, these were topics that we chose on our own and perhaps a little arbitrarily because they fit our own interests within the scheme of 19th century New York. And we didn't necessarily expect to find those connections. And I think they, they will come across in the essays. If students are being overly modest. Um, <laughs> in a number of <laughs> ways, because they produced more elaborate presentations than what you saw. Um, these really elaborate um, PowerPoints, which we then shared on a wiki, which we were using um, with the web developers, folks who are actually going to produce the um, three digital components. And the developers just actually showed us um, the wireframes, their first visions of um, how these might work. Uh, and they were very close in yeah. uh, to what the students had designed and suggested. Um, almost too much so uh, in the reactions because we were all like, wow, that looks sort of just like two weeks ago what we were thinking about. And now we've actually moved to a slightly different uh, place. But that's what we gave them to look at and they really picked up on. So that's another collaboration uh, that's really significant. I think thinking of the frustrations, again, you're, you're not being um, open enough in some ways, is that um, you know, this is tied to a course, course sequence, and we're almost at the end of the semester, but the exhibit opens in September, and a lot of things are going to happen, I, I'm told, between now um, and next September 18th when this opens, and I think it's frustrating um, for everyone involved, you know, and I do consider these sort of co-curators because they are not going to be as involved, and, and I think that's the frustration of leaving one's work and not seeing the last, more than the last chapter. Um, but that's true in any collaboration, people come in and out. But. Stephen, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I want to I follow up that last collaboration, but, which is kind of my search and in question. I'll just throw out a, a digital harm response. And, 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 and both Barbara and um, Josh mentioned this already, but I think it really is an important part of it. There's got to be some movement here. The reification of individual places within a city is, is you know, I, we talked about this over and over today. Is in some ways a fundamental distortion of what a city is. Um, and I think maybe to go beyond poking and suggesting questions, one of the most obvious, there, we've already talked today about two ways in which you can actually get a sense of people coming and going from the places. Um, one of those is the transportation and public transportation and what kinds of things travel up and down the roads that you're on. If a Broadway, there's a wealth of information on the public transport and other options that people have that you could add in that immediately give you a, gives you a sense of people moving through the spaces. And then the other one is residence. You know, where do the people in these businesses live? Um, and particularly in 19th century New York, chances are that that's not, or at least some of them, not very far away from where they're working. 
I'm um, apparently for some of those smaller businesses, it probably literally is above where they're working, mm -hmm. in different ways for the smaller businesses than for the bigger enterprises. Um, mm -hmm. You can certainly do that for your entrepreneurs, you may even be able to do it for some of your workers, mm -hmm. and in a very crude sense, that gives you a sense of where they're coming to, from when they at least come, come to work. And I think maybe the, I agree with I, I, the point on visualising as, as the trophy, I think, is really well taken. The one thing, though, in terms of, and I have no idea whether this is kind of what you do for the exhibitions in this space or not, but otherwise, but given that this is an exhibition in a lot of ways about things that happen on the street in order to draw people into interior spaces, I would think it's blindingly obvious that there has to be something on the street to draw people into this exhibit, even if it's only a sandwich board or something else yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I've, I've walked twice today past Abe Lincoln on the steps of the you know, Historical <laughs> Society. We're getting more and more used to places intruding back onto the street again. Mm -hmm. And I think that this exhibition just yeah, screams a out yeah. for a visual <laughs> presence on the street barring the legality mm -hmm. or illegality. Maybe even someone in a sandwich board, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where you play some of your sounds. Maybe that's where you yeah. play <laughs> 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 kind of thing, but the whole trope that you're talking about is, and maybe it's got to be visual, the whole trope is about something on the street versus what's inside, and I think that that's going to have to be done. I, I, that, that's the digital hard part. My question, and, and, and what, what David just said makes me even a little bit more maybe concerned about this, is about web development and the platform that this is going to be built on and the extent to which that's been part of the work that's done up till now. Um, I probably wouldn't have asked this question a year ago, but nine months into running the Centre for History and New Media, <coughs> no one here would ever imagine starting a project like this without deciding on an appropriate tool and designing what was going to happen in conjunction with the sense of what the tool does and doesn't do um, and the choices that it allows you to make and not make. And I'm kind of curious about this. Clearly this has been parceled out to web developers and that's fine, nobody does everything. And, and you shouldn't have to. But I'm, I'm a little curious about how, whatever the platform is, and I can't work out what it is from what anybody said, mm -hmm. um, and as a member of the Centre of History and Media, I've been pumped for an Omega-based installation, pretty obvious, <laughs> which works pretty well for exhibits. But I'm kind of curious about what the platform is and to what extent it's been part, you know, to what extent the students have been aware of it in designing and how far it's been a factor going into it. And I didn't say what I meant to say at the beginning, which is I thought that these student pre presentations were tremendous. Yeah. They were incredibly thoughtful. They reflected all the kinds of thinking that we want to see going into these projects mm -hmm. and that often we don't see going into projects created by paid professionals. Um, so you should all think Thank about, I think <laughs> David and everybody else here has every right to be extremely proud of the work that you've done. I think it's extremely, extremely impressive. Um, anyway. What about the um, I'll let Cal. <laughs> I, I can answer those questions. So, uh, I purposely don't let them think about a lot. Some of those questions at the outset, we we think about web frameworks and and web paradigms. But the idea is to think creatively and experimentally about what they would want an ideal experience to be. Right. So we start from that kind of design prototype idea, partially because uh, you know one thing we preach here at the BGC is that our students are overwhelmed with work at a kind of a content level and we're not setting out to make this a media arts program and and a lot of the time spending between like well this is Omeka, this is Drupal, this is so straight you know we don't want to immerse them in that too early we want their creative juices to get flowing because we're layering that on top of all the intellectual work they have to do anyway um, and for some students it's actually very foreign that kind of creative process um, and so I want that to I want that to prosper um, but then there really is the the place where the reality you know hits and, and they've been well aware that everything they do can be vetoed by the functionality and problems that we might run into. Um, and that's something we reiterate over and over again, that there's an experimental process and then there's a very real developmental process in which the DNA of their work will be greatly under, uh, taken into consideration, but that we have to deal with the kind of the fineries of what will be maximized um, working with the developers. Um, 
the interactives we've done so far have been based on web-based technologies, um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, very open, MySQL, PHP databases. Um, the ones so far have been custom made because they've made for a specific screen for, uh, but then also web functional. So you can go into a web page and get to that interactive, um, but they, they are made for a specific screen and that's been the mandate of the way we've worked with the curators. This project we initially thought we would try to do with Omeka, um, but Omeka does not have kind of the high end functionality to do a lot of the um, responsive design and work. So it looks like we're going to be working with WordPress or Drupal. Um, and those are conversations that I'm, I can have very well uh, with the developers and, and that David is a part of too, understanding um, these things. And so it's about making sure that we, in, involve the students in that process and that they understand those systems and the developers have been in class twice now um, so they get to know them and talk with them um, but not to overburden them with all those awful back-end um, things that um, would at this point in their involvement kind of put a stricture on their creativity um, so and some students work more with me on other projects and get to learn more about that stuff um, but not necessarily in all instances I mean I appreciate it I mean, I, and I absolutely understand why you do that I, I do not under, however think that really bringing those things you know, creativity is about working with the tools, not entirely apart from the tools. And, mm -hmm. and I've been down that road as well. And you know, and I, and I think that you've got to find, as as you just, I think, really articulately said, you've got to find the balance between, yeah. you know, being creative and being limited by your tools. But mm -hmm. I think there is a there's a point of synergy between those two where you've got to cross from one into the other and try and marry the two things together. And, that, and that leaving that in the hands of developers, I think, is a, you know, I mean, it might be cleaner and easier. And it also it d yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, an earlier version of this project, which you didn't talk about, like two, three years ago, was anyone so, um, involved in that? Um, even so, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and Sarah wasn't either. Um, um, th we did a BGC NYPL co digital exhibit collaboration where we went every other week to one of the reading rooms to actually look at the maps and look at the um, uh, rare books. And then we used Omeka. Uh, really to sort of build this digital exhibit, which you can find on the web at Visualizing 19th Century New York. Um, so we didn't, we didn't use Omeka. We were thinking about no, using... No, but we used it in the fall to... We use it to do prototypes, yeah, and then the yeah, students that's, that's weren't true. able to visually express yeah. enough, and the students oh. ended to spend the next semester hand coding and hand processing yeah. all of the images yeah. and building the website. Yeah. And then we've been asked by people, what developer did we hire? And I said, the eight students who were in the class. So it depends on the model. See, part of the problem with this class is that we didn't have a discussion with the developers about what the ideal platform would be until two days ago. Um, and they're almost done with their semester. So th there's no use essentially. Right, like, but that's Stevens. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. That's actually a problematic model. I mean, I, if, you know, I'm not saying that the, the unleashing of creativity thing is a bad idea. I think it's a really good idea. But I don't think you can run that far through the course without bringing in the developers and the tools. And the yeah, people. no, I think so there are different models, models and I yeah, guess I, I would ar a, articulate. Yeah, a blurring um, I mean, I think that's the reality of how these projects are produced. And um, in some ways, I think that the um, create and hand over model is a problematic model going forward, just as, and I'm speaking from very much from experience here at Digital Harlem, customized things are really problematic going forward in terms of sustainability. Um, yeah. Digital Harlem is fundamentally handicapped by the fact that the person who built it has been at Angkor Wat in Cambodia for about the last six years. <laughs> and as you, every single fix we do on that site, somebody else has to work out what the hell he did. Um, and most of the time they can't. Um, and, you know, for whatever benefits you get from the customizable, you lose in an absolutely yeah. very fast way to the you know, to sustainability and upgrades. And, and, you know, the vision yeah. of making this an iterative project is bang on. I mean, yeah. that's one of the huge advantages of the digital, not up for the <coughs> not class projects that are that That's that's the model that, that I absolutely produce. But if that's what you want to do, yeah. no. you can't afford to get two customizable. Sure. No guarantee yeah. Really no, that's a different. The next class. Um, I think the other thing we should indicate is, although there's a new media symposium, probably the bulk of the work, maybe 70 to 30 percent, is physical exhibit, digital components. So the students have, right, that's a sort of collective term here, um, um, have really worked on the object list for much of the fall because loan requests had to go out a few months ago. Um, we then worked on, they've written all the label copy uh, for all 33 objects as well as some of the we're actually not doing labels for the repros selecting repros we picked then 120 digital assets uh, for 
different parts of which then moves into the digital. Um, and so there's been you know, a lot of work both on the physical exhibit that will open in September as well as the digital. Um, so they've been involved in, in both parts, and that's important. Jessica, you've been waiting. Um, so a big theme of the whole thing we're looking at today has been that you know, the digital advances in everybody's projects, the research, you know, trying to answer questions, you know, the larger thesis. Um, so I'd love to just hear the students you know, talk some more about how all of these digital components advance their understanding um, of the topic that they were studying. <laughs> Is your name you just say someone who's asked that question all the time? That is the million dollar question. Whenever <laughs> <laughs> you do a digital project at this particular moment where people remain unconvinced, that's the question you're always going to be asked. What difference does the digital make? And there are a lot of, you know, I realize that there are many things that you're getting out of it, like learning the skills and collaboration, and there are many, but, you know, I was just curious about the other. <laughs> I don't mean to keep talking. But <laughs> in both semesters thinking about math. And like I really started looking at a lot of Google Maps and people laying data on Google Maps and thinking about what did that mean? How do I interact with maps and how does my experience of interacting with the Google Map make me look at a 19th century map in a different way? I kept every time I looked at a map I'd want to find where my house was on the map. Mm -hmm. And so when I started thinking about the exhibition is what I wanted was to break away from that, to not just keep trying to find my house on every map of 19th century New York and say, oh, it used to be, you know, swamp land. You know, and so I think that being, doing digital projects makes you look at objects, makes you look at images, mm -hmm. and when we're thinking from material culture and visual culture, look at objects in a different way and really think about how they're operating because you're operating with them too. You're making arguments through these things. We were, mm -hmm. we're trying to make an argument I think it made me a more critical observer of that information from the past. So that's like my very specific answer about you know, it heightens your visual perception in a different way than the digital one. I would agree with that. Uh, in working on the Picasso and uh, intersection, we were really interested in drawing people's attention to the small details of the images that you really uh, would kind of pass over if you were just looking at it. So I wanted to move us on to, since John actually had his hand up, um, <laughs> um, uh, the next thing we're going to do is to kind of bring all of the panelists from the day up um, to kind of open up the, t yes, the, the, I wanted to invite John and, yeah, yeah, and Stephen to come and join us up here as well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not all, like, we, we got like five seats. <laughs> um, and for if there are other questions about the, um, you're not all. up um, our Mr. Guest, <laughs> my uh, piece of paper here. Um, would you like to join us?
sir. Um, Daniel Bluestone is professor and director of the Historic Preservation Program at the University of Virginia School of Architecture. He loves cities, maps, and historic buildings. Do you want to come around? Um, writes award-winning books, has been teaching in Iraq, and serves as garden and landscape fellow at Harvard University's Dumbart Oaten Oaks. And uh, he's already asked a couple, a couple of really great provocative questions, so he's kind of semi-introduced himself to the conversation. Um, I, I actually, I want to make a few comments, okay? okay. Yeah, that's a great one, okay. sir. Thank you. Um, the, the, the place that I've been slotted into the program is this one that jumps between the morning sessions and the afternoon sessions. And, and since we're talking about visualizing the visual, I'm supposed to be commenting on the comment commentators. <laughs> Very meta. And, and yeah. so, so we, can, we can do that. But it, it strikes me that um, this has been a great day. And I'm someone who's actually spent uh, my career working with groups of students doing community projects that start with deep research and visualization and then end up as museum exhi exhibitions, as guidebooks, as websites. And so I come into this with a studied eye for the work that was presented here today, and I admire it um, very much. And I want to try to link the morning, some of the morning presentations with some um, of the things that have popped up in the afternoon. And that is, it strikes me that, that the purpose of doing this, and, and you just said we were trying to make an argument, and I'm still not quite sure what the argument is that you're trying to make, and, um, but I think you've raised a bunch of great stuff, and, and this goes back to the comment about narrative. It strikes me that the overall goal of this class of this kind of work, of the presentations that you saw this morning, are to introduce a level of deeper seeing for people that live in the city today or visit the city today, that you want to help people forge this attachment to place into critically understanding their place in this place and its relationship to history why do you do that? Not for antiquarian love of the city, but for wanting to um, have a better city in the future. And I think that it, that's uh, come up with a few of the comments that people have made. So I want to try to go into that by looking at some of the um, uh, way in which things bump back and forth. And this will be a combination of maybe high-level um, thoughts about this and incredibly minute details. Where are the residents of Anne and Broadway? Has anyone invited them to be with us today? Yes? Um, you know, there are people that live within, within a, you know, a block of that, of that um, street. It would be great, certainly when you get to your exhibition, for you to figure out how to invite the community because they ought to be part of your constituency. They ought to be the ones who you're doing this work for, I think. And, and that's just a minor way of saying that. Sure, uh, Mayor de Blasio lives near that intersection and I trust that he'll be invited. But there are other, <laughs> resi there are other residents um, as well. And this notion of narrative is partly a notion of the way in which we make sense of the world that we occupy. And I think that that was what was so um, uh, wonderful about the presentations this, this morning. And this is a way that I would begin to link some of, of that, the conclusions. And Stephen stole my, my thunder on this. Stephen wants you to focus on transportation and people moving around. Well, guess what? Let's look at a few things when you go behind the scenes. And I don't know how that theme came up, but it's an interesting one. Let, there are things that don't show up in the cartouches of the drips map, right? And you're trying to put those on the table. You shouldn't wipe out the existing cartouches. You want adjacent cartouches. So we can go back and forth between them and understand what the way in which the city was visualized back then and the way in which just inside those cartouches, a second layer, okay? So we can see and understand that part of the new way of looking at the city is actually a way of looking at the city where race and ethnicity and class is more front and center than it was when that map was produced, okay? 
If you follow the industrial development when you peel away and take advantage of Harper's, and by the way, 20 years after that Harper's print was made, and this goes to Barbara's point, that, that image is unthinkable because corporate America was beginning to get so tussled by labor and organizing issues that the last thing they wanted to show was they wanted to show trademarks and brands. The last thing they wanted to show was people working and, and to have you imagining um, that. So that's a historically specific and centered um, image. But once you've peeled it away, let's follow this tra the, what's going on in those factories all the way through. Where did the supplies come from? This goes to Eric's talk this morning, right? Where did the inputs, you know, in every industrial scene, you ought to be able to say, what are the inputs, what are the outputs, and what's the, what are the byproducts, okay? Well, where did they come from in New York and around the globe? And for you to begin, that little bucket, this is, this is Eric's narrative for you, that little bucket that was being filled, what did you say was going in there? Yeah, nitrogen. Where did it, it didn't end up in that bucket. Where did it end up? So, so you can begin to understand our the tax that we've made on the resource base and the pollution that we've engaged in in turning out those middle class books and and um, daguerreotypes and all the rest, right? So, a simple question: What went in? You have a really good handle on what the process was. What was the product? You're pretty good at that. What are the byproducts? And think about the way in which you can spatialize that. That begins getting at Stephen's notion of movement because you can turn th that image and that treatment into a network of the entire city, right? Transportation, um, uh, commerce. And then I really do want you to dig deep and find out where a few of those employees, and this goes back to the digital Harlem image, right? Is where, where did the people working in those buildings live? And how did they get to work? And you start being able to take advantage of the incredible complexity of this city and the way in which people and goods and ideas circulate in space, right? And you can do that. Right now, you have those people kind of contained in that. I want to see you take that and explode it into a map and into a, a cartography that literally begins to map that and reveal that. And I think that could be done very well. The, the notion of putting adjacent cartouches is that might start letting us know what the argument is. You know, part of the argument is, well, in the way in which history has been narrated, including the way the self-depiction of the boosters that created the DRIPS map, is there was one New York. And you know there's a lot more complexity and there's a lot more, you know. If you put the cartouches, your cartouches and the existing ones next to each other, it begins creating tension that helps you build your argument, right? So don't wipe them out. Let them go side by side. Um, there's the, there's the Mark Twain letter, I believe. I'm sorry this letter is so long. If I had more time, it would be shorter, right? <laughs> All right? And I suspect you did this for your, for your object list of things in the exhibition. You now have to do it for your website. Having, saying words like, this image depicts, when the image is right there, just start talking about the image. It isn't this image depicts. I know that, that David's you know, pushing you to be visually conscious and so you want to treat it as an image. And yet, it's an image on a website on a page in front of you. You don't need to say this image depicts. You need to say, or by this decade, or as a result of. That was a few that I just grabbed. Every one of your online vignettes can be 50% shorter at minimum. And you need to all roll up your sleeves and, and go whoosh, like that, because you're going to lose a lot of people by, if you don't do that. You know, you want to be as economical as possible. You have the general idea, now you need to do this. This person here, if you enlist her, is one of the most brilliant uh, <laughs> caption writers in America and, and could show you how to do that, because that kind of caption writing will work for your site. I think it's incredibly important.
If I had more time, it would be shorter, and I think you should try to, to um, try to do that. On the image of Anne and Broadway, and this uh, this is where I'll stop at least for the moment. <laughs> the oldest thing in the in the image is what? Is what? St. Paul's. I think most of you would agree, right, with that. He's he's totally wrong about that. The oldest thing in, in that image is the space. No, not geology, the width of the street. You know, in, in, or you could say, yes, it was geology before it was a street. But the oldest thing in that whole section of the city is that, is that people decided to lay a street grid. And you have great images of that in your online. That's the oldest thing down there. It's older than St. Paul's. It's older than any of the buildings you have. And you ought to find a way to talk about and refer to the fact that here we are in the 21st century using a street system that was laid out and the basic parameters of it were established in, what, the 17th century for parts of that or maybe the 18th century? But you, you should you know, there's been a lot of discussion about spatializing history and visualizing the space. Well, there it is. You're looking at it, and it's true. That's a platform. It's a venue for the enactment of this incredibly rich life that you've portrayed. But you've got to deal with what the dimensions of the space are, and that someone laid that out, and here we are still using it. And that's the constant thing in that. And to the extent that it's not constant, it's because of a really dicey kind, kind of process of condemning land and spreading the street out just a little bit. But I think to deal that, that I think it would be fascinating to try to deal with, um, uh, with the um, space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do we have I think your points are very well taken, and I've been thinking this the whole time. And I, uh, well, I'll, I'll speak on a couple things um, that I have been working on specifically that related to that. But firstly, for everyone, the economy of words in the interactives and and the captions themselves. I think it's it's a hard thing, and that's something we're definitely been struggling with. And we're going to we, we are continuing to work on that because the the content is not done by any stretch. No. <laughs> no, and our and that's another that's another uh, procedural experience that they go through is that um, uh, our the head of the focus project, um, Professor Ivan Gaskell, came and talked to them about the challenge of wall labels and and they, this work all goes through a whole process and so they'll see their work um, even once they hand it over, kind of digest it yeah. down and yeah. um, so. But it's really, I mean, it's it's a it's worth, take a shot at it. Though. It's worth doing it. Don't yeah. get someone to do it because when right. you're doing it, I mean, there's always the editor who. Will come and mess with you but and, and, and one hopes improve you but um, you know the doing it makes you think harder about what you really are saying here what's what's I, I'm not using all this kind of language which makes it sound like I'm saying something I gotta actually say something and that's really hard and scary but yeah. you can do it what's, what's really interesting also about the Broadway and space that was actually formerly an Indian trail so this is oh. the oldest intersections in the city, which is, you know, I'm, I'm sure not all of our content came across, but, you know, we had, you know, all, the, all of the feedback that you gave us, it was like, yes, we do want to do the interiors, yes, we're going to do that, and, and we did, and then we cut it down, and now we have a context, yeah, yeah. So we're going to cut down, you know, so part of the, sort of, our specific group challenge, I think a lot of the other students have similar experiences, but are sort of highlighted it, because we're like, okay, let's do this, Broadway Man, wait, why didn't we do Broadway at Fulton, wait, mm -hmm. why don't we just do Barnum's Museum? So as we sort of made different iterations of this product over time, you know, we did leave out the interiors. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting that so much, so much of the feedback was so on target with a lot of the work that we, you know, not, not you know, some of them are, of course, new ideas, but that we really thought about and mm -hmm. we tried to incorporate and we had to cut out. And, that, you know, part of this process, you know, whenever we present here at Digital Media, media Salons, mm -hmm. it's, you know, about the process, not only the end result, which again, right. we don't have yet, mm -hmm. um, because you go through so many iterations. So that's really, you know, in a way you confirm our thought processes by having these questions. The, 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 one, the one, I'm sorry, the, the, one, the one thing that might confirm that is if you, and I don't know if you, as a group you've done this, 
what's what's the thing that you most want to get across with your exhibition? And again, my thought was that you want New Yorkers to look with greater complexity at their world. But if if you can't set that down succinctly, it's very hard then to make the decision about what should be in or what should be out. Be kind of because you ought to drive it toward that. Can I just come out of that? Because in some ways I agree with all of that on one hand, and on the other hand I completely disagree. Because in some ways the notion that you must trim down yeah. is inherently at odds with the digital age in which we work. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, we, somebody, uh, when I was having coffee, re referenced Janet Murray's book, Hamlet on the Holodeck, mm -hmm. which is a very early account of the possibilities of digital media, which uses what I still think is the, one of the most powerful analogies for thinking about what's going on here, which is the early age of film. You know, in the very first films, they parked the camera in front of a theatre stage and ran it. And all they got, they got these things called photo plays that are in no way movies. They started making movies when they took it off the tripod. They started to work out they could zoom it and pan it and move it around and do all of these things with it that let them make something other than movies of plays. And we get, we, and I had this conversation as well about hypertext and linking and, and, and the way that we haven't grappled with this. We're still pointing the computer at exhibits and, and saying, okay, this digital exhibit is going to be constrained in exactly the same way the physical exhibit is, but it's not the physical exhibit. Now that doesn't mean that you can write sloppily <laughs> and that you can take an extra 300 words to make the same point. But I think at least one of the things that the digital has to involve is thinking about what you can do there that you can't do. The constraints that you don't have to face. Now you're doing interactives in the museum as a crossover and, and that's a different kind of project entirely and one that I think is actually really important. But beyond that, I think that one of the actual challenges of using the digital is not to make it a, you know, a facsimile of what you're doing otherwise, that actually there is conceivably the place where you can take off with what you've had to cut out, Cause, because you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that you got to all these things and then had to leave them out. And for the exhibit that you're doing, that makes perfect sense. But if but, you... But, you know, for to go back to what Zahava said, you know, she's talking about the digital publication too, and and one thing we can't do when we start doing digital projects is throw off the practice of good writing, right? A lot of no, it is I, like I actually put the in. It's not about good writing, but it's about the topics that you're leaving out. Oh, we wanted to do interiors, but we couldn't. Well, that's not about good writing. It's about actually. No. Yeah. But it's yeah. fair to them, but it's about what they could do in a yeah. semester. Yeah. I mean, and, like, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm not criticising them for doing that. That's the process. But I'm saying that fundamentally I think that the starting point is an issue. The digital doesn't have to fit, be a facsimile of what you're doing in another constraint. If the const the con it's not about the good writing. It's not about, you know, this is the reality of what their digital publication is. They're doing what you're telling them to do within the constraints of the, you know, the assignments and the classes and the curriculum they're working in. But I think there's something fundamentally wrong about taking the constraints that we work as and other things and making that the absolute boundaries of what we do in the digital. Now, we're not at a point, and we've talked about this in other contexts, where there's a, you know, we've somehow completely shared what we do outside the digital and the digital. You know, exhibits are, in fact, I think a really intriguing form of the digital because they have offline lives as well as online lives. And the fact that you're working with interactives in your physical exhibit and then thinking about them online, I think is a really rich way to go. But I think, Stepping one's taste belong this. If this is something that's going to have a life online, it's a strange kind of thing that will outlast the physical exhibit while still being constrained by the physical exhibit <laughs> that, that gave birth. You know. Oh, so I think, yeah. you know, this actually wasn't it wasn't a critique of the students, but it's a real critique of where we situate the digital and the way we insist on pointing the camera at our exhibit and saying that's all you're going to be able to do in the digital. Well, well, I'm um, oh, sorry. That's okay. Thank you so much for it. But I'm also thinking that um, in this day and age, for both the physical exhibition and the digital online, people want to do things. We're talking about the, there's interactives, but and yeah, it's we're discovering things that you want us to discover. But what can you? What are you asking of your visitors to do? They're expecting to become a part of this experience. They want to think, they want to do something, they mm -hmm. want to be asked to deliver something later, and I'm not sure that I 
heard that or you know that it's there and again it could be constraints of time with classes and assignments and all but I think that that would be a very I mean you're doing groundbreaking stuff here so why not go there too and make sure that you're inviting the public yeah. in to really have a real mapping and experiencing New York and so you know this idea of I mean it feels kind of neat and and sterile a little bit and you know, this was madness. This was create chaos down on Broadway, and you know we should be able to feel that and see that mm -hmm. and be able to add to that in so many a multitude of ways. And so maybe that comes with the extension and the expansion of things. But the hint of that should, I think, if that is something that you can give to your audiences, it should come at the you know in the opening for sure. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you is if you. You may have mentioned this, but um, the, the the tension between the the mappers of the day, the cartographers, you know, the drips, the surveyors. I I mean, I think that's a fascinating story. All these guys are out there, you know, surveying and trying to one up each other with their maps and all. And I and and, and I think that that's a really great kind of story and entree. Why are people so you know into creating these maps? And some are doing it as art, some of them are doing it as informational, some are doing it for a variety of reasons, but there's a real, you know, uh, you know, they're poking their chests out and they're really trying to uh, uh, build their reputations and all, and I'm not sure that, I think that mm -hmm. that would add a la layer of excitement to the um, conversation and presentation. David? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to hear all this um, because, um, you know, this focus gallery project is a sort of experimental one that is structured, and I use the word structured, within institutional mandates and institutional history. Uh, we have, up to this point, as Kimon mentioned, always done a book. And I think the assumption was we would do a book for this, but I didn't want to do a book. And that, had a, that decision had to percolate. It wasn't mine to make. Um, so, you know, we all operate, and, and the students work operates also within certain parameters, like the instructor's lack of imagination about <laughs> certain <laughs> ways. So, no, I mean, it's really important to take some of this on. I mean, it's nice to take the praise, but it's also important to take, you know, the limitations come. Uh, and there also comes both limitations and opportunities within structures of courses. Um, and within one semester, two semesters, you start off, as we all know, with one place, and no one really mentioned this, we moved in sort of breathtakingly and sort of unsettling terms as to, well, this is when this will be due, and it should look like this, and it should, <laughs> it should have 1,500 words. And that was, you know, that happened, and then three weeks later, well, are we going to have footnotes? Are we going to have, a, you know, should I have sources for the reading? Uh, what are the images? Where are they going to go? So, so there's an improvisational aspect to all of this, which since this first exhibit I've done, um, uh, that, you know, sort of, at least not so much for the students, seat of the pants for me. Uh, so I think it's really important to talk, as I always do in teaching, about where one starts from and where one ends up. And where we end up is not, uh, maybe two years from now, I'd like to end up in a lot of the places that we've been suggested. And, I, and that's why I've taken really copious notes, because I do see this as an ongoing pedagogical learning process for me as well as for the students and most of them are leaving some soon some less soon um hopefully i'll be around and so the <laughs> point um so so it's really interesting to think about yeah. you know but if i was to write this up i would very much be about this is day one yeah. and and that's why it's absolutely crucial i think the decision you've already made that this is an ongoing project because yeah. I think one of the problems when we do this in classroom settings is we often do it once mm. and we work out what it is that's going to work and not work and we get limited benefit out of that because we move on to the mm. next thing and we start all over again and we mess it up. I mean, I'm doing the same thing with the digital project on Civil War soldiers who left graffiti mm. in a historic mm. house next to me in Fairfax. I've made a real hash mm. of a lot of the things that I've asked the students to do in this first iteration mm. of the course and if that was the only time I was doing that project, a large mm. amount of that would have been wasted. It's not. You know, they, they did 30 soldiers, there's another 90 left, you know, I get three more iterations and the next one will be better. And I think if, if anything, you know, I mm. think that you've already, for whatever mistakes you might want to own, I think you've already made 
in some ways the most important correct decision which is not to make this a mm. one-off mm. Yeah. but to actually make it something you can build on and so i think that that is exactly the way to do it i think the next time you do this having got the you know got the, all of the institutional structures you work in to let go of the book and let you online and the next step is to get them to let go, go of the idea of an online book yeah. and 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 start to think about <laughs> doing something you know that's not constrained in that way online and it is iterative you know that's another one of those words that i now use you know in every third sentence that i wasn't using a you know a year ago when i wasn't running the center because that that's you know if collaboration is one of the things that this forces you into mm. iterative work mm. is one of the others you've got to keep coming back and redoing and i think if that's you know if you can get that out of a course like this that's probably the yeah. most yeah. important thing you'll ever get is that you've got to keep iter iterating to get right um and that we live in an age where we're not putting it into a book so you're going to be you can go back and you can keep tweaking it to your heart's content and it's alive and kicking um and so we have to start thinking about it as something that's alive and kicking and and keeps going so i think that's the most important thing you got right whatever else you might think you got wrong is you're going to get a <laughs> chance to grow this thing and and that's the value i think of doing digital stuff john i think you've been holding a question yeah, for about for 45, minutes, 45 minutes so thank you <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize that, but I guess my head would have exploded if we waited another few minutes. We missed out on that opportunity. Um, so I love this work, and I, I also think it's brilliant that you have an opportunity to workshop the exhibition design. That's just awesome, right? I mean, a lot of people um, with such great ideas, great student work, so layered and so detailed. and. I think as I um, travel around museums and exhibitions and always um, try to look at um, how they've been thought out and put together, one of the things that I think um, continues to be a missed opportunity at so many museums when they think they're providing an interactive component to the exhibition because they've supplied a touch screen. So I'd love to know the statistics at MoMA of how many people stopped and drilled down into that information. Sure, one or two percent. When I, when I watch the room, you know, everyone's moving through and there's a beautiful painting hanging above the touch screen. So most people are surveying the art, but very few are actually taking the time to drill down into the vast amounts of information and work and writing and, and layering of information that exists in there. So just a couple of comments about exhibition design. One would be like, yeah, have the touch screen um, opportunities for those who want to really go deep and explore. But some of your um, work is so beautiful with the iMovie animations of flyovers of historical maps and things. What about maybe like having the, the greatest hits pulled out and looped in a video above the or next to the the touch screen so you've got like the online encyclopedia version for those who unlike me have the patience to stand there and tap things and figure out how to navigate this thing but next to it a looped video that leverages all the hard work you've done displays it to the public and is an attractor for all the passers-by and you know the the idea of visual entrepreneurs that you started with is so fascinating. The idea that the, the daguerreotypists and the lithographers and the drips map makers are all um, engaging in what for the day was new media. Um, because we use that term now as if we invented it. And um, <laughs> it's, it's great that you've um, sort of identified the drips map as this you know, icon of visualizing 19th century New York. But I began thinking, uh, obviously, with my hypercities bias, like, wow, these guys are really good at iMovie. And wow, we've got, you know, 30 19th century <laughs> New York maps. What if you had like a running loop video of, say, a close in flyover up Broadway, up the drips map as a, a video? but you also included the other maps that represent Broadway in all these different decades across the 19th century as a flyover in iMovie that just kind of is there and is always absent of all the people that are make that landscape so crucial. And I don't know how to solve that problem, but you're absolutely right. And I, a lot of your work actually documents the people, but 
but how do you, you know, foreground um, the, the racial diversity, the economic diversity, and, and all that is, is a really interesting conundrum. So um, I'll stop there, but there's other comments uh, maybe later. Sure. John, you know, when we, when we do the interactives, one of the most challenging things to always design is what we call the attract loop. Um, and it's literally, the <clears throat> if the interactives aren't touched for 120, 180 seconds, they revert to this loop. So they show a movie so that it, it entices you in. And I think that that, you know, navigating over a map or multiple maps would be the idea. The one that we have currently, um, the, the kind of iconography is a, a kipu. Um, it, it was the structure for some information. Um, and there's these beautiful pans over keep who's from the British Library and everything. Um, and you're right, it is a way to draw people in. And um, whether they're separate or together, it's, it, there's so many rich materials. And we try to cram as much of that stuff in to draw the people to wonder, tap as much as possible. Yeah. Did you guys find, um, when you discussed interiors and maybe edited out that stuff, did you find that the Astor Hotel had a lobby that looked like a parlor? And I think we had gotten, we had gotten to the point of doing the research yeah. behind yeah. And we decided that it would, it would take it too large. Right. Uh, we really right. wanted to focus on the street spectacle and what yeah. people would have seen walking down Broadway, yeah. whether yeah. or not they went into the I, I was also really struck by the possibility of any synergies that existed between the buildings right around the intersection. So some of you were making the point about how enterprising Matthew Brady was and how he was not really busy taking photographs, but he was out networking and, get, and recruiting celebrities for portraits and stuff. I imagine he might have even had a deal with the Astor Hotel to hang his stuff in the lobby with the he celebrities there. and was able to leverage that location in further ways that could be documented. Yeah, I, it, just for what it's worth, it, I don't think you're going to find any pictures of the, of the lobby of the Astor <laughs> House, but you will find uh, pictures of the lobby of the Willard Hotel, for example, in Washington, D.C. I mean, in other words, it's another example of where you may need to go other places to give a sense, you know, some sense of, 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 of those interiors. But, um, anyhow, that's... And it doesn't look like a parlor? No, it doesn't look like a parlor. It looks like a men's club. Because like it. it is. It's just men. Still it. But, and it still looks yeah, like Yeah, that's a version of a vision. <laughs> Can you have a webcam pointing at the intersection? <laughs> yeah. 24 hours a day. Walking to us. <laughs> no, I mean, like there, on that block. <laughs> um, there will be public programs associated. Yeah, that's a way to do that. Yeah. You know, there, we are fortunately doing an exhibit on New York in New York, um, which is a great boon, so there would be connections. But though I wonder, I mean, you're doing an exhibit on the visualizing of New York. Yes, and so I took the right. point up yeah. the back, yeah. I think, yeah. is actually really powerful. Yeah. Because in some yeah. ways, the juxtaposition yeah. right. is almost not with the physical environments. Yes. It's with other visualizations yes. of the city, of which, you know, St. Paul's, you know, post not, you know, that, there are visualizations of that rather than the physical. Mm -hmm. if, there, if there's an extra level of juxtaposition you'd want, it wouldn't be to the, you know, it's that spatial experience yeah. versus sort of well, spatial this is one imaginary. Of the, but so. this is one of the tensions even in the course was yeah. like mm -hmm. how much social history Exactly. Mm -hmm. you're, you know, we're historians. Like how much social history do you need to know to be able yep. to look at these items and think about what's in it and what's not in it? Or what's in it in 1840 and not in 1850? How much do you need to know about the technical genres and processes of lithography? Um, how much do you need to know about the, the research about the biographies of different makers uh, or 
uh, workers. Um, so there's all these things that even to get to the starting point of even thinking about what should go in the right. show was really a challenge. And we spent much of the fall just doing a lot of that. You know, it was both a course on material culture, a course on history of New York City, it was a course on different print uh, processes of the 19th century. And then it sort of started to move uh, once we were working on those multiple tracks. So, you know, I'm not trying to be an apologist for, um, I'm just trying to lay out some of the complexities of doing this in a pedagogical setting, which I think is enormously intellectually rewarding for, I can only speak for myself, um, but it also had, no, I mean, it's because, frustrating. Um, but um, speaking for myself or intellectually, <laughs> um, but um, um, more seriously, um, you know, it, it also, in this case, unlike a regular course, does have to have a product. Right. Yeah, uh, and I keep getting reminded September 18th sure. is like an opening date, and loan requests have to come in, and whether I'd like to yeah. dabble more in. I really don't like this particular daguerreotype. I'd rather think about this one. Well, the thinking is over um, because the loan request. But, but it strikes me that the parameters are important, and maybe in some sense hmm. we've been leading you all astray a little bit too, <laughs> because um, you're not claiming that. Uh, you're recapturing the experience. You're not claiming that if you're a tourist, you got to come to our website because you know it, it's you'll see all the high points or things. You'll you'll capture the ghosts that you need to capture. I guess what I'm raising it by by titling it "Visualizing New York." It's not that you're giving yourself an out. You're giving yourself actually the opportunity that Danny raised of having an argument and a shape. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think you're heading in that direction, but it also allows you then to create the balance. I mean, I, I think that, I like to think, that what we've all suggested all fits in in, in in certain ways, but there's a balance that the visualizing will have to play the major part of. And in that point, mm -hmm. un, unless I'm not understanding, you are talking about the way it was visualized in the 19th century and the way, for better or for worse, people visualized it in the 19th century. That means if things are missing, they need to be addressed as well, but you're not doing the history yeah. of, you know, of either images in New York City or for that matter, the way people lived at that time. Right. You know, that's something that's important about the, the idea of shape, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, as, w as I work with these guys and thinking of the prototypes, um, one kind of metaphor that I think helped some of them and, and has helped me teach these things is that each of these interactives and the project as a whole, it needs to have a thesis, right? And this was this concise statement you're talking about, right? And we think of it obviously when we write an essay, um, but the interactive has to have a thesis too, so that every object you put in, every chunk of text, every navigational choice you make, you can go back and go, well, does it, like, yes or no, here's my thesis, okay, yes or no. Um, and that way, it gives a more focused way of referring to your objects. And this is something we kind of came up with the last Focus Gallery project that when we were all straying, and I was like, maybe we should just write it down. And then we ended up having a two sentence thing that whenever we were ambivalent about an object, we could look at this and kind of discuss. Um, and I think it's a very simple thing, but as you get clouded in the process of prototyping and designing, you forget how you construct an argument. And then you remember, oh, we know how to construct an argument. We just usually do it in a Word document. Um, and how do you bring those analogous processes into a new media form um, because it's the same thing um, in, di in a different set of tools and um, I think people have mentioned this in the salon it's a useful thing and and that's I've been I've been so happy to see that that I can see their arguments and their interactives um, as we've gone forward and, and what their thesis has been and that it helps them engage those selections and so yeah thanks um, I just wanted to respond to something that David you were saying um, about the concern of how much social history and how much you know technical process not include, um, and I think it gets to sort of the point of the fact that this is, you know, a digital exhibit as well as a physical ex exhibit, and you don't need to necessarily include everything, but keep in mind that what you're creating is just another node in the network of linked data and information that's out there, and hmm. because of that, you don't necessarily have to, but it's, it, it is a good idea to, to be able to represent all the research and, and hard work that went into making this particular node, you can still go back to those sources and and all of those links, mm -hmm. that is like where it came from and that is all the hard work and research and, and enable, it enables people to go to the website to, I guess, to, to see that a little bit more and it also informs them more. If you, you know, I don't know if you'll have a bibliography page that links to different sources or that sort of thing, but um, 
that's just one of the benefits of a, a digital exhibit. You, you have the resources of the world yeah. behind mm -hmm. that node. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, yeah, I mean, it, this is a series of, sort of digital components aspiring to be a digital project. Um, of a larger <laughs> magnitude like some of the Next figures question. that I'm sharing the table with. No, that, I mean, that's really, um, which these folks know much better than I, takes really large-scale resources, uh, even broader collaborative uh, teams, um, and much more time and brainstorming uh, as well. And so this is really a prototype for thinking, will this fly? Is this something worth doing more with, and I think um, one of those very important pieces would be, <laughs> there's so many people working, as this is just a small group of people working on New York, uh, to work with other people, other institutions uh, as well, and both pedagogical platform, so that we could put different materials you know, together and use that, and sort of thinking also with repositories that have this great material. Um, so that's, that's another, um, you know, goal here, too. Um, it's just a, really sort of the beginning, uh, possibly, of something broader. But, you know. I really look forward to September 18th. Yes. <laughs> and, and, so do I. And, <laughs> and, yeah. and I want to I wanna say um, I'm green with envy that you have such an amazing um, city and such the ability to put together such an amazing project. And, your description, I know exactly what you're saying, David, about seat of the pants, and, <laughs> and I, yeah. I often think courses like this are like trying to herd cats or something like that. Well, no. And, and, <laughs> and, and, I wasn't. And, and, <laughs> that's a metaphor, and, right? And, and, yeah. <laughs> and the plain fact of the matter is, is, is that you've obviously gotten into an incredibly rich um, experience of what in this this it almost doesn't matter what happens on the pedagogical end you've glimpsed so much of what of the kinds of things that are swirling around representation both historical and in terms of doing this kind of exhibit an incredibly rich experience on an incredibly rich city with a talented bunch of people in the room, and I think that's really great. Yeah. Well, just to then, I think, to sort of close, I would say the collaboration extends to the whole day, because I think what we're really trying to draw in for a discussion of, you know, um, part of the mandate here at the Bar Graduate Center is thinking about what are curators in the 21st century, mm. what kind of things should we know, what kind of, I think of this as an instructor, what kind of things should I be teaching? And so I think the learning experience, which has been throughout the fall and spring really sort of very richly is captured today with my colleagues on the panel. So I really appreciate the time and energy and thoughtfulness that came and, as well as in the audience. And I think we, and I'm sure your students, appreciate you taking the risk. I mean, the reality is that we are, this, is, this is our generation's new media, and one response to it is to turn your back on it and do what you've always done before. And then you don't feel like you're taking so many risks, and you don't stay up at night wondering what's going to happen at the end. And you don't get anything like the rewards out of it. And, you know, I, there are some people in digital humanities who sort of valorise the notion that failure is, you know, a good and positive thing. And as somebody who runs a grant-funded centre, I don't have mm. that luxury. <laughs> um, but but risk-taking is necessary. If you don't push the envelope, you don't learn as much, and, and you're not as well positioned to take advantage of it. You know, September 18th will come around, something will happen. Yeah. You know, that's where the institutional constraints are your friend, because it'll stop you trying to be too ambitious and do those things. But, you know, the, the ultimate thing is, is, is that taking the risks is what we need to do to get something really useful out of this. You've got to do something different. And I think the students have to be commended on this as well. I mean, I, you know, I was at a unnamed Ivy League institution a few weeks ago talking to a professor immensely frustrated because she couldn't get any of her graduate students to engage with the digital humanities. It was outside their comfort zone. They wanted to write a nice old-fashioned dissertation, you know, to write a few dozen more essays like the dozens of other essays that only their teachers had ever read that they'd done before and, and, and keep feeling good about themselves. Um, and I think, you know, and I, that was just tremendously sad to hear. And, you know, so, you know, we, we, everyone has to take a risk and everyone's got to worry, but the rewards are there 
and they're valuable and they open possibilities that I think we can we can all follow. And you know that's what the takeaway from the questions is. You always got to remember the more things people tell you they want to do, the more excited they are by what you've done and the taste you've given and the possibilities that are out there. And then you know somebody has to play the bad guy and say, oh, hold on a minute, <laughs> you know we've only got this amount of time and these constraints and these sorts of things and pull back. But the payoff from the other stuff is recognizing that that means that people are excited and that the risks you're taking are paying off for the people and you know who've been invited here to share them with you as well as hopefully they are for you too well so i think we'll conclude with that yes, on that and there'll be alcohol, alcohol. <laughs> yeah. but uh but i want to i want to thank john and steven john, and josh yeah. and uh barbara and daniel thank you so much for being yeah. up here today um, i want to thank the, the amazing students who uh, it's my pleasure to work with all the time. And David, thank you for your project and for uh, keeping con David, it's David is constantly pushing me to find new solutions to the conversations we have about digital media here. Um, so there's no way to under uh, state what he does and uh, overstate what he does. Sorry. Um, and so thank you for, for your work, David.